We're live. Sergeants, can you start your recordings, please? PC recording done. Cloud recording started. Backup is rolling. Sergeant Polite, can you give us the opening, please? Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to the remote hearing on a committee on governmental operations joint, jointly with the Committee on Land Use. Let's think of the way that the DOE. And uh, subcommittee on capital budget. Will council members and staff please turn on their videos at this time? Once again, will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruptions, please place all cell phones electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Thank you so much of the gathering today's meeting. Good morning, I am Council Member Fernando Cabrera, Chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations. I want to start off by thanking Speaker Corey Johnson for his leadership. Proposing a redesign of the city's planning process is bold and future thinking. I also want to thank co-chairs, Council Member Rafael Salamanca Jr. of the Land Use Committee and Council Member Helen Rosenthal of the Subcommittee on Capital Budget. Your commitment to this complex issue is admirable and I'm looking forward to holding this discussion with you both. Additionally, I want to thank the council members who have joined us this morning. But a few, so let me go down. Uh, as I mentioned, we had uh, Chair Rosenthal, Chair Salamanca, Council Member Landers, Council Member Adams, Council Member Perkins, Council Member Matteo, Council Member Kalos, Council Member Koo, Council Member Riley, Council Member Powers, Council Member Deutsch, Council Member Diaz, uh, Council Member Ayala, uh, Council Member Gennaro, Council Member Rivera and Council Member myself. Today, the committee will be considering introduction number 21, 2186, sponsored by Speaker Johnson in relation to a comprehensive long term plan. While comprehensive long term planning has largely become the norm in other localities, New York City has failed to make a citywide planning a priority, instead, focusing on piecemeal. Uh, planning approach. Currently, the charter requires many different reports and processes related to city planning without requiring a holistic review of the city's existing condition that identify challenges, opportunities, and goals, and makes policy recommendations to address and achieve them. The charter itself does not make clear how these reports and processes fit together in the silos in the areas of land use, capital budget, and city uh, policy that the city has continued to operate has to simplify this. We have the one NYC report that the mayor is very proud to share, but it does not speak to land use or budget decision and does not include the state of repair of the city's infrastructure, existing school capacity, housing units, and vacancies to provide economic data. Beyond this, we haven't seen broad coordination across city agencies to inform the city's broad policy goals or neighborhood needs. One, NYC is not required to integrate with other strategic policy statement, whether the 10-year capital, uh, capital, 10 capital strategy, social indicators report, or the citywide statement of needs. And the inverse is also true. Capital investment planning has little to no relationship with the city's policy goals or land use planning. There's a fundamental disconnect here that cannot be overstated. How can we as, as a city plan for our futures when we only have fragmented, uh, only fragments of the full picture of the city's current needs and assets? Increased coordination across city agencies is critical, uh, critically important as the city faces significant budget constraints as a result of COVID-19 crisis. We cannot afford inefficiencies and redundancy across city agencies that undermine our ability to achieve citywide goals. We have a lot of work to do, and I look forward to today's conversation with the administration as a starting point. I want to thank 
the staff, Dream Team staff, for making this hearing possible. Committee staff, C.J. Murray, Emily Forjong, Elizabeth Parnes, Sebastian Bacci, as well as Louis Colden Brown and Annie Levers in the Office of Strategic Initiatives, and the central staff operating this remote uh, hearing behind the scenes, my legislative director, Claire McLevain. I will now turn it over to Speaker Johnson, sponsor of Introduction 2186, to give a statement. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Cabrera. I want to thank you all for being here today and to Chairs Cabrera, Salamanca, and Rosenthal for holding this hearing. When the Council started conversations about comprehensive planning, <clears throat> excuse me, my computer is going a little crazy. When the Council started conversations about comprehensive planning more than two years ago, the city already faced serious challenges, economic, racial, and gender inequality, housing and food insecurity, aging infrastructure, and as we've seen again and again throughout the five boroughs, the impacts of climate change. We worked hard as a council to advance equity and justice and to undo the city's harmful and exclusionary policies. But we as a city have not acknowledged let alone reformed the ways in which our city's fundamental failure to plan has upheld the status quo. For decades, the city has relied on a piecemeal and ad hoc approach, muddling through its planning exercises one neighborhood, topic, and project at a time. That planning has largely neglected people of color, immigrants, people with disabilities, and low-income New Yorkers. It has also led to serious inefficiencies, our budget documents often simply don't relate, often simply don't relate to our city's policy and land use priorities. And as we enter a period of fiscal stress, we have no rational system for prioritizing our community's most urgent budget needs to reduce disparities and combat climate change. So why is the council taking on these complicated issues now? Because we simply cannot afford to wait. The devastating and disparate impact of COVID-19 wasn't unpredictable. It's just the most recent example of what happens when we fail to plan ahead, when we don't address the underlying systems and historic disinvestments that perpetuate inequality. Disparities across race, culture, nationality, class, gender, and immigration status have all gotten worse. And that is no coincidence. It is the result of our city's policy, budget, and land use decisions. Over the next several decades, climate change will force us to make difficult and critical decisions about our infrastructure. The city is engaging in some good planning work. We're updating our waterfront zoning policies and council legislation has led to the production of a first ever environmental justice for all report. But too often good policies and reports get siphoned off or ignored completely by future administrations. We can't win the battle against climate change or racial injustice fighting on one front. These are land use issues. They are budget issues and they are policy issues. If we can't coordinate those decisions, we put the viability of our entire city at risk, not to mention the vulnerable frontline communities that are already bearing the burden of COVID-19. We must learn from our past mistakes. If this crisis and beyond, of this crisis and beyond, to plan for a better and more just future. Before I go on, I think you can see some slides that are being shown. Uh, I want to spend a minute clearing up some facts about what this proposal does and does not do in response to some misinformation spreading about the bill. Introduction 2186 does not make nor require any amendments or changes to the city zoning resolution whatsoever. It does not require or trigger requ require or trigger requirements for any kind of rezonings, let alone up zonings ever. It does not propose or support the elimination of single family zoning in New York City, nor does it propose any specific rezoning actions whatsoever and it does not amend or eliminate community board's role in future rezoning processes, all of which would remain subject to the ULERT process. Now I wanna be clear about what it does do. 
It requires the city to provide community boards and the public with new resources, new data, and new analyses to support proactive community-based planning. It encourages the city to direct new growth or development away from low-lying vulnerable uh, areas uh, to sea level rise and other displacement risks like rising rent or real estate speculation. It identifies and prioritizes communities' urgent budget needs, regardless of whether or not those neighborhoods will be rezoned. And it encourages fine grain rezoning tools to be equitably distributed citywide and gives all neighborhoods the opportunity to proactively plan for their future. I know this is a complicated bill. It's 25 pages of unwinding decades of disconnected planning mandates and building up a new system. But I wanna take a few minutes to walk through some of the details about why it's so important and how this new model works. You'll see on this next slide, uh, comprehensive planning can uniquely center racial, economic and environmental justice within a full range of land use, budgeting and policy tools. It is a strategy that cities all across the globe use to correct historical inequities, apply lessons learned, and create new and innovative tools to tackle the issues of tomorrow. And that's why I'm sponsoring Introduction 2186. The claim that this proposal will remove, not enhance input from neighborhoods, community boards, and elected officials is a complete and total misrepresentation. It is designed to do the exact opposite. It requires the city to engage in proactive land use and infrastructure planning in every single neighborhood, regardless of whether that neighborhood is being rezoned. It actually enhances elected officials and community boards influence over future rezoning decisions by giving them a defined role in a proactive neighborhood planning process. Right now we are stuck reacting to rezoning proposals from the mayor or private developers and by the time they come to the community board or the city council for review, the project is already fully baked. This proposal flips the script to give communities an opportunity to inform the city uh, and developers plans at the front end of the pro process before ULERP is even considered. With the process laid out in this bill, the city would finally develop a shared long-term vision in partnership with communities to prioritize citywide needs while simultaneously addressing neighborhood specific ones. The bill streamlines and meaningfully connects the dozens of reports, plans and documents that you see right now on the left side of the screen. These documents are already required by the city charter and are often produced without any opportunities for public input whatsoever. The charter fails to make clear whether or how these documents relate to one another on the right, you'll see a depiction of the new cycle proposed by introduction 2186. The bill connects all of these disjointed documents and reports required to create a citywide strategic framework and vision for the city while strengthening and creating new resources for communities to use as they proactively plan. Comprehensive planning will create a proactive process centering community voice in a conversation about how to tackle wide, how to tackle citywide challenges. The bill tasks the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability with responsibility for coordinating this plan across city agencies as they do currently for their Plan NYC and One NYC reports. The city's first task would be the production of a new conditions of the city report. This report would take all of the data that currently sits across dozens of reports and plans and the open data portal in one easy to use place. It would also include new analyses to help us assess the state of our current infrastructure, access to opportunity and displacement risk, identifying disparities across our neighborhoods. The city would then work in partnership with communities and key stakeholders to determine the city's long-term needs for housing, jobs, open space, schools, and other critical infrastructure. These would be measurable infrastructure targets. Then New Yorkers will help decide where and how the city 
will distribute that critical infrastructure in their neighborhoods over the next 10 years. The framework would prioritize any new projected growth in areas with high access to opportunity and low risk for displacement. This would help us ensure that we're investing in new infrastructure in communities that need it most, while we mitigate the harmful impact of displacement and gentrification in our neighborhoods. Community boards and borough presidents would adopt a preferred land use scenario for each of their community districts. Those would then get sent to the council, which would be responsible for reconciling recommendations from various stakeholders and adopting a final preferred land use map for inclusion in the long-term final plan. Then those would set the vision for our neighborhoods and we would measure future budgets and rezoning applications against those plans that have been proactively planned by local communities. I won't pretend this will be easy, peeling away the structural inequalities plaguing our city and confronting the challenges that lay ahead will be an enormous challenge. That's why this bill creates the road roadmap we need to move forward. One that finally creates an integrated citywide process with robust opportunity for public input. The production of the plan would take place over the course of four years with transparent opportunities for public input every step of the way. The bill creates these important milestones which will increase transparency, but gives the city flexibility to grow and adapt that robust community-based planning process over time. The bill does not propose, does not propose, does not require, and does not trigger specific policies, zoning actions, or budget commitments. Instead, it requires the city to center equity and justice in proactive and ongoing conversations about how to plan for our future. This bill creates new opportunities for the public to directly shape the city's agenda before ULERP or annual budgets are even considered. When the first cycle is done, the, the, the cycle starts over again and each plan will build on the successes and failures of the last. Compliance with the long-term plan would be, would be encouraged and considered, but not required. All rezoning actions in furtherance of the plan or not would still be subject to ULERP. Future ULERP applications would be required to include a statement of alignment describing how the rezoning does or does not align with the long-term plan. Community boards would entirely retain their role in the ULERP process with new data and resources assessing neighborhood needs to help inform decision-making processes. Inconsistent actions would get sent to the council as usual. Consistent actions would be given an easier path <clears throat> through the Euler process. Instead of mandatory council review, consistent actions would be subject to council call up. A requirement for the city to produce a generic environmental impact statement, a GEIS, would ensure the city assesses the broad impact of the plan. But it would also incentivize the city and developers to implement the plan's policies. Today, the administration will say that the GEIS will cost the city nearly half a billion dollars every decade. That cost estimate is both inaccurate and absurd. It indicates that this administration is not engaging in this conversation with us seriously. There is nothing about this bill that will amount to that price tag. In fact, the GEIS has the potential to reduce city costs when it, comes to, when it comes time to implement the policies plans, the plans policies. And it can even reduce developers costs when projects are consistent with the plan. The proposal will also make significant reforms to our long-term infrastructure planning to ensure we are spending our limited resources wisely. Unlike Plan NYC and 1NYC reports, the final long-term plan will be required to include detailed budget needs for, city for, for meeting citywide and neighborhood specific goals. The 10-year capital strategy will be reformed to reflect the full scope of our infrastructure repair needs and a wish list of new infrastructure we must build to achieve our citywide goals. Annual budget documents would then prioritize those needs 
based on more robust assessments of our infrastructure. These plans are, these reforms are long overdue and would create the transparency we need to hold government accountable. Comprehensive planning holds an enormous amount of opportunity for our city as a whole and our individual neighborhoods. Through this process, through this new process, we can provide communities with new resources, data and analysis to support proactive planning. We can make sure that communities longstanding budget needs are addressed, regardless of whether or not the neighborhood will be rezoned. We can address the failures and unintended consequences of our zoning decisions, just like most other cities do in the world. And we can force more coordination across city agencies to better achieve our citywide and neighborhood goals. Before I turn it over to my colleagues, I wanna thank the Thriving Communities Coalition. They've been working on these issues for years and continually have been advocating for change. We would not be here today without them. And I am just glad to be part of a movement that they started. Uh, before I turn it back to Chair Cabrera, I wanna thank again, Chairs Salamanca and Rosenthal for co-chairing this hearing. And I wanna thank Council Members Lander and Reynoso who have led on this effort uh, for a long time. Uh, now I uh, pass it back to Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I wanna recognize we've also been joined by Council Members Yeager and Borelli. And with that, let me turn it over to the chair of the Line Use Committee, Council Member Rafael Salamanca, to give a statement. Thank you, uh, Chair Cabrera. Uh, thank you, um, Speaker Johnson and uh, Chair Rosenthal. Um, staff, committee staff representative from the administration and members of the general public. I am uh, Council Member Rafael Salamanca. I'm the chair of the Committee on Line Use uh, from the 17th Council District in the South Bronx. I'm gonna make this quick as we have a lot, of dis a lot to discuss as part of this important hearing. It's no secret that New York City planning framework is outdated and is in need of significant overhaul. Despite the exponential growth our city has seen over the half a century, many of our communities still have the antiquated zoning and planning guidelines from the first and last time the city truly set out to map out the city in 1961. At a time when local and national conversations are providing governments with a mandate to reform our laws, it is our duty to closely look at the policies that have led to marginalization of minority communities via exclusionary zonings or the remnants of the Robert Moses era that contributed to the systemic racism of the city. Using the platform on the Committee on Land Use, I look forward to partnering with my co-chairs and the speaker on this important conversation. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, co-chair. Uh, this moment, uh, let me turn it over uh, to council member, so another co-chair, uh, council member Helen Rosenthal, chair of the subcommittee on capital budget to give a statement. Did we lose Council Member Rosenthal? I don't see her. With apologies, I just, little technical difficulties okay. there. Thank you oh, so okay. much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Cabrera. Uh, thank you, Speaker Johnson and Chair Salamanca for holding this hearing today. Today we're hearing Speaker Johnson's introduction 2186. The bill tackles a lot of really important issues, including the city's long-term infrastructure planning the bill requires the city to better integrate its land use and policy planning with its capital budget to better achieve citywide and neighborhood goals. The city's budget decisions are unfortunately suffering from insufficient assessments of capital needs. And as a result, the city's spending often fails to sufficiently maintain existing infrastructure, enhance infrastructure to reduce neighborhood disparities, improve the climate resiliency of the infrastructure we fund or fund the infrastructure needed to accommodate projected growth. 
Comprehensive planning offers the city an important opportunity to better align and coordinate our shared priorities and goals with our city's budget, which I have also always said are moral documents. So as we enter into an era of fiscal stress and budget constraints, we must ensure our infrastructure spending prioritizes urgent repairs and the needs of our most vulnerable New Yorkers to better position us to recover from this crisis in a just and equitable way. I look forward to having this important conversation today and hearing testimony from all stakeholders. And before I conclude, I just wanna thank the staff who helped me prepare for this hearing, the Finance Division Committee staff, Nathan Toth, Deputy Director, uh, Chima Obichiri, head, Unit Head, Monica Bujak, Financial Analyst, Rebecca Chasen, Senior Counsel, Noah Brick, Assistant Counsel, and of course, my staff, Madhuri Shukla, Sarah Crean, and, C and Cindy Cardinal. With that, I pass it back to Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Rosenthal. And let me just uh, recognize we're also being joined by Councilmember Rodenchek and Councilmember Miller. And with that, I will turn it over to our moderator, uh, Committee Council CJ Mary, to go over some of the procedure items. Thank you, Chair Cabrera. I am CJ Murray, Council to the Committee on Governmental Operations. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. The first panelists to give testimony today will be representatives from the administration, from the Department of City Planning. Testimony will be provided by Director of City Planning and Chair of the City Planning Commission, Marissa Lago, as well as Executive Director, Anita Lermont. From the Office of Management and Budget, testimony will be provided by Deputy Director for Housing and Economic Development, Tara Boyard, and Associate Director for Capital Budget, Paul Timas. In addition, the following representatives from the administration will be available to answer questions. From DCP, Chief Operating Officer, John Kaufman, Deputy Executive Director for Strategic Planning, Howard Slatkin, and General Counsel, Susan Amron, and from the Mayor's Office of Climate Policy and Programs, Chief Climate Policy Advisor and one NYC Director, Dan Zarilli. Panelists, I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your question. As a reminder to members of the public, please do not use the Zoom raise hand function you will have an opportunity to testify later in the hearing. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath to all members of the administration who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions. Please raise your right hands. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions. Chair Lago. Yes. Executive Director Lermont. Yes. Chief Operating Officer Kaufman. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Executive, Executive Director Slacken. Yes. General Counsel Amron. Yes. Deputy Director Boyard. Yes. Associate Director Timus. Yes. Director Zarelli. Yes. Thank you, Chair Lago. You may begin your testimony. Good morning, Chairs Cabrera, Rosenthal, and Salamanca, and members of the committees. In the interest of efficiency, I will be the only administration official who will be testifying, but all the people who have been sworn in will be available for questioning. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at this hearing on intro 2186, requiring a comprehensive long-term plan. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to testify this morning on the subject of sound land use planning, 
a subject that we agree is of great importance to the city's future. It's critical to have a healthy discussion about how our planning processes, including the uniform land use review procedure, can be made more effective in meeting the needs of the city and how to do so more equitably. We agree strongly with the importance of providing sound data and analysis to guide decisions. City planning's initiatives under Where We Live, NYC, the city's plan to advance fair housing, includes increasing the already considerable data and analysis that we make available to the public about community conditions and changes in housing and neighborhoods across our city. We also agree that a main purpose of planning is to support action to promote equitable growth. Our neighborhood initiatives in Soho, Noho and Gowanus address the urgency highlighted in where we live of creating more mixed income housing and high opportunity neighborhoods, an absolutely vital need before and especially since COVID-19 struck. While it's encouraging to hear discussion of the importance of meeting the city's needs for equitable growth, we oppose this bill because of concerns about its feasibility, its costs, and its ultimate impact. We do not believe that it's feasible to achieve all of the bill's goals through a single one-size-fits-all process, not without glossing over key priorities and shortchanging community impact. To attempt to do so would cost an incredible amount of money. We estimate that the environmental review alone would cost on the order of half a billion dollars with significant increases in staffing needed on top of that. And we're concerned that the ultimate impact of that time and money would be counter to our shared goals, that it would make it more difficult, not easier to build affordable housing or to site essential city facilities if these priority projects were subject to this additional layer of bureaucracy. The practical effect of the bill would be to reinforce the political incentives to an action that exists today and that drive exclusionary and inequitable outcomes. I'll start with the feasibility. The bill provides just nine and a half months for the central planning office to create 177 distinct land use plans, three options for each of the city's 59 community districts. Each would contain a level of detail comparable to that of an individual neighborhood rezoning, which is typically created over years and involves scores of community meetings. These three scenarios would be presented to community boards, which would then have to pick one as a recommended option to the council. It would be impossible for this type of top-down planning to achieve quality or equity or be responsive to community input. The bill also underestimates the importance of focused topic specific planning efforts, such as those for the waterfront, greenhouse gas emissions reduction, environmental justice, food policy, or resiliency. By trying to roll planning for all issues into a single concurrent process and document, the bill would muffle the voices and priorities of important constituencies who help shape planning for each of these issues and dilute the ability to address each issue thoughtfully and equitably. Recent more focused planning efforts have allowed us to address significant issues as we have with the zoning for coastal resiliency proposal, a citywide proposal that is currently in Euler following years of community engagement. The cornerstone of citywide strategic planning efforts today is the quadrennial long-term plan required by Local Law 84 of 2013, most recently known as 1NYC 2050. This citywide long-term planning effort identifies key challenges facing the city and strategic priorities to meet those challenges. 1NYC acts as a framework to mobilize city government to advance critical and timely priorities. Since 2007, when this planning process began in partnership with the council, it's been the basis for adopting ambitious greenhouse gas emission reduction strategies, promoting transit-oriented growth, preparing for the risks of climate change, embedding environmental justice into the city's decision-making, and setting the first ever poverty reduction targets. Annual reports measure progress towards goals 
and serve as a public accountability tool. We believe that 1NYC serves as a better, better model for strengthening our planning efforts rather than this bill. Turning to our second point of objection, we're concerned about the extraordinary cost of the bill. The most expensive component by far is the requirement for a GEIS to accompany the 177 land use scenarios. We estimate that the GEIS would cost on the order of half a billion dollars of tax levy funding. This 500 million figure, figure is far from hyperbolic. Rather, it reflects the unprecedented scope and scale that this GIS would require covering every inch of the city's 303 square miles and analyzing not just land use, but also transportation, infrastructure, public facilities, and more, and analyzing the countless combinations of land use scenarios that could be adopted across 59 community districts. It would be the largest EIS on record by a long margin. What's more, the benefits of the GEIS would be limited, not meaningfully reducing the burden of review required under state environmental regulations for subsequent land use actions. The enormous GEIS would also open up countless opportunities for litigation which would delay not only the plan, but also the implementation of all actual projects that it might envision. In addition to the cost of the GEIS, the proposed planning process would be extremely expensive at a time when the city is still under a financial crunch and a hiring freeze. These costs would include staffing new offices and a second 13 member commission for planning. Our final objection, is about the impact of the bill. While we recognize that the intention is to promote equitable growth and proactive planning, in practice, the results would be the opposite. The bill would create, rather than remove, bureaucratic obstacles to projects that address pressing needs. It would increase, rather than decrease, the ability of affluent communities to reject projects that have broader benefits for the city. We do not believe that the bill would make it easier to accomplish important land use actions. For a start, the plan would be non-binding. The bill suggests that council members would often decline to call up actions determined by the city planning commission to be aligned with the plan. This is just implausible. ULERP actions provide a useful forum to air and negotiate key project details, including maximum permitted densities and building heights, as well as aspects of the project that aren't directly part of the land use approvals. Council members today call up essentially every optional item and can be expected to continue to do so. This means that the bill would effectively add an additional veto point to getting a project completed. The process of creating the plan itself would reinforce rather than dismantle inequities in the land use process. The bill would give the council final authority to set district level targets for housing, jobs, public facilities, and more. For instance, when it votes on the plan, the council would have the ability to change the community district level targets to, for example, include more school seats, have less affordable housing, or eliminate a proposed sanitation garage. This flies in the face of data driven planning processes and further empowers already powerful communities that are well-resourced to resist new housing or facilities that are needed to create an equitable city. A planning process that takes four years, which is an optimistic estimate, would divert the attention and capacity of numerous city agencies away from their important public services. There would also be significant pressure not to advance any large proposal until the plan has been adopted. There would never be a good time for New York City to take a hiatus of four years or more from important land use actions, but the need to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and economic shock makes this a uniquely inopportune time to do so. By putting too much emphasis on a single all-encompassing process, this bill would limit our ability to respond nimbly to a changing landscape. When events 
such as 9-11, Superstorm Sandy, or the pandemic occur, we need to be able to learn, adapt, and take appropriate action promptly, not wait until the next major comprehensive plan revision. Imagine if we had set quantitative community district level targets for retail space in 2018. They'd be of little use today. We appreciate the intention of the bill, but we do not think it is the right approach for New York City. Our sheer scale makes it hard to compare this bill with other cities' comprehensive planning efforts. Minneapolis and Seattle are often cited as models. Minneapolis has fewer residents than Staten Island, but their comprehensive plan still took three years to create. Even Seattle has only half the population of the Bronx, and both cities are much less complex than ours, being comprised largely of suburban scale neighborhoods. And importantly, the legal structure in which these other cities operate also differs meaningfully. Both of these cities are mandated to meet growth targets that have been established by state or regional authorities. Authorities that are empowered to override their city council's land use authority if these growth targets aren't met. In New York City, there is no similar state authority, nor does the council propose one. The bill would contain none of the checks and limitations on the legislature's authority that exist in other cities to ensure that a citywide planning process addresses exclusionary practices. This bill would add a new huge and costly process, but without altering the fundamental dynamics of land use decisions. We continue to share an interest in working with the council to identify ways to improve the planning process, but the process must be one that helps us address the key challenges before us and not divert us from them. The roles and authorities for planning and land use decision-making set forth in the charter are an important foundation for our city's growth and development. Considering changes to them is a worthy topic but it's a weighty matter that requires significant deliberation. We look forward to further discussions with the council and a range of stakeholders about how these processes can be improved. Thank you. And all of the city officials on this call now welcome your questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Lago. I appreciate your testimony. Um, I have a few questions that I want to uh, begin with. Uh, I have to say, I, I'm pretty disappointed. This was supposed to be the administration that ended the tale of two cities that took on inequality, that used the power of government to make the lives of all New Yorkers better. And it doesn't seem like uh, you all want to do the hard work that we think is necessary. I would hope that the administration is looking at legacy items for big projects where oh, you can lay the groundwork for game changing policies. And I see comprehensive planning as one of the big opportunities we have to really turn things around. I know the administration has been opposed to this idea for a long time. There wasn't much willingness to try and get to a good place during the Charter Revision Commission. But what really strikes me is that after what the city has gone through in the past year, the administration still kind of seems to be in the same place. If a pandemic that unquestionably has devastated communities of color while leaving many wealthier white neighborhoods barely touched, then what, uh, what does make you pause and think maybe we're doing something wrong here? So uh, my question is, uh, did COVID-19 change anything for the administration? Did you take any time to rethink your approach to planning and not just land use? That's my first question. Thank you for the question, Speaker. COVID has changed practically everything. And what it reinforces 
is the need to be able to respond nimbly to external shocks that change the city we're in and that change the needs of the city. This administration has a history of addressing through citywide strategic plans the existential issues of the day. We can go back to 2015 when the council adopted both mandatory inclusionary housing, but also zoning for quality and accessibility and affordability. I'll note that the city just yesterday released a food policy plan that addresses one of the challenges that came to the fore during the pandemic. And um, I will note that currently pending before the city planning commission is zoning for coastal resiliency that addresses the coastal flooding issues that your opening remarks uh, pointed out. And I hope that this proposal, which was generated after years of engagement with coastal communities across the city um, will be looked upon favorably as a legacy item by the council as well. I'll also note that um, with respect to issues that came to the fore or that were heightened by the pandemic, um, the city is now, but for a lawsuit, would be in the Euler process for the Gowanus rezoning, a rezoning of a, um, an opportunity neighborhood. And we are well underway on our work to rezone Soho and NoHo, one of the city's most affluent neighborhoods. I'll note also that uh, building on the, um, the, the impetus um, of the council, we are working to, on a citywide proposal that would allow our successful open restaurants program to exist beyond the existence of emergency orders. These are just a few of the ways in which we are responding, not through a 10-year plan that takes four years to develop, but in real time. Do you think that any of your any of the land use decisions uh, that have been made contributed to the COVID disparities that we've seen? I believe that the land use decisions that we've made have produced significant permanently affordable housing. Um, we still have a housing crisis, but I'll note that since the Euler process restarted this past fall, we have seen 46 proposals enter public review and around half of them are for housing. It's actually housing proposals that make up the largest number of applications coming into Euler. These 46 proposals, will create 5,100 homes, 2,400 of them affordable, and at least 740 of them permanently affordable pursuant to MIH. And we have to be able to facilitate affordable housing proposals, job generating proposals, rather than waiting for four years. The need is now. Uh, Chair Logo, I appreciate that, but the question was, do you think that any of uh, the city's land use decisions have contributed to the COVID disparities that we've seen? And, and, and if not, has that question been studied at all? We are, of course, like all of city government, looking at the racial disparities that have been made even more evident by COVID. We will always look to advance ever more equitable planning approaches. Um, but we stand by the approvals. We stand by the um, 300, um, I'm sorry, 180,000 um, affordable homes that have been created or preserved under Housing New York. These 180,000 affordable homes house more than 400,000 New Yorkers. And that's about as many homes as exist in all of Minneapolis. And so we are very proud of the steps that we've taken and we'll continue to redouble our efforts going forward. 
at, at a hearing on a uh, public advocate and uh, council member, public advocate Jumani William and council member Salamanca's bill on racial impact studies, uh, the administration made clear uh, the position that the city's rezoning decisions have no impact, no impact on racial demographics of rezoned neighborhoods. Given that position that was stated not that long ago, I think it was last month, it is hard to uh, take the analysis completely seriously and, and also the, the answer that you just gave to the question. So does the administration still maintain that position? I will ask City Planning's Executive Director who testified at that hearing, Anita Laramont, to handle this question. Hi, Anita. You're muted. Hello, Speaker. Thank you for this opportunity to respond to this question. Um, what we said at that hearing was not that our actions had no impact, but rather that there are a host of factors that have an impact on racial demographics in neighborhoods and that we don't have very clear data to, to demonstrate what the impacts of rezonings are on racial demographics. We are working to try to give more data on that subject. Uh, but that what we were not seeing in the analyses that we have done thus far is that the actions that we have taken have resulted in, in racial uh, change in neighborhoods. We cited the work that we had uh, done in the uh, Greenpoint uh, rezoning. And uh, we, we made the point that our analysis showed that the Hispanic population had in fact increased in the neighborhood. We are aware that the, the Cuff analysis, which actually looked at a time span much broader than the time span that started once the rezoning was done, showed that there was a Hispanic decrease in the neighborhood. But we believe that what that showed is that that action occurred prior to the rezoning and we really could not substantiate that. We do believe that it is wholly appropriate for us to do look backs in our rezonings and try to make an assessment about what the impact of our zoning changes are. And like we did there, we plan to do for our other neighborhood rezoning areas. Does the administration have anyone here today that can talk about health disparities and how those issues relate to planning? We don't have anyone here from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, okay. well, Health and Mental Hygiene, but I can assure you, Speaker, that as part of our neighborhood rezonings, DOHMH is an invaluable partner. Um, it is, we particularly enjoy working or benefit from working with DOHMH since public health and land use regulation have a common um, background in that they both arose from a recognition of the need to provide light and air for sound land use planning and for public health. And we will, going forward, continue to partner with DOHMH in our rezonings. You know, ANHD, an organization that is part of the uh, Thriving Communities Coalition, found that New York City has lost thousands of hospital beds since 1998 as a result of hospital closures and the city's land use decisions. Two thirds of those closures occurred in low income communities of color that are now bearing the brunt of COVID-19. And many of those hospitals were replaced by luxury housing. Have you looked at how the city's hospital closures and land use decisions contributed to black and Latinx New Yorkers dying at twice the rate of white New Yorkers? We have worked, as I said, very closely with DOHMH, and I'll note, even in the height of the pandemic, they reached out to us knowing of our data-driven, factual, and analytic capabilities. And as I said, I think the, uh, life has changed as a result, not just of the pandemic, but the increased um, attention to the racial inequities. 
And so if anything, our partnership with them needs to be stronger going forward. So, so Ch Chair Lugo, what is your solution to disparities and in inequality? I understand the administration doesn't support this idea. You all made that clear in your testimony. Uh, it sounds like you prefer the status quo, which many New Yorkers and communities do not feel like is working for them. But I did hope that we could have uh, a serious conversation about these disparities and inequities today, uh, which was the impetus for this bill. And, and uh, you know, it seems strange that the administration can uh, sit here and tell the council and the Thriving Communities Coalition that we are wrong about the experiences that council members hear about, that the Thriving Communities Coalition, which represents vulnerable New Yorkers and communities of color, uh, what their own experience has been with the city's land use process, and that we should uh, appreciate how we have it now because comprehensive planning would make it worse. That's what it seems like is being said today. And I think that seems a little out of touch with what council members hear and with what this coalition of groups that do work on the ground in low-income communities of color, what their experience has been. Thank you, Speaker. We could not agree more that there is a need for a value in having a discussion with council members, but also with a wide array of stakeholders. We do not believe that this one specific proposal is the way forward. Um, we recognize that during the recent Council Charter Revision Commission, we heard extensive testimony about the need for comprehensive planning, but that testimony indicated that there were very wide variations in what people meant by comprehensive planning, whether it would be top down or bottom up, the extent of it. And we think that that is a useful conversation to consider and coupling it with a consideration as to whether the charter would need to be revised to change the requirements that are in there with respect to the allocation of responsibilities. That is a discussion that we would welcome, but we're presented here with a bill that we believe has these three main flaws of feasibility, cost, and impact. And that's why we're opposing this introduction. Before I get into some more technical questions, and I'm gonna to try to keep this quick because I know there's a lot of council members that, and the public is here to testify. I also wanna note that the goals here aren't just about equity and resiliency. Those are incredibly important, but our failure to properly plan threatens much more than that. New York City is going to struggle to bounce back. And I think a lot of people and businesses are going to wanna to stay in New York, but will have to work harder to show folks that it's worth it. Uh, that we can handle climate change, that we can get our housing crisis under control, and that our apartments aren't overcrowded, and that our public transit is running. Before we get to whether I think your cost estimates are anywhere near accurate or based on a correct reading of the bill, I want to ask whether anyone in the administration has done any kind of cost-benefit analysis here. I can certainly address, Speaker, your questions about the GEIS cost estimate. Well, let me let, me ask, let, let me ask you that. How, how did you calculate the price tag you came up with for the GEIS? To get to that number, didn't you take the highest price tag you could cost, possibly find? Did you even look at the cost of GISs for real life comprehensive plans? Thank you for the question, Speaker. I can tell you how we came up with an estimate that we think is feasible. We looked at a recent neighborhood rezoning, which didn't comprise an entire community district, but came close to it. The cost of that was two and a half million dollars. We multiplied that by the 59 community districts that exist across the city and the requirement that three different scenarios be provided. That's 177 different scenarios. In addition to the land use scenarios, there is also the requirement to look at the transportation infrastructure. 
everything from the BQE to the Bruckner. And if one just does the math, two and a half million dollars by 59 community districts by three scenarios, one gets over $400 million. But in the, addition- Chair, Chair Lago, the, 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 don't, don't, doesn't, do you understand the argument that this should actually reduce some of your costs? I mean, do you think, you really think the way we spread out all of these studies and plans that you talked about and that I talked about is really the most effective use of taxpayer dollars? I mean, are, are you telling me that the patchwork system where more than uh, half a dozen offices and agencies, OLTPS, DCP, MOS, MOB, HPD, DDC, SCA, EDC, DOT, et cetera, pursuing their own strategies is really more cost effective than streamlining. You don't see any duplication that exists right now. Was that considered in the estimate that you all put forward today? The duplication and the kind of, uh, the way that many agencies are doing their own thing without coordination? A number of responses, Speaker. One is that we, there is always the opportunity to look to streamline city processes. But I can assure you that both in our land use planning and in our capital planning, we work with the agencies that you identified. If I might, Speaker, the other fact, points that we looked to in coming up with our estimate was the fact that the office that is identified for carrying out this plan would have to staff up markedly to be able to undertake this work. We also looked at a recent GEIS, which was conducted for Hudson Yards and the extension of the number seven line. That GEIS alone cost $25 million for an area that comprises just a part of a community district. In your question, Speaker, was also embedded, um, I believe implicitly, um, the fact that under New York State law, cities that undertake a comprehensive plan with a GEIS can then be exempt, projects under that plan can subsequently be exempted from state environmental review requirements. That provision of state law explicitly does not apply to New York City. I'd also note just the difference in the scales of the comprehensive plans and GEISs that have been prepared by other cities in New York State. If we look at the 12 cities in New York State that have over 50,000 people, if we combine them, you still end up with a city that has a population smaller than the Bronx. I, Chair Lago, and, I, just, I just want to go back to the, the point you just made in your answer regarding Hudson Yards. I mean, it's hard for me to believe. Do you really believe that the cost of completing a GEIS for neighborhood plan citywide is even remotely comparable to the GEIS completed for Hudson Yards, which was one of the city's most massive and expensive development initiatives in recent history? Many of these neighborhood plans would not even contemplate uh, any new growth at all, let alone 18 million square feet. That's what Hudson Yards was, 18 million square feet of new commercial and residential development uh, and a brand new subway. So I'm left wondering why we would even use that as a starting point unless, unless we're talking about building a Hudson Yards-like complex and a new subway in every single neighborhood. It seems like apples and oranges to even give that example. Actually, Speaker, I think that the two aren't nearly comparable because the scale and complexity of analyzing three different scenarios, 177 scenarios across 303 miles, and then also looking at transportation, infrastructure, and more means that this GEIS is going to be at a level that's almost inconceivable. Um, we need to look at different scenarios across the entire city, a city that in population would be the nation's 12th largest state. And so I don't think that Hudson Yards 
is a good comparator because the GIS this bill calls for is an order of magnitude more massive. Okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, try to finish up here quickly because I know there's a lot of uh, members uh, that have questions, and of course the public. I want to get back to the equity issue. That was one of the main reasons uh, we were motivated to introduce this bill. The report we released in December spends a lot of time showing how our neighborhood by neighborhood piecemeal approach to zoning isn't just a land use issue. It has real world impacts on communities of color. It exacerbates inequality. Right now, some neighborhoods are covered by customized contextual and special districts, but others, mainly lower income communities of color, are stuck with zoning policies from the early 1960s and only a handful of neighborhoods have MIH. Most neighborhoods have no affordability requirements at all. So I have a few questions for city planning on this. Uh, one of our conclusions we make in our report is that the city's overall zoning landscape is uneven, unequal, and unfair. Do you agree with that assessment? I agree with the need to look at opportunities to provide housing, and in particular, affordable housing across all neighborhoods. Um, we know that because of the tradition of council member deference, that in neighborhoods, even neighborhoods with good subway access, where the community and the council member do not welcome um, the, uh, what we would believe an appropriate upzoning, that there then is not a realistic possibility of addressing the needs and the affordable housing needs. I would we would so welcome having council members like council member Lander and Levin and like council member Chin who have reached out and worked with us to be able to craft an equitable rezoning proposal in a high opportunity neighborhood. And we would welcome that partnership from so many more members of the council. I, I just wanna make one point on a previous point that you made, which was you spoke to the size of New York City. Cities across the globe complete comprehensive plans. London's framework looks a lot like the one that we've designed in this bill and they're larger than New York City. But my next question is, do you think it's acceptable that some neighborhoods have 60 year old zoning and others have 21st century zoning? I think in some instances, the 1961 zoning can continue to be appropriate because not all neighborhoods of New York City change at the same rate. I think it is appropriate when circumstances have changed, when we see a subway line with capacity in a neighborhood that continues to be largely single and two family zoning, that then calls for a look. But I do think that there are areas of, our, of the city that were zoned in 1961 and that have remained relatively unchanged. Okay. Uh, how, how can New York's land use policy possibly be brought up to date without a more comprehensive approach? Do you believe that our current system of land use and zoning policies are equitable? Do you, do you think our approach to neighborhood rezonings currently help us achieve citywide goals? I would say yes, process, speaker. I would say yes, Speaker, each of the neighborhood rezonings that have been adopted have been adopted with the support of the local council member. And that in and of itself is an indication of the ground up community support. I very much am pleased as I keep coming back to the fact that um, but for a lawsuit stopping the commencement of Euler we would be in the midst of Euler to rezone Gowanus, a high opportunity neighborhood with good subway access. Okay, uh, I'm gonna stop my questions for now. I'm gonna come back after members have a chance to ask some of their questions. Uh, I wanna thank you for answering them. I'm gonna have some more for you later on in this hearing. And I wanna turn it back to Chair Cabrera. Thank you all for being patient with me. Uh, I, I appreciate it, uh, Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for your insightful questions. I want to recognize we're being joined by Council Member Gibson, Dharma Diaz, Levin, and Reynoso. 
Uh, Chair, I want to I just have a few questions and I'll come back later on because I, I do want to get to my uh, colleagues. I know they have questions as well. But can you share with us how does the administration's one NYC plan inform the city's future uh, infrastructure repairs, proposed land use action, or other term city planning? Thank you for the question. Um, it's appropriate that we're having this hearing today because just yesterday, the city released its food policy plan, something that is incredibly time, timely given the food insecurity that we've seen as a result of COVID and that existed before, um, but that flowed from the strategic plan 1NYC. I've mentioned before zoning for coastal resiliency this is a citywide plan that was referred out to all community boards and that followed on years of very neighborhood-based outreach. Um, that is just one example. And with that, I'll toss it over to Dan Zerilli. Thanks for that. I'm sorry, it just takes a second to get off mute here. Um, thank you for that, Chair Lago. I, I think it's helpful to put a little context here on 1NYC um, to help answer this question and understand um, the answer. You know, as we go through the quadrennial 1NYC process um, that we've partnered with uh, the council on since 2007, very successfully, uh, we take stock of the challenges that face New York City. Um, and that process since 2007 has evolved um, very extensively to really look um, at uh, all of the challenges uh, strategically that face us over the next several decades. And that's things like rising unaffordability, economic insecurity, the stubborn health and wealth inequities here in New York City, of course, our climate emergency, um, the needs to update our infrastructure, and even the threats to our democracy. It's really a broad-based program that then we put forward strategic priorities and goals backed up with action plans and indicators to measure progress. And all of those items, all the different um, initiatives and goals that we lay out, um, then find much um, more in-depth planning processes and efforts and actions across the agencies um, to deliver on those goals. And, and I think um, Chair Lago um, mentioned a few of them uh, that are very important, whether it's uh, the Zoning for Coastal Resiliency and all of the extensive work um, really since Hurricane Sandy to think about the risks in our coastal neighborhoods, um, things like uh, the environmental justice work that's happening, the environmental justice for all that uh, the speaker mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, very extensive public engagement that's underway now to inform um, different ways of embedding environmental justice into the city's decision making, which um, it, it certainly deserves its own um, extensive process and collaboration with the council and neighborhoods all across the city to inform that work um, and things like yesterday's food policy plan. And so I think there are extensive ways where um, the, the strategic plans and priorities that are laid out in 1NYC then find homes, whether it's through our infrastructure agencies and DOT, and, and we've even seen that play out um, during the pandemic as we've been prioritizing things like open streets and open restaurants and you know, new ways to utilize our street space. Um, and a, a lot of those goals and priorities and, and items um, first came out through collaboration with DOT through the 1NYC process. And so I think there's, um, we can point out lots of different ways where that strategic priority process, um, which takes stock of all the challenges and, and is data driven, then is delivered upon through all of the different other actions and initiatives and policies that the city has. So I hope that answers the question, but I think it's um, it was helpful just for a little, I think, um, a little of the overarching framework for how we approach this and then how that um, uh, is delivered across the administration and in partnership with New Yorkers and with the council as well. Have you looked at ways to uh, enhance coordination between city agency? Uh, I'm assuming that uh, you obviously see the benefits of having a cohesive way to have any interagency cooperation. 
but have you looked at ways uh, to, to do so? Uh, and how do you compare that uh, with the speaker's bill? Thank you for the question, council member. Um, because city planning's remit is so broad, because land use planning um, involves transportation, it involves parks, it involves our sewer and water infrastructure, we work on a daily basis with our sister agencies. I should also note it involves um, the Department of Health, it involves small business services, we work with the Economic Development Corporation with, with HPD. The uh, alphabet soup of city agencies that the speaker mentioned, um, they are our partners day in and day out. I would also want to highlight something that was started by this administration, which was a reinvigoration of the capital planning function at the Department of City Planning. DCP hosts regular meetings with the agencies, with the major capital agencies that are responsible for the lion's share of the city capital budget. And OMB is obviously part of these discussions. And we use these routine meetings to hone in on areas where there are opportunities for efficiencies, to identify gaps, to identify overlaps, exactly the uh, types of efficiencies that you mentioned. And, and how do you compare this with the speaker's uh, plan where, where it seems to be streamlined? I would have to, with respect, take issue, council member, with the notion that um, requiring 177 distinct plans simultaneously with a GEIS is a streamlining. I think that the ultimate impact will be to place another hurdle in the way of accomplishing needed affordable housing proposals. And I'll note that the vast majority of projects that go through ULERP are non-controversial. Um, they receive the support of the council. Um, I fear that the message will be that there's a chill on development, that it's that much harder to get things done in the city and that is, would be so unfortunate at a time where the pandemic has made crystal clear the need to provide more housing and in particular affordable housing, the need to kickstart the economic recovery. You know, I'm a, I'm a former community board member and, and I have to be honest with you, one of my greatest frustration is that you know, every year we will assess the needs of uh, the communities. We will prioritize, we turn it into the city, but many council members, I mean, our community board members, um, they get the overall feeling that, that unless it's priority number one, most of the things that are listed will never come to pass. So can you talk about what's your process of integrating the needs and priorities identified by communities, including the community boards uh, in its strategic planning efforts? Uh, and, and how do we get community boards to have a larger say and to actually see it in a very tangible way? Thank you for that question, council member, because it um, allows me to highlight the way in which the community district statements of needs um, has evolved since you were a community board member. Um, we have taken a process that was paper-based and incredibly difficult for um, both community board members, but especially district managers to wade their way through. Um, one, we brought it into the modern era by uh, bringing it online. And then secondly, we simplified the categories of needs into buckets that made sense. We worked extensively with the community boards and district managers on training them in the new system. I would say the first year that we rolled it out, it was already an improvement. But now that we've been at it for, I believe, four years, um, we are getting such richer 
data. Um, we are getting requests that aren't just a cut and paste from last year's, but reflect the changing needs. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we take this information and we share it with the city's capital agencies so that it's not just the community boards and city planning that see it, the community board, city planning and OMB that see it, but the actual agencies themselves. And I do think that a process that historically, I think your critique was accurate, is actually evolving into a useful planning tool that is so heavily community informed. And I would ask Dan, if you have anything that you would want to add. And Dan, as you're muting yourself, uh, if you could address whether feedback is to loop back to the community boards to be able to say, this is the amount of, of, of your uh, of your input that we took into consideration and it actually uh, became part of the plan and, uh, and it was executed. Yeah, I'll thank note, you. I got, oh. okay, go. Thank you for that question. I think it's, um, you know, we all agree it's incredibly important to find ways to um, make sure that we're hearing from New Yorkers and the development of all these um, plans and efforts and for the one NYC process in particular, we literally went out to every single community, you know, either digitally or in person and heard from every single zip code in New York City. We went out in 11 different languages um, as part of an extensive survey process that we did across New York City, as well as in-person events to make sure that we were hearing from New Yorkers. And we published some of the results of what we've heard um, in the plan itself and how that was being incorporated. And maybe just to, to use a, a great example of how these um, connect um, with the one NYC process laying out strategic priorities. Now we're also undertaking a very extensive public engagement process as part of the environmental justice plan. Um, and we're doing a, a similar effort to go out to environmental justice communities in particular that have been defined by law as uh, uh, with uh, the city council and are hearing from New Yorkers to um, shape the environmental justice plan that we now have, uh, uh, that we're in the process of developing for New York City. And it, it's, um, I think it's, it's really helpful to think about how um, all of these efforts require a, a substantial amount of public engagement. And um, by having a, a, a strategic priority process that then is um, you know, delivered upon in different strategies and planning processes, um, you know, th across the administration, we're hearing very robust things from communities and are really thinking about new ways to incorporate that as we move forward. Um, and I think the, the EJ plan is a great example of that. I think the work that's being done on the waterfront plan is a great example of that. There's so many different areas where having that, that topic specific feedback um, almost wouldn't be possible if you tried to put it into one big planning process, but we're able to hear much more robust um, feedback uh, that we can incorporate by doing it in a way that we do it now. You know, I want to make sure we're not just talking about community engagement before the one NYC plan is drafted, but afterwards. Can you give us some examples of uh, where community boards' needs were funded and otherwise addressed? Gladly. Um, we would look to um, the rezoning that we did in East New York. Um, with the support of then council member Espinal. And that is the first of the comprehensive of the neighborhood rezonings that this administration undertook. And because it occurred a number of years ago, we are already seeing the, um, the investments. We're seeing the affordable housing that is being built, the school that's under construction. Um, something as straightforward as the um, creation and upgrading of the median along Atlantic Avenue that takes what had been a very unsafe and daunting roadway and makes it much more community centric. We see there the, um, the taking of or the, the repurposing of an old courthouse into a youth community center um, run by NYPD with fabulous new offices for the community board in the building. Um, and so 
Um, there are examples, um, Council Member Cabrera, closer to home for you with the Jerome Avenue rezoning that both you and Council Member Gibson supported. Even though that rezoning is relatively recent, um, we are seeing the progress that the Parks Department has made on Corporal Fisher Park. Um, zoning is uh, rezoning takes years to effectuate, but we are already seeing the seeds that have been planted beginning to sprout. Thank you so much. I have a couple more questions, but uh, I want to get to my chairs. But uh, let me, since we just talked on community boards, I know they just clearings are cut this year. There's another projected cut that is coming, and if they're going to be able to do the work that they need to do. We can't keep slashing their budget. We'll address that next month on their preliminary budget hearing. Uh, but we want to make sure that they have the tools in order to do their job. And so I, I want to pass it now. I have more questions, but I'll come back later uh, to uh, cheer uh, uh, my co-chair, Salamanca. Thank you, uh, Chair Cabrera. Um, I want to stay in line with the conversations and questions that you have regarding community boards. Um, it's good to see you, Chair Lago. Um, as you know, I'm a former district manager for Bronx Community Board too. Um, and I can understand the frustrations that I had as a district manager when I submitted my community statement needs uh, regarding the, uh, the capital and expense. And I always felt that OMB basically ignored our recommendations. Their response to the capital and expense needs were, oh, ask your local elected official uh, you know, to, to, uh, to fund these uh, expense or capital needs or, you know, submit this request at a later time because there's, there, there is no funding. So my question here is, uh, is first, is, is OMB in, in this hearing? Yes, we're joined by Tara Boyard. But if I might, council member, um, the process has evolved in what I believe is such a productive way since your time as a district manager. OMB works with the agencies to require them to provide a public response for every request that's submitted. And it has become not a cursory exercise, but actually a real explanation and with an identification of real people in the agencies with whom the community board, the district manager can follow up on. And I'll not toss it over to Tara for further explication. Sure. Thank you, Chair Lago. Uh, we appreciate the question, and there are multiple points of intervention where we hear from community boards in the budget process. There is a whole team at OMB that keeps us informed of community board priorities, and we hear specifically from the agencies what are those priorities as we're putting together the capital plan. Um, obviously, we listen during the council hearings, uh, not only the OMB hearing, but each one of the agency hearings and the public testimony period. And uh, we hear from DCP in the Capital Planning Forum that outlines all the community board uh, needs associated with not only rezonings, but capital projects in general. Ultimately, we have to take all of that information and weigh it against various needs. Uh, they could be legal mandates or, or other needs that are not necessarily coming from the community and uh, balance that into what we can fund or present during the, the budget process. Um, and of course, the, the, the ultimate is what we can actually afford uh, in the capital process. But we, we are interested in hearing how we can improve the process. What percentage of recommendations that community boards give for capital needs are actually fulfilled? You know, I, I would have to get back to you on that. We are required to provide a response. So uh, I, I think that we will have to do an exercise to, to actually agree. run those I numbers. Agree. I have to agree that you guys do give a response, but 90, 95% of the time, your response is ask your local council member to, pro to, to fund these programs. Um, so I just want to say that while I understand that you have regrammed and may have improved on how to get extract that information from the community boards, but the actual administration fulfilling those needs that the community boards are requesting, it's not happening. And I know that first as a former district manager. Um, um, Chair, Chair Lago, my, my other question is, community boards, I believe that every community board should have an urban planner, an independent urban planner, not an urban planner that comes from city planning. Um, 
is that something that city planning will support in ensuring that community boards do not get cut anymore, but we can add funding so that they can hire an independent urban planner that's independent from the administration that can give our community boards um, actual recommendations of how the administration's uh, uh, recommendations to, to, to build in their communities will actually affect their community. Because in my opinion, city planning comes in and you're only giving a one-sided opinion. And I believe that there should be an independent planner that can give community boards what the outcome will be of what the, recommend, of, of what the city is recommending to develop in their communities. Thank you for that question, council member. I'll note that the issue of the budget for community boards is a matter for a budget discussion among the administration, O&B and the council. I will note a couple of things. One is that a well-informed community board, a community board that has a strong district manager as you were when you were in that role, a community board that has a strong chair and land use chair is a benefit to the city. We enjoy working with community boards that delve into the facts and that are interested in data-driven, fact-based planning. I'll also note that we do have a planner assigned to each community board and they represent the often conflicting views of voices within the community. As you would know, not just as a district manager, but even more so as a council member, very frequently there are differing views um, with respect to land use issues. Um, I'll use as an example, the proposal that we have working with council member Lander and Levin for a Gowanus rezoning. Um, a neighborhood group has to stop the Euler process from even commencing. And as the city is challenging that lawsuit, we are joined by the community board, a community board that is, would still want through the Euler process to see the proposal be refined, but a community board that has worked with us over close to five years in coming up with a proposal that reflects the needs of many different constituencies within the Gowanus neighborhood. Oh, thank you, um, Chair Lago. I just you know, want to reiterate, if this administration is serious about community input, it starts with community boards. Slashing community board budgets like they're doing now, what you're doing is, in my opinion, is silencing community boards and not giving them the resources that they need so that they can gather community information and give it back to the administration. Uh, I'm going to move on with my questions here. Um, this this uh, proposal in terms of this comprehensive plan here, um, in, in terms of the recommendations that we have here, um, something that strikes to me, um, communities such as mine, for example, and in the five years that I've been in the council, I've approved about 7,000 units of 100% affordable housing. Um, there are two projects, uh, big projects that got approved when I first got elected. Uh, you have La Central, uh, which is under construction now, over 900 units of 100% affordable housing. You also have La Peninsula, uh, 700 units of 100% affordable housing. And I'm really excited about those two projects. It's really revitalizing uh, these communities. Um, but something that, that I just cannot understand is the administration wants to build and continue to build affordable housing in these communities. But when I bring up the conversations, well, you're, you're bringing in more families to my communities. Where are the supportive services that are supposed to come with that? For example, school seats, health care, public safety, uh, more parks, improving transportation. It seems as if I'm pulling tea from the administration when I'm asking for that, but yet the administration wants to continue to build in my community. So what is city planning's, what is uh, the city planning's uh, plan as to you're building more housing in communities, but is there a plan to attach supportive services as you are increasing density and increasing the population in these communities? Thank you for the question, council member. Of, of course, as part of the review of any proposal um, that would increase density, we look at the impact that uh, it will have. I'll use the, the first example that you cited of school seats. We work hand in glove with the School Construction Authority 
um, to do an analysis of the school seat need from um, not just on comprehensive neighborhood rezonings, but on large individuals. It is something, uh, large individual projects. It is something that we just keep in mind as part of our annual statement of needs process. We have feedback mechanisms. I, I, and, and that's the thing, you're keeping it in mind, but what about actually building a school in a community when you're increasing density? Again, we work with the SCA to identify when the school seat need triggers the it triggers the need for an additional school. What about public safety? Um, you know, with the fire department, the police department, EMS. I can't speak for those agencies. Other than that, they are routinely assessing the needs of the city, of a changing city. But, but your Lago, you're the chair of the city planning commission. You're supposed to plan for these things. So if you're planning on adding more density and increasing the population in the community, shouldn't you also be working with these agencies and planning on how to increase staffing um, and uh, to provide more support services to these communities? These are agencies that continually keep in mind the changing needs of the community council member. <laughs> So is city planning talking to NYPD, the fire department and EMS as you're building more uh, affordable housing units and communities and increasing density? Are those conversations happening? We are routinely working with the alphabet soup of agencies. And again, we use our statement of needs as the absolute um, as a wealth of information. And it's not just with the capital agencies. We give the, the growth forecast, we share them with operational agencies, like the ones that you mentioned, police department, fire, EMS. Um, I have two more questions, Mr. Chair, and then I'm gonna pass it along. Um, Chair Lago, I believe in responsible development. And I think that a responsible developer comes to a community when they're prior to certifying, if they're planning on building or developing their community. Um, but not all developers do that. Many developers, what they do is that they go and certify, start the process, and immediately the community boards are on, there's a time, there's a time stamp. And they have a certain time to, uh, to, to review the application and move on. What systems are you implementing to ensure that developers are going to community boards or to communities presenting their plan and getting community input prior to they certify. Thank you, council member. I do have to start by thanking you. You are a council member who understands the value of taking long underutilized land and um, putting it to having private landowners put it to productive use that provides the housing and the two signature projects that you mentioned are ones that we're quite proud of. We absolutely advise any landowner who comes to us with a proposal to speak with the community, to speak with the council member early on. As you said, those that do, we see that their land use applications um, generally fare well through the Euler process. And I will note that the vast majority of ULERP applications, including for affordable housing, um, do not generate controversy. The ones that do generate controversy are obviously the ones that attract attention. But I, I would welcome a discussion with you, council member, and with other stakeholders about how we can address those landowners who don't follow up on our suggestion that it is valuable, it's part of good planning to reach out early to the council member and the community board. Is it a requirement or, or there's no requirement from city planning to these developers? No, there's not a requirement. Although council member, um, if you have um, participated in a city planning commission, um, either a review session or the public hearing, you'll note that the commission routinely asks about the, whether there was prior outreach, the extent of it, 
And when the answer is that the landowner hasn't done it, hasn't done it um, a um, request by commissioners uh, or advice by commissioners that it would be tremendously helpful. We share your sense that a landowner who works with the community board and the council member, um, that helps the landowner's proposal move forward with less controversy. Then my last question, I, I heard loud and clear your opposition to this uh, proposed comprehensive plan. So my, my question to you is, what in your mind could this legislation do to detriment equitable development, particularly in affluent communities who have, who have inherited the, uh, you know, not in my backyard in the past? Thank you for that question, council member. Um, as I mentioned in response to earlier questions, we see community districts um, in areas with good subway access um, where there has not been a single ULERP application. Um, we know that the council, uh, the, the speaker, I'm sorry, um, commented that um, under this bill, many neighborhoods wouldn't contemplate any growth at all. We think that all neighborhoods need to contribute, including perhaps most especially neighborhoods with good transit access where the zoning is um, for extraordinarily low growth. And so I am concerned that in communities that have the opportunity to pull more weight, um, have the transit access that would warrant a higher level of housing development that would necessarily bring affordable housing, um, that this proposal um, gives yet another opportunity to stop the type of um, appropriate upzoning that is needed to address the city's affordability crisis. My other concern is that um, we know that not all community districts um, have the same historic resources to be able to oppose development. And my concern is that, again, under this bill, it would be those community districts that are able to hire counsel to oppose the plan and to oppose every project under the plan um, that would um, prevent us from having the type of equitable development that you call for. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Chilago. Uh, thank you, Chair Cabrera, for the opportunity to ask my question. Thank you so much. With that, we'll turn it over to our co-chair, Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Cabrera. Chair Salamanca, I'd, I'd actually like to follow up on some of your questions. Um, just real quickly, I really appreciate the way you frame them. Um, so I, I'm wondering, and thank you so much for, of course, to the administration for being here and taking these questions. Um, but I'd like to follow up on the question of how do we know whether or not the city is meeting the needs that of a community when um, uh, there's a, a additional population added. And Chair Salamanca, I went through the exact same thing with an upzoning in my district where when you read the environmental impact statement, it states very clearly that we need more school seats or we need additional sewage capacity. But you know, the EIS is only recommendations of course, right? The city doesn't have to do any of that. I think the only thing, if I recall correctly, that the city has to do is meet the needs uh, for daycare. And indeed, and I don't even know if it's that they have to do it. They have to let, uh, I think it was DYCD and ACS know that uh, there would be increased demand for daycare. So again, it's still all, recommendations, there's no like link even between the EIS and, and the area that I'm going to be talking about, which is the capital budget strategy. There's no link to that, is there? So I'm, I'm just wanting to nail down the validity of how the system works. Thank you, council member. Um, I'd like to start by clarifying 
the purpose of an environmental impact statement. Um, I think that many incorrectly think that it is um, a crystal ball that predicts the future. In fact, under city law, what is required is to disclose the impacts, disclose those impacts that could be mitigated, and to have that information available to the decision makers as they make their decisions. It is not a document that says this is going to happen or you must do this. And with that clarification, I'm actually going to pass it along to John Kaufman, who will talk about the work that our capital planning team does with respect to capacity analyses. I appreciate that. And if, I mean, I think what you just explained was exactly my point. Uh, that under the law, there is no requirement that the EIS serve the, this purpose. I mean, which always makes me wonder why we're spending millions of dollars on EISs. But uh, sure, love to hear from the capital person. Thank you. Sean? John. Hi, I'm sorry, I was waiting for to be unmuted. Um, hi, my name again is John Kaufman. I, again, we do a lot of work on the capital planning front to do better planning overall, much of which this bill you know, intends to make even stronger. Um, the, the, what we're talking about here is how we think about all these different facilities that have you know, you know, children who need more capacity, who need more school seats to go to when they're going into areas that already have density. Our, Plans here are, is, as Marisa said, a ongoing dialogue with all the capital agencies to make sure they understand where the growth in the city is happening, not just currently, but as we look ahead where the DOE permits are going in. And so we sit down and talk about that with them on a regular basis. Some groups like SDA want more interaction, and other groups like FDNY do it uh, less, less frequently. But the whole idea is that we're always one step ahead of the game by looking into where the people are moving into as well as the population shifts that happen in certain neighborhoods. You know, as you all know, a lot of our growth happens not from new housing, but from different configurations of households or certain areas you know, having more residents move into them. And that all goes into these growth forecasts that we regularly share with all the different capital agencies such that they understand sort of what's coming their way when they do their detail. Right, I mean, <laughs> uh, with all due respect for just one second, and I'm looking at my other colleagues with their hands up. So I really just want to not let, let's just try to be short and sweet in our answers and our questions. But I mean, I know the formula. It, yes, there's a formula in city planning. Everyone knows it. I don't know why you'd have to sit down and discuss it with SCA. It's never been revised. It's something like for every building unit that goes up, I, I'm forgetting now, this was seven years ago, 0. 0.12 will end up in middle school, 0.1 eight ends up in elementary and 0 0.05 ends up in high school. I mean, there's no, it's a formula that may or may not be accurate for that community. It's a citywide formula that's never changed. So, I, I mean, again, I, I'm talking about not what does the law require us to yeah. do. I'm talking about how is it, how do we get, which is what Chair Salamanca was talking about, the best planning outcome for our community. Meeting the law is a pretty low bar, no? Yeah, well, and I'll say, actually, I wasn't commenting on the law portion. I was commenting on what we do separate from the EISs, which is actually to talk about population changes in our area, regardless of what the ratios for seekers specify. So this is a much more targeted, like planning-based activity, I, which is I just, where, the, where are people happened, moving in? If that happened, it never happened under my tenure. I've been through two rezonings, so, okay. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, again, with, with all due respect, I mean, this is in the background of just the normal planning processes we do, part of the, the turbo charge that, you know, that Chair Lago referred to earlier about a bigger capital planning division okay. that actually thinks about- So it's about not anything you share with council members who represent the district, it's just background well, planning that all y'all do? Yeah, I mean, the growth forecasts are out there and we've, we've published some of this on our website for folks to understand where growth has happened in the city. And the SCA forecasts are also published separate again from the IES, but actually as part of their overall capacity planning exercises. And council member, if I could clarify um, my earlier comment, if an FEIS identifies feasible mitigation for an impact, it has to be implemented. And so that is um, 
one reason why we value having an environmental review because it identifies and then determines whether mitigation is feasible. Yeah, I, I wish that were true. Uh, it's not been my experience. And then sort of along those lines, um, so specifically as chair of the subcommittee on capital budget, I'm thinking about how the 10 year capital strategy, the city's budget planning document is used by the planners. So again, sort of keeping in mind um, that I worked at OMB for nearly a decade and have a very clear idea of how seriously or not seriously OMB and the agencies consider community board district needs statements. With that in mind, sort of zooming out a bit, I was wondering if you could tell me a bit about the administration's view of the purpose of the 10-year capital strategy in its current form and whether or not that strategy is referred to by agencies or the administration as a planning tool during the year. Thank you, Council Member. We've often benefited from your expertise um, with OMB, but as oh, I, I mentioned- Oh, I don't know about that. You guys know what you're doing. OMB certainly knows what it's doing, which is why we're pleased to be working with them. But I, I would note, <laughs> That with the reinvigoration of the capital planning function at city planning, um, we have a must, much more robust engagement, both with the community districts through the statement of needs, but also by bringing a more plannerly approach to the 10-year capital strategy. Um, I will turn it over to Tara at this point, if she would like to comment. Thank you, Chair Lago. Actually, I'm turning it over to Paul. I'm trying to unmute myself. Yeah. Thank you for your question, Chair Rosenthal, and it's nice to see you. Um, always good to see you. Always good to see you. So your question about using the 10-year capital strategy as a, as a planning tool, it's, a, it's both a planning tool and a budget document, as, as you know. Um, the first thing, you know, as uh, when you put on your OMB hat is you look at in terms of affordability. Mm -hmm. So when we present this program, you know, the, the one we just released in January, it goes through fiscal year 31. And, you know, one of the, the responsibilities for us is to be fiscally responsible, financially responsible in that we keep our uh, debt service as a percentage of tax revenues under 15% annually. Yeah, and it's around 12 now. It hovers always between 11 and 12. That's yes. good. Yes. So when we, look, when we look at the overall size of the document right now, uh, you know, you look at the 10 years, uh, it's $118.8 billion. And what I would say is the overall size of the strategy really corresponds to the city's average annual commitment rate of $11.8 billion over the last three years. So that's not including 2020 with, with you know, where the pandemic hit. Um, so we, we, we think that the overall size of the strategy, the envelope is the right size. Uh, it's just, I guess the, the concern is that the buckets of which everything is in. Um, we've been working with council, uh, the council and the uh, subcommittee on capital budget on addressing uh, front loading, uh, that's always an issue in, in the strategy. And, um, you know, we've been very, very successful doing that. Uh, but we look at it a little differently too at OMB. Keeping the earlier years more robust than the outer years, it gives the agencies more of an opportunity to commit more projects. Um, over the last three years, again, working with the, uh, you know, the committee on, on the capital, subcommittee on capital budget, uh, and your predecessor, Council Member Gibson, uh, we, we, we started to achieve historic heights in capital commitment rates. Mm -hmm. And in 2019, we achieved about $12.6 billion, which was an all-time high for the city. Uh, we equate that to having a little bit of more robust plan early on. Um, and then unfortunately, through, uh, through March of last year, through 2020, um, we were about $200 million ahead of the previous year's 
pace. So we were thinking we were going to achieve well over $13 billion. Yes, in yes. No, it was amazing. COVID-19 hit and yeah. all of these capital restrictions went into place. Uh, with, that, with, with that, it resulted in only, half, we only achieved about $8 billion, which was half of our commitment plan for 2020. Well, now we're faced with a huge challenge. We now have to roll about $7.9 billion out of 2020 into the out years of the, of the strategy. Well, that's where having it a little bit lesser in the out years helps us because you can't roll everything into the following fiscal year. It would have made it ridiculous. It would have been, you know, a 25 or a $30 billion, you know, commitment. Plan. Yeah, Paul, so, again, so we, just, use, we use those years. Yeah, to, I got to you. Out. I got you. These are great. And again, I'm just looking at my colleagues who, who look like they're going to, you know, kill me in about a three seconds. Um, okay. You know, uh, in I think what that, I, I think my maybe, point would be is that we need flexibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. This, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. About. Yep, I'm with you on the flexibility, 100%. Um, let me ask you, though, that in doing your work, how was that linked with um, Dan Zerilli's work on one NYC? So as you're thinking about um, pushing things into out years, where were your priorities? And I'm seeing Councilmember Lander say, are you going to ask about the affordable housing that you pushed back into the next year? And I promised Councilmember Lander I won't ask, and you get to ask that question. But um, just if, if um, uh, commissioners really could talk just a little bit about how were the priorities of one NYC sort of linked to all the budget, you know, these necessary because of COVID, the the having to force it into the out, having to force spending into the out years. Uh, thank you, Chair Rosenthal. I, and I don't. I certainly want to let OMB speak for OMB on this. I can say that in the development of One NYC, um, really the the three groups here, and working very closely with the, uh, DCP and OMB, we helped set the priorities for the prior ten year capital plan um, and the the goals that the mayor has continued to lay out for making sure that we're ensuring the growth of the city and um, ensuring equity and resiliency and sustainability. And that flowed through NYC and has continued to be a partnership with OMB on you know, priorities that come from the mayor. Okay, I'm just wondering, does that, when you look through the capital budget strategy, does that link to one NYC? And I don't know if my colleagues at OMB would rather um, uh, jump in on this, but I think that the, the alignment on priorities is, is clear. From our point of view, and um, you know, individual project choices and things like that are always going to be, you know, deliberated and and um, and weighed against each other. Are you part of that? Those discussions? On the you know on a on a regular basis, I think our, our influence is really through City Hall and uh, with the first deputy mayor, and and there's the I think the the collaboration that happens with OMB is with City Hall directly. Okay, thank you very much. Really appreciate you all. Back to you, Chair Cabrera. Thank you. Thank you so much. At uh, this moment, we are going to turn to our colleagues. I want to thank them for being so patient. Uh, we'll have five minutes, uh, and I'm holding to a firm five minutes. And here's the good news because we're going to have a second round. So uh, that way, uh, you can end up with 10 minutes if you choose to. But please, if we could hold to the five minutes, and then we'll come back again. Okay, I'll hold my questions to the very, very end, so there won't be anything in between. With that, I'll turn it over uh, to our committee council, DJ Mayor. Thank you, Chair. I'll now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. <clears throat> council members, if you would like to ask a question you have not yet raised your hand, please do so now. You have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Once I have called on you, please wait until the Sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your question. First, we will hear from Council Member Lander who had his hand up first before having to leave and come back. Uh, and then we will hear from Council Member Reynoso followed by Council Member Miller. Oh, excuse me, Council Member Powers followed by Council Member Reynoso. Um, Council Member Lander, please go ahead. Thank you so much. 
Thank you so much, Chair. And I've been on the whole time. I just had to switch devices. So, um, uh, Chair, thank you all to all the chairs uh, and the speaker. Thank you for convening this hearing. Chair Lago, thank you for being with us. I think, you know, I have worked hard to be a leaning in partner uh, in thinking about the future of my own community in Gowanus, in working with HPD on the where we live process and working uh, with Director Zorilli on the one NYC process. But I'll just be honest, um, we are the frog in the proverbial pot. We are watching the water boil. The temperatures are rising and the seas are rising. Our affordable housing crisis is growing. Our infrastructure is aging. And it is clear that our land use process has become toxic and broken and unable to deliver thoughtful conversation about the very future of our city. And here we are sitting in that pot, watching it boil, um, hoping that somehow magically the same Euler process that we've had that has gotten us in this predicament that has left us unable to fix it is going to get us out. But it is not going to get us out. Our real estate process debate is going to get even more toxic. The temperatures are going to keep ri arising along with the seas. Our affordability crisis is going to keep growing. And we've got no unified strategy to invest our capital budget, as Chair Rosenthal said, or to make a good series of plans. And, you know, the Charter Revision Commission that, you know, some folks on this pa uh, panel took part in recognized it. It said we've reached a level of public disillusionment that the scattered approach the charter takes to various planning requirements exacerbates disillusionment and confusion. But all that Charter Revision Commission did was a 30-day email in advance of a planning process. It does nothing to get us out of that boiling pot. Um, and so I'm really deeply disappointed. It's fine to criticize this or that element or specific or proposal, um, but this administration has utterly failed to put forward any kind of thinking about our long-term future and its planning that might get us out of that pot. It's easy to let people put something on the table as council member Reynoso and I did at the planning commission as the speaker and council are doing today and nitpick about it, make up numbers that look good in a headline, but it's an abdication of responsibility for the city's long-term future that you are charged with, with stewarding. So um, I guess I wanna ask two questions and I'm gonna put them out there because I'm gonna lose my time otherwise. First, in Gowanus, I think as you know, it's taken us the better part of a decade to try to build a thoughtful community conversation. And you've said to me on a couple of occasions that, you know, where would other council members be from whiter, wealthier neighborhoods who would try to show up for a fair housing approach? But you know they're not gonna, you know, like that's not gonna happen out of our short-term politics. There's no way communities are gonna like show up with their hands raised and say, we'd like to do our fair share, let's engage in planning. There's no chance of it. So the only choices are a top-down city hall strategy that points at neighborhoods and throws darts at a map and targets communities with no rhyme or reason, or developers who show up um, demanding rezonings. Short of a more thoughtful, comprehensive, fair share and values-minded community planning process, how on earth could we have a fair process for thinking about the future of our city? How do you think we would come out of, you know, get it, get anything like the conversation we are having in Gowanus in other places without a process like this? And I guess the part two of that question is just really honestly, do you believe that this administration has put forward a thoughtful approach to getting us out of the pot we're boiling in? I know there's a supposedly a new charter revision commission with a focus on equity that's going to get started. But if you're just going to sit here and criticize this uh, set of proposals, where is the proposal that is serious about how toxic our land use and planning process has become and how urgent more thoughtful planning is? Thank you, council member. I've very much enjoyed the numerous discussions that we've had about planning, whether for Gowana specifically or more generally. And while we disagree on many things, I value your commitment to good planning. I would note that this hearing is on the proposal that is before us, a proposal that is top down. And I'm not going to let you. I'm sorry, project. Chair. Do not start speaking to this proposal again. I asked you at the time of the Charter Revision Commission. You and I met before the Charter Revision Commission to say, will you please offer proposals? So please don't start again nitpicking this one. I'll just name what what serious proposal has this administration put forward to address that broader set of comprehensive long term challenges that our city faces, given how toxic our land use process has become? Because all I've seen is that 30 day email that we get now in advance of of a process. Council member, you know 
that a successful rezoning requires the cooperation of the council. I have so frequently lauded you. Time has expired. You could complete the answer. I don't get to ask any more questions, but you could still go ahead and continue the answer. Yes. Great. Thanks so much. Um, you know that I have frequently in public settings like this indicated that the city would benefit from having more council members who recognize the value of engaging with the community and with the planning commission for sound land use. But again, we have before us a proposal that would make it even harder, would add another level of bureaucracy that would be non-binding and that would still result in any project with the slightest bit Madam of controversy. Madam Chair, respectfully, I, I asked you specifically, please, instead of nitpicking on this proposal, speak to what the administration is doing to help us get out of that pot. And I'll end my time here uh, with two things. Uh -huh. One, you know, I do think it's worth bringing forward the quote, sometimes attributed to Dwight Eisenhower, that comprehensive plans are worthless, but comprehensive planning is everything. And we are not doing it. We are a frog boiling in a pot of climate change and lack of affordability and aging infrastructure and toxic planning process. And to have you sit and tell us, you know what, jumping out would just cost too much. Jumping out would have new problems. Everything is fine. Let's just stay right like we are. That's what we're gonna do is boil in that pot. And I, I'm disappointed that we don't have a more proactive approach. That's not to say this proposal is perfect, but the failure of this administration to think long-term and proactively is going to be one of its real long-term failures. So I, I appreciate you as well. Council member, your nice I, I, to me, but, but I really member, feel- I, have, I do have to respond. The speaker himself noted that this proposal would not require any rezonings. And there may be many communities who would anticipate having no growth, and this bill does nothing to change that. Uh, I mean, Madam Chair, the okay. only we'll, chance we uh, have- Council we'll come back. I, I'm gonna have you back. I'm gonna have you back, guarantee. We only have four more. Uh, council members will come back. Uh, and so, uh, guarantee, guarantee. Uh, uh, next, thank you so much. Thanks, Chair. Um, next, we will hear from Council Member Adams, who had her hand up first, uh, and then Council Member Powers, followed by Council Member Reynoso. Uh, Council Member Adams, please begin. What? The time will begin. Thank you very much. I think I better start my video so we can be seen here. Oops. Here we go. Hello, Chair. Lago, it's good to see you again. Um, I, I am enjoying the conversation uh, around this uh, this bill, and it's it's interesting to hear uh, the perspective of uh, city planning uh, on this legislation. I've heard a lot of concerns. I, I'm going to try to piggyback because I am planning to come back for a second round as well uh, on what my colleague just asked, Councilmember Lander. Uh, just asked, we have uh, a very significant piece of legislation in front of us. Um, and uh, in my community in Southeast Queens, we've been hearing a lot of narrative around this particular piece of legislation, which we hope to clear up in this hearing today. Uh, we heard the speaker uh, very forcefully say that this legislation does not uh, does not require amendments or changes to the city's zoning resolution. The legislation does not require or trigger requirements for any kind of rezonings or upzoning. Uh, the legislation does not propose or support the elimination of single family zoning in New York City or propose any specific rezoning actions whatsoever, which is something that my community members uh, seem to dispute. Uh, uh, the, the speaker also uh, contends that the, uh, this legislation uh, does not amend or eliminate community board's role, which is something near and dear to my heart as a former chair of a community board, does not eliminate community board's role in future rezoning processes, uh, which would remain subject to ULERP. Do you disagree with any of those statements that the speaker has made in defense of this uh, legislation? Thank you, Council 
council member and um, we benefit from as with council member Salamanca and other members of the council who have had prior roles with the community board. Um, I think that many of the statements that you have said explain why we have concerns with this. The comprehensive plan that is proposed would put before the community board three options for a multiple choice. I want this one, that one, or the other. Um, following that though, the council member, each council member could determine to revise the targets for their particular neighborhood. And following that, um, it is correct that there is nothing in the legislation that would, um, the, the underlying uh, requirement for ULERP for land use approvals would remain, um, which would mean that it would go to the council um, with the tradition of council member deference. That poses challenges when we think about the equitable allocation of affordable housing and of community facilities. And so we see this proposal as creating a large bureaucracy and expense for a GEIS, but without changing the underlying allocation of responsibilities between the council, the planning commission. Thank you for that. And, and again, uh, the speaker also disputes the cost um, I'm just going to uh, put one more thing out there just to just just to make sure that I hear this loud and clear. Do you perceive a mandate in this legislation to reach any type of quota of housing units, um, which will necessitate upzoning that can potentially eliminate single family communities? Since the Euler process remains unchanged, the bill posits that council members um, who have a proposal coming forward through ULERP that is aligned with the plan would choose to stand down and not call up the proposal. Um, our experience under the current system where there are land use actions that it's voluntary for the council to call, it's optional for the council to call it up. Our experience is that they are always called up. And so because the plan would be at a level of generality that doesn't get to the details that the ULERP process does, when you're engaged in ULERP, there's a discussion of what's the appropriate density, what's the appropriate height, how do we mass the buildings? Um, that's the discussion before the planning commission. Council members frequently in discussing an item that's before them for ULERP go into matters that go well beyond land use, but that are important to the community. And so we anticipate that any project will be called up, will still go through the full ULERP process and well, what this bill will have accomplished. Sure, sure, Lago, I'm just gonna interrupt because I, I, I don't have any time left, but that was a yes or no question. So I'm gonna ask it one more time. Will this legislation, in your perception, potentially eliminate single family communities? Yes or no? Again, council, I can't, uh, council, uh, council member, I, there are so many unknowns about this bill. What I do know is that it will make it harder to adopt the equity goals of providing more affordable housing more equitably across the city. Okay, I don't think I got an answer to that, but I'm gonna come back again for another round. Thank you very much. Thank you, council member. Next, we'll hear from council member Powers, followed by council member Reynoso, and then council member Miller. Council member Powers, you may be on upon the surgeon's announcement. Starting time. Thank you, thanks for the testimony. Thanks to my colleagues for the questions. I just wanna pick up from an earlier conversation, which is, can, can you just tell us maybe or lay out some of the adjustments or changes to the existing land use process that the city planning commission or the administration is currently considering or would support. I recognize that there's lots of ways to look at this proposal and say, here's concern A or concern B. But I think that from a lot of New Yorkers, there's a frustration or a, um, uh, a tension in this current process right now that they like this effects. Lots of different ideas how to do that. I'd love to hear your thoughts or ideas that perhaps would help fix 
existing issues in the process and something that you feel like you could support um, as a change. Thank you, council member. And it is good to speak with you because you are a council member who has been involved in so many land use decisions. Um, and our discussions, I think, have been helpful in making them better proposals. Um, the discussions that we have had have been, I believe, in the wrong setting, in the context of a hearing on a piece of legislation that would so fundamentally restructure land use and that I believe poses a question as to whether charter revision is done. The prior uh, process that we engaged in was during the council's charter revision um, process. And there we heard so much testimony that was conflicting, that there were disagreements about whether um, planning should be top down, whether planning should be bottom up, who should be involved in it. I would welcome having a discussion which would involve the council members for sure, but I think a broad array of stakeholders that would be one, substantive, and two, give the time to delve into the issues. Um, I, I would just note that I think for a lot of folks, New Yorkers, the in the point where they have most of the conversations around it are during private applications and their communities around land use and development. And they feel like that's the wrong time to be able to have a conversation around how much housing is needed in their community or uh, sort of feel like there's a, a clock on that conversation. In fact, I would argue a city council hearing and the city planning uh, a charter revision commission are exactly the right places to have a conversation about the land use process as a whole, rather than doing it during individual community application or private applications in a community. Um, but I, I think- Council member, if I might clarify, I was not suggesting that it is only through the ULIP process. I think that a thoughtful conversation outside of the confines of a charter revision commission where we heard widely differing testimony and then outside of one a hearing on a highly detailed specific bill. I think that that would be helpful and it's something that we would welcome participating in. Uh, Keith, okay, Keith, I, I just feel like, Keith, yeah. I apologize for jumping in. I just wanna make one clarification of something that was just said, not by you, but I don't want it to go past without me jumping in. It was just said, I believe by city planning, uh, I just wanna be clear, community boards will not be forced to pick one of three scenarios. That is not what the bill does. Uh, community boards and borough presidents can design land use frameworks on their own. And those would be sent to the council, which would reconcile those recommendations and adopt final land use scenario, uh, and final land use scenarios for inclusion in a long-term plan. So uh, I just wanna be clear, what was just said is completely inaccurate to what the bill does. I'm sorry, Keith, for interjecting. I just didn't want to pass without me correcting what the facts are. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I guess I, you know just where I'm just to pick up from where we else was leaving off, and I want to get to some other questions. Is just that I think rather than having a like sort of a nitpicking or I don't, not even use the word nitpicking, we can all pick out issues in this process that will be cause a new tension in the process perhaps for us all, but it does not mean it's worth throwing out the entirety of the, of the legislation or the conversation. I think we love, we want city planning to come to us or the administration with thoughts about how to look at larger citywide planning, long-term growth with PIP public input, because I think that's what's missing right now in some of the long-term planning conversations. And I think we'd like to see some real um, uh, sort of adjustments to this rather than just saying um, we don't like it or you know, so forth. Um, I, I got a couple questions though, and, and I'm going to ask for a little more time because I lost about a minute there. But um, for one of the questions, one of the oh, things- Council member, you didn't lose any mo uh, any minutes. Uh, the, the, the sergeant was able to, to keep it. And you, uh, okay. It's like he okay. did right now. Oh, okay. Okay. okay, so um, for communities that right now, for a lot of the communities that get rezoned, they end up with a lot of investments as part of that process. They get, you name some of them in East New York, for example, that happen as a result of the East New York rezoning. Um, they get massive investment into their community as part of that process, as part of that, you know, I, I would say, negotiation for the rezoning. 
What about the other communities that don't get that? What happens in terms of assessing the needs of communities that are not going for a rezoning, where they don't have the benefit of a public process to bring in new investment? Um, I think that that is one of the conversations, one of the pieces of conversation that's really you know, missing. I'm inspired. Is, um, is making investments in communities when there's not a, a process that, uh, that brings those into them. So how does the city assess those needs then? How does the city make citywide assessments? And can you give us any specific examples of that? Certainly, thank you for the question on that council member. Um, we are proud of the fact that in connection with neighborhood wide rezonings that have markedly increased the density and the housing that we have been able to bring the needed infrastructure investments. But that is a very small part of the city's overall capital planning process. The vast majority of the capital budget is not going to those neighborhoods. It's done citywide and I'll turn it over to Tara um, who is the single person most expert on how the city allocates its capital budget. Sorry, I didn't have the opportunity to unmute. Um, as Chair Lago said, uh, what actually gets done in the capital plans in the neighborhood process is just a sliver of what is actually in the capital plan. We hear from the agencies uh, that are informed by DCP about how particular neighborhoods are changing, uh, the demographics and where growth and density will be happening. And uh, from there, we make decisions working with the agencies in a collaborative process to fund new needs. I know, but that's, I mean, that's basically like we have a capital budget. I mean, that's kind of the answer. We know we have a capital budget that spends money all across the board. I guess my real point here is that there is uh, the, the neighborhood rezonings allow for uh, a, a, an opportunity for folks to make real investment into those areas and get a lot of investment and attention from the administration, leaving, I think, other neighborhoods out of that conversation as well. I'm just going to end it with one more question, Chair, and I apologize for taking more time, which is... Real quick, real quick. Okay. Sure. Can, can you identify... A round. We have definitely a second okay. round. I'll just end here. Can you... You've talked about some of the high growth, high transit neighborhoods. Mine is certainly part of that. Can you name other areas that you think are opportunities with high transit and high opportunities for housing that the administration, besides what's in the conversation right now, we know Gowanus, Soho, you know, can you name, talk about other areas that you feel uh, that have potential and even have potential uh, real opportunities alive right now in terms of expanding housing in the city? As you mentioned, but for a lawsuit um, we would be in the midst of the Euler process for Gowanus, um, exactly the type of high opportunity and transit rich neighborhood. Um, we are actively working with council member Chin on a rezoning of Soho and NoHo, one of the city's highest opportunity neighborhoods that crisscrossed. Thank you so much. Thank you for opportunities to be outside of those. And I'll end there. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. And, and again, I will note, as I did in my answer to Council Member Lander, that we work with council members, with communities that invite us to work with them. We know that given the resources we have, if we were to propose a rezoning in a neighborhood where a council member says, I don't want it. The tradition of council member deference suggests that that would be a futile exercise and not a good use of city taxpayer resources. And again, we thank you council member because you have been one of the council members who has recognized the extraordinary geography that you represent and its ability to produce not just housing, but since you cover the, the cities, the nation's premier central business district, the ability to provide the space for the jobs of today and tomorrow. We appreciate that. Thank you. Committee Council. Thank you. 
Next, we will hear from Council Member Reynoso, followed by Council Member Miller, before moving on to the second round, which will begin with the speaker. Council Member Reynoso, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Thank Sorry, you, Committee sorry. Council. Thank you, Sergeant Arms. Um, look, uh, Council Member Lander, Council Member Adams, Council Member Powers, all asked questions and none of them were answered. Um, I've never seen heard someone speak so much and say so little. Um, and it kind of just speaks to the mastery of the Department of City Planning's ability to just uh, you know dodge all these questions and any responsibility for planning, right? They're called the Department of City Planning and they are just so, uh, you know, they object so much to planning, it's unbelievable. And because I wanna, you know, move away from that act and that show um, of how well they dodge questions and don't answer them, I'm gonna just make a statement uh, and then maybe I'll ask a question to see how good they dodge that one. Uh, my name is Antonio Reynoso and I'm the representative of communities in Winnesburg, Bushwick and Ridgewood, neighborhoods that uh, know all too well how devastating a lack of long-term planning can be for local residents. We're having this hearing today because our land use process is fundamentally broken. New York City is grappling with major challenges related to resiliency, transportation, housing, economic development, and healthcare, and we're failing to tackle these problems head on. Furthermore, the issues are deeply rooted in systemic racism, and time and again, the city has chosen to prioritize the needs of white wealthy communities over those of black and brown neighborhoods, which is facilitated by the lack of any sort of citywide vision. Our current process can in no way be called planning. Rather, it is a piecemeal, siloed approach to encourage real estate development with no real policy priorities or values behind it beyond the production of housing units. The red hot level of controversy that surrounds nearly every land use action the city council undertakes makes it vividly clear that something isn't working. Many of you may be surprised to learn that we're already required to have a comprehensive plan and that the city has taken the position that our zoning resolution serves as that plan. I strongly encourage everyone watching right now to Google New York City zoning resolution, read through a few pages, and tell us if it looks like a plan to you. And that's further proof that this plan isn't working, DCP and private developers come to this council to amend it at a half dozen ways every two weeks. Applications for land use changes are typically initiated by private actors and are generally disconnected from any broader planning process or capital strategy. Additionally, our communities are left without any venue to voice concerns related to other planning related topic areas. Comprehensive planning offers an opportunity for the city to collect all the planning threads in one place, provide a forum for communities to proactively determine their future and ensure agencies are moving in a coordinated way. The process will be guided by principles and analysis that are currently lacking, such as addressing segregation and analyzing displacement risk. It will align capital dollars with planning initiatives and provide capital investments where needs are identified, putting an end to this extortionist practice of withholding critical projects to force marginalized communities into accepting various unwanted projects. As Councilmember Lander and I have stated, it is time to end this Rebney NIMBY doom loop. We can no longer allow our city to be held hostage by the interests of private capital or be frozen in amber by these who feel that New York should no longer accept newcomers. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion today and I'm anxious to engage with folks on how we can strengthen and improve the bill, but it doesn't seem to be the objective of the City Planning Commission today. Um, you know, so I want to ask one question. Uh, DCP recently released data that showed that four community districts out of the 59 have accounted for a third of the housing production in New York City over the past 10 years. Was this a planned outcome, Chair Lago? Thank you, Council Member. This was an outcome based on the land use process we have in place that allows member deference and allows communities that regardless of a comprehensive plan or not, do not want to see a change from their current zoning to allow their neighborhoods to, as you say, be so, frozen so in are, amber. So commissioner, that is so I'm like, sorry, chair, I, wanna, I, I have a limited amount of time. So what do you suggest we do differently? I guess that's the, the number one question that council members are asking you. You seem unsatisfied with our ability to push projects because of member deference but have done nothing to suggest an alternative. I would actually, council member with deference, suggest that this is the remit of the council. The system that we have now allows communities 
communities that are well resourced to say, no, I may have a subway station, but I don't want to change. I don't want to see a Europe application. I don't want to create the housing that will welcome newcomers. Right, but what do you suggest we do differently, Chair? I, I get what you're saying. Do you feel that you are handcuffed from an, any ability to modify the, the actions you take to, to develop housing or to zone? Um, and because of it, you're just going to live in that in that world and, and not suggest any changes, just, just abide by those rules. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me how you feel so, you know, an inability to, to actually plan and then just reject any proposals made by this council to try to, to, try to fix that problem. Um, the, I will note that we will always look for opportunities to work with council members over the long haul as we did with council members Lander and Levin, and it was but not, you're not answering an any easy questions. Slot. I, you're just, but you're secondly, just, you're just talking, it, and you're not saying anything, Chair. That's the big problem here. You, I asked you a simple question, and you just can't say it. You just you're talking about Lander. I asked you a simple question. Why have you not changed the process that seems to you know only allow for locations where members are open to development to to have a real discussion about zoning? That actually, council member, is written into the charter that the ultimate vote is with the city council. Would you change and the charter council, then? Council member, and it could easily be changed if there were not the practice of council member deference. I'll also oh, note so that that member deference is the problem. That I think that that is a challenge, but I would mention proactively the where we live process. The fact that we undertook a comprehensive look um, to affirmatively further fair housing. And I do think that the commitments that were made in there and the fact that we now have an administration in Washington that isn't fighting against fair housing gives us a very good opportunity. Um, the other thing I might note is that I think were the council to adopt a citywide lens rather than at looking exclusively to council member deference, that that could be tremendously helpful in uh, achieving our shared goal of more that equitable land we're use trying, of having communities. Is that what we're trying to do with this legislation? That's exactly what this legislation is trying to do. Um, my time is limited council member, um, and I'm waiting for the with, next round, but I'm, I'll be excited to hear member, you answer any questions that I may ask in the, in the future. Thank you. Council member and the second council member, we'll, we'll, Yes, we'll, but if I could ask to be able to respond to that, yes. which is that the proposal maintains the ability of a council member to call up any HULIP action, even if aligned with the comprehensive plan, and then it basically provides yet another veto, yet another uh, uh, impediment to the construction of the affordable housing that we need. Thank you, committee council. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from council member Miller followed by council member Borelli before moving on to the second round. Council member Miller, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Good afternoon, chairs, uh, and good afternoon, madam chair. So th there's been a lot of conversation about what this bill would do and um, in particular about uh, how it would improve what we've seen, the disparities that we've seen by virtue of COVID-19 and its impact on, in particular, communities of color, which I find a little disturbing because of the lack of input and, and, and engagement um, through past land use pro, uh, issues as, and, and policy and, and moving on here. So um, my, my first question, Madam Chair, is, is, is you testified in, in, in 2019 uh, b before the, the Charter Commission about your vision uh, uh, for, for equity and, and predictability. Um, how does this uh, uh, plan differ uh, from that? And, and uh, what, in fact, would you do to uh, have more inclusiveness to actual communities uh, uh, of color and also communities that have particular nuances that, that 
uh, rest outside of the things that the, the development and zoning that we're talking about today, but real land use issues about how we, um, you know, the Southeast Queens issues of, 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 of land use of, of our streets and, uh, and, and other issues that, that don't get addressed here. How do we speak specifically to that? Where is that voice in the plan that you had enunciated and or what you guys are currently doing now at planning, where is it allowed for uh, the voices of communities that are less interested in this type of development, but, but more mm -hmm. in preserving the continuity and the contextual fabrics of, of the communities that they represent uh, currently. And then finally, um, uh, considering this is something that has gone before the charter and referendum on uh, charter, uh, not made the referendum this cut this past time, but it has in the past. Is this something that uh, that your agency feels is within the purview and authority of the council? I know it's a lot. Thank you, council member. Both questions, and let me see. <laughs> yeah, I'll try. I'll I'll try to um, unpack them. Um, we have the flexibility in our approach to zoning that allows us to address the existential issue of the day. I'll note the fact that just yesterday, the city released its first ever food policy plan and that the need for such a plan was only heightened by the pandemic and the food insecurity that existed, but that was heightened there. And that again, fell along racial lines. And so that's one example. The other thing that I will note is that we are currently in the midst, um, pending before the Planning Commission at this point, with zoning for coastal resiliency. In preparing that rezoning, which is citywide, which affects every community district, uh, but one, we went and met with community groups, but we went beyond community groups. We worked with environmental justice groups as well, recognizing that the threat posed by coastal flooding is even more existential in communities that might not have the resources that more high opportunity neighborhoods would have. We are currently working on the city's waterfront plan. And again, here issues of environmental justice, issues of the multiple uses that we make of the waterfront are represented by a broad array of constituencies. The other thing that we're doing is focusing on data. The department has always been a factual and data-driven planning entity, but we're getting data out to the community so that they can have access to the same information on the web for so, free. I'm sorry, with, with, with all due respect. So, so because clearly Southeast Queens is 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 an a, a area that that flood mitigation has been an issue for the past 40 years, right? And and that has yeah. to be data driven, but it took forever to get that addressed. Those are specific nuances. But then we also have, you know, our, our transportation system is we live in a transportation desert. We, we, you, you, you're forced to drive. Time expired. But but also at at, at the same time. Um, we have an antiquated, our streets are antiquated. They have not been, you know, we, we, our buses run on trolley lines, but our streets are also designed for, you know, uh, single family homes with two car garages. And now we have basement dwellings, we have dormers, we're, we're, we're totally overpopulated and, and, and two cars can't get down the street at the same time. Uh, Council Member Adams and myself introduced legislation five years ago uh, to address uh, one-way streets to mitigate this. And we were told by DOT that you don't have to do legislation, just tell us what you want and we'll do it. Well, five years later, not a single street has been reversed. And, and, and how does this translate into agencies? And how do we make sure that we this work is really getting work, the nuanced work that really impact folks outside of Manhattan and 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 de developing and gentrifying communities that seem to be leading the conversation 
here today. How, just how does the everyday New Yorkers in, in, in Southeast Queens and, and, and the Bronx and, and Staten Island, uh, how, how does this impact us and where's our voice in this? Thank you for the question and in particular for mentioning the flooding risk in Southeast Queens. Um, at the same time that we are going through ULERP for the Zoning for Coastal Resiliency, we are also looking at neighborhoods that have particularly high flood risk, where Mother Nature is indicating um, that there's, she's got a special eye on them. And as you may know, council member, we are at the same time putting forward proposals to sharply curtail development in the floodplain in neighborhoods like Old Howard Beach. And so thank you for putting a focus on the fact that a proposal like zoning for coastal resiliency is not a one size fits all. It is very attuned to the different characters of flood prone neighborhoods like the financial district versus Howard Beach. The same approach doesn't work for them, but we have addressed the full range of them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, council member, committee chair, uh, council chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, next, we'll hear from Council Member Borelli, followed by Council Member Kredenchik. Council Member Borelli, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Thank you. Um, I, I do believe in member deference because I think, unlike the members of the commission, um, I and my colleagues have been elected by the people of the city of New York uh, to make decisions on their behalf. Uh, that's why I just want to ask briefly about the reforms to the South Richmond Special Zoning District. Um, I, I think I've made it clear since the last go around uh, of this proposal that I have absolutely no interest in, in seeing these changes even happen. And I'm wondering why, uh, as an agency, knowing that this is not going to happen, would you be still spending time and money on, on staff hours doing this? If I could ask Anita Laramont to address this. Apologies, it took a moment to unmute. Um, the, the work that we have done in Staten Island on the Special Natural Areas District was work that we actually really did believe would be very helpful in facilitating our ability to do robust planning for the borough of Staten Island because it would free us from the very specific site planning work that we, we do in the main in Staten Island. Um, I, I will say that we have been through a process of several years where in fact your staff has been present and we believed up until we heard from you recently that there was a path to getting this done. Uh, we still think the work is valuable and because we have done so much of it, we believe that it is appropriate for us to at least get through the environmental review process so that if there is a more appropriate time following additional conversation with, with people in Staten Island like you and other stakeholders that we can reintroduce this work that we will not have to start over from square one for it. But we really very much would welcome continuing the conversations on, on these, these topics. Sure, thank you. Um, just while we're doing that work, there are other projects in my district that have been languishing and I hear from developers um, that you know, these are people that have come to the community board, come to me as the council member, and have made projects that are amenable, made projects that are amenable to my community that are just waiting for motions from your office. And, I, and I'll point out one example. Um, on Page Avenue, there was a subdivision application. It took five years. The, the applicant had to go through the process of, of, of drawing their, their, their configurations and their layouts and surveys and all that stuff. They were approved for the subdivision. Now they're coming back to develop it and suddenly city planning is telling them that everything that they were just approved on per the subdivision is not acceptable for their application. It, it's just, it just seems to me that like we, as an agency, we're, we're doing everything we can when there's city council and community board acceptance of, of, of the concept of a project to stop people from actually developing the property. Council if, I might council, if I might council member, um, it is, what drove the proposal to revise the special natural areas district is 
very much a desire to take advantage of 40 years of advances in environmental science to make it so much easier for homeowners to install a pool, to expand a deck, to relocate a driveway, to add an extra kitchen. That wasn't um, the purpose. But no, at, uh, the apologies. A permeable surface they could use from their backyard. I mean, that, that's why there was so much public outcry against the initial uh, city planning proposal was because people wouldn't be able to put a deck or pavers or patios or whatever um, on their property. And, and council member, we heard that and markedly revised it. Our desire is to be able to get the planning commission out of the business of having to do this detailed site plan review for things like the kitchen addition that do not have measurable environmental impacts and instead focus on the larger sites of an acre or more. And that would free up resources for the kind of long-term planning. With respect to the particular project that you mentioned, Anita, could I toss it over to you? Yes. Yes. I, I don't know the particulars of it, and, and we will get back to you. What I will say, though, is that it does take a long time to advance these projects because the text under which they get approved are the special natural area and South Richmond text, which are very detailed in terms of what needs to be provided. And it's a very iterative process. It takes a long time to get a complete application. But I will look into that. Um, but just to be specific, the, the applicant went for a subdivision. They were approved for a two-story strip mall. Then they subdivided the property. I'm expired. We submitted the same exact plan that was just approved by city planning and the city council, et cetera. And now they were told that the city planning commission would like them to put a town center or change the, the footprints. Now they're looking at residential houses. It's just, it's kind of, you know, counterproductive to make someone go through a five-year process when at the end of it, you're just going to say, well, that was great, but now start from scratch, get your surveys done again. I know you won't be able to have the specific answer now, and I'll leave it at that, and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Committee Council? Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Councilmember Gradenchik. Councilmember, please begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin. Thank you, uh, Chair Cabrera. Uh, Chair Lago, it's nice to see you. We don't get to meet too often because actually today was the first day that I had any kind of zoning change approved after over five years in the council, uh, mostly because the, the plans that have come forth um, from private individuals are so outrageous um, that I reject them out of hand uh, to save everybody's time. Where we, one example was a a single family home where they wanted to change the zoning from R2 to R6 to allow for the construction of an eight story building. At least that was on Hillside Avenue. But I am one of, uh, I think only two council members that doesn't have a subway, Long Island Railroad, Staten Island Railroad or Metro North stop in their district. So our, our mass transit is uh, quite limited. Um, I just, I, I, I wanna ask you, um, question, the disparities that um, some have talked about today, these are not recent phenomenon. They're, there's things that have taken place, in my opinion, I've, I started in government in the late 80s, over decades. Would you agree with that, Chair? I would say that the disparities go back even later than the late 80s, Council Member. Like you, I actually started my first stint at the Department of City Planning in 1983, um, I was a special assistant to the then chair, Herb Sturz. Okay. But I Noomo. think that I, yeah, and uh, I just, we can't help but smile when you mention Herb Sturz's name. Um, I would argue that the inequities and disparities are evident throughout our society and go back far beyond the early 80s. And so I do think that we need to look for systemic solutions that extend so far beyond just zoning. From your purview, from your perch as um, city planning chair, very important job in our city. Um, I know that um, I've had discussions with just about every one of my colleagues about uh, the capital process and how things uh, unfold or don't unfold in the city and how it can, and there have been improvements and I, I wanna compliment um, especially Commissioner Silver at Parks. And um, I know that Lorraine Grillo, who's the outgoing uh, commissioner at DDC have worked on this, but it still takes seemingly forever. You can talk to 
Karen Kosowitz about her Rego Park Library that's been decades and decades and still um, has a target date of 2024. How much of the city's inability to move capital projects forward, um, how much has that hurt us and made for inequities in our system? If I could toss the issue of the capital budget over to you, Tara. Tara, did you catch that toss? <laughs> I'm not a very good pitcher, That's but I suspect right. that has more to do with the um, unmuting her. Tara, my time's running. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was waiting to, to get okay. the unmute function. Um, I can tell you that OMB has made great efforts to try to streamline the process and we've brought in a new unit to try to uh, expedite the, the approvals, uh, but from here I will turn it over to Paul. Where's Paul? Paul Vaughn. Nice to see you, uh, Council Member. Good to see Good you. To see you. Worked with you extensively uh, under Borough President Shulman back in the day. Back in the day, God rest his soul. Great yes, lady. Yes. Um, we've we've made we've made significant strides in streamlining streamlining the process. You know, obviously, uh, you know, there was great concern in the uh, in in delivering capital commitments. You know, uh, and uh, you know, we've introduced uh, different units, which I think scoping was always the biggest problem. And I know that DDC has, has uh, you know, they, they introduced the unit, you know, several years ago where, you know, they're, uh, you know, they're looking at the scope of work and I think they're doing a better job than some of the budget agencies. As you know, DDC is a managing agency. So they oversee, you know, uh, the construction of like libraries and cultural institutions and, and things of that nature. So the budget agencies, uh, you know, where we would put up a project in the budget and it was it was more like aspirational i think that the introduction of, of ddc along with some other scoping units i know within tara's unit uh you know they've, they've expanded you know an omb role in that as well uh time has expired we've been working we've been working uh again i mentioned earlier with the uh, subcommittee on the capital budget and improving and streamlining ways to deliver projects one of the biggest things we've done recently over the last several years, actually, is uh, the review of certificates to proceed the CP times that was always concerning, and uh, you know we've gotten our CP day, uh, our CP approval days from uh, a record, if I can recall off the top of my head, of over 65 days down into somewhere in the 30s, you know. So just about a little over a month is the average average approval day now, you know, for a certificate to proceed. This definitely. Uh, uh, advances the projects a lot quicker and, and it streamlines the approval process. All right, thank you. I, I see my time's expired. I, 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 uh, I may come back, Chair Cabrera, for a second round, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I do want to state on the record that I am in favor of member deference. I was elected to, uh, to carry out the wishes of my constituents to the best of my ability, so I appreciate that. Fully agree. With that uh, committee council, we're ready for the second round. Starting with the speaker, correct? Yeah, that's right, Chair. We'll now move on to the second round of questioning. We'll begin with the speaker, followed by the committee chairs. Uh, if any council members would like to ask a second round of questioning, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Speaker Johnson, please begin. Thank you. Let me just turn my camera on. So I do have a, a few more questions. I'll try to get through them uh, quickly um, before uh, we, we move on. Um, uh, Chair, I had some questions <clears throat> related to uh, some of the uh, right now, some neighborhoods are covered uh, by customized contextual and special districts, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and, you know, you, you talked about uh, the GEIS earlier, uh, and I think that's a particularly important part of this. You were worried about the cost. 
a generic environmental impact statement uh, is I think really key to incentivizing smart cost-effective development. Are you familiar with the state's mandate to complete a GEIS for comprehensive plans in other small cities? Yes, very much so, Council Mayor. Uh, speaker, I'm sorry. Um, and, we and given, are... given, that, given that most uh, other cities in the state are completing a GEIS, I understand we're larger, but why can't we do that here? I would note, Speaker, that unlike the other cities in the state, the state law does not allow New York City, were it to do such a massive GEIS, to then avoid on a project by project basis going through Euler. I would note that if we were to look at the community district um, that has the smallest population, that's Manhattan CD1. There are only six cities in the entirety of New York State that have a population as large as CD1, our smallest. And CD1 contains the US's third largest central business district. There is a level of complexity in preparing a GEIS citywide for New York that is nowhere near what any other city would go through. And then again, the state law doesn't provide the subsequent pass on having to comply with CICRA uh, that's with an S, the state review environmental review process for any other application as it makes its way through ULOP. Your Well, your own technical manual uh, on environmental review suggests completing a GEIS for comprehensive plans. I can read you the section if you like. Uh, why is that in there if you're opposed to doing a GEIS? And, and I'll just quickly read, and, and you just mentioned it, the, the CICRA technical manual says that, quote, concept, comprehensive planning programs, new development programs, promulgation of new regulations, and revisions to such broadly applicable actions may be candidates for a GEIS. They've been done with the Governor's Island redevelopment, the Solid Waste Management Plan, and Hudson Yards. Um, before tossing it over to both Anita Laramont and Susan Amron, I will note that the scale of both Governor's Island and Hudson Yards neither encompasses an entire community district, let alone all 59. But with that, Anita, I'll turn it over to you first. Yes, <clears throat> yes, um, Speaker, I'd be happy to comment further on this. Uh, Marisa is precisely right that really the challenge here is the scale of the generic environmental impact statement that we would need to do here. You are correct in referencing the um, <clears throat> secret technical manual in this regard, but the, 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 the times when this has been done has been really with respect to a single individual project such as Hudson Yards. Although it may have been a large area in terms of it was 89 blocks in the seven train, it still was one project. It wasn't a citywide comprehensive plan with several alternatives for each community district. It's that part of it that makes this really challenging because even if you did the generic impact statement as you, you would propose here, when the time came to implement actual projects, it would very likely not be that the specific project that is done comports in all material terms with what had been studied, which would mean that you would need to do additional analyses. Or it would mean that you would need to at least argue over whether additional analyses are necessary because this actually concerns us in that it also gives people a new avenue to bring litigation challenges with respect to whether or not a new environmental impact statement needs to be done. And then of course, there's the cost of this, which is astronomical as we talked about, but would not actually offset the need to do the further analyses when a particular project was done. Yeah, I think we disagree with some of the underlying assumptions on the cost and on some of the other things you said. 
uh, but I appreciate you answering the question, uh, Anita. Uh, I wanna go back to, to the chair. Uh, chair Largo, uh, you agreed that there needs to be a conversation about how the city can more effectively plan proactively to tackle citywide challenges, but that the Charter Vision Commission wasn't the right place to have that conversation. And then you said uh, now today that the council's legislative process is not the right place to have the conversation. So where exactly do you expect uh, to have this conversation if not through uh, two of the primary ways in the city uh, to discuss city uh, to discuss setting uh, uh, the city's policies. If the city can do this uh, on their own without legislation or charter revision, then why hasn't it been done already? Thank you for the question, Speaker. I'll note that there was extensive consideration of um, approaches to comprehensive planning during the recent Charter Revision Commission. And the proposals were at times in conflict with each other because of the varying folks views about what constituted comprehensive planning and um, in particular, whether it should be bottom up or top down. And the result was that the council's Charter Revision Commission determined not to advance the proposals. Um, now, oh, and I'm sorry, I should note that one of the proposals that was pending before the Charter Revision Commission bore significant similarities to the proposal, um, to the proposal that is before us now. The last time that there was a very significant revision to land use by a Charter Revision Commission, it was preceded by years of substantive analysis and outreach to a broad array of stakeholders, which allowed the Charter Revision Commission to be able to coalesce upon the revisions that were put in place and that define the current process that we have, including its allocation of responsibilities among the various participants in the land use process. My question was, my question was, if, if you didn't, if you don't think that it was right and the Charter Revision Commission, as you said, didn't take it up and you don't think it's right for us to be uh, uh, moving forward with legislation around a comprehensive plan or comprehensive planning, where do you think this conversation should take place? I think that there could be a very healthy conversation with members of the council, with other stakeholders who will have widely varying views and with the city agencies that are involved in planning, but not in the context of a particular bill that we think has significant flaws. I wanna get into the coordination piece a little bit more. To me, that's one of the root problems here. There are just way too many silos, way too much that's already being done without us really getting a lot out of it. I know it's a challenge with a city, our city that's this large, but I don't think we can just accept the status quo here. First, I wanna note that it's kind of indicative of this problem that uh, we don't have anyone from the deputy mayor's office here for uh, economic development uh, and for planning. We've also got one agency and two mayoral offices speaking to three different respectives and sets of issues. Can someone here tell me how the administration currently coordinates across agencies when it comes to the various planning related reports published by the administration? Certainly, and I would not take from the fact that no one from the deputy mayor's office is signed up as a participant, that there has been non-involvement, far, far from it. Um, we have worked extensively with both deputy mayor Bean herself and her expert staff. Um, we at city planning work on a daily basis with the long litany of agencies that you had mentioned in your earlier questioning speaker. I'll note something um, as, um, I'll note the plan that was just released yesterday that we are particularly pleased to see out there, the food policy plan. Um, one could step back and say, what does food policy have to do with land use planning? In fact, shortly after the appointment of the food czar, she reached out 
to city planning, knowing of our analytical capabilities and of our data mapping capabilities and asked if we could second to her one of our planners, which we gladly, gladly did, and were able to be active participants in one, understanding the food supply and the food distribution network of the city, uh, something that at the outbreak of the pandemic, we didn't have nearly um, the insight into that we do now. And we were proud to continue to be part of the development of the food policy plan. Um, it's a connection that I would guess that many people wouldn't immediately say, oh, food and city planning. And I just use that as an example of the breadth of our engagement with other agencies. And again, this isn't an after the fact, this is an everyday occurrence. Okay, I mean, I of course appreciate the report that was released and uh, you know, the council had been pushing on those issues for years, uh, asking the administration to uh, make movement on food policy and coordination and planning for a long time. I released a report more than two years ago, which laid out some of the ways that we thought we needed to move forward. So I'm happy to see that that is coming uh, out. But I think the, the, the question here is that when we're talking about land use, it feels uh, like so often things are disjointed and that agencies are not speaking to one another in a coordinated way. You heard earlier from Chair Salamanca uh, on the issues related to you know, statement of district needs that community boards put out asking for capital investment and capital investment outside of a rezoning process, capital investment that looks at long-term planning. And I think the experience that I would say nearly every single council member has is that uh, you only really have the ability to try to secure large dollars for your district if there's a rezoning going on. Otherwise, it's very, very hard. And so I think that is what you're hearing today, that people don't feel like there is significant coordination that is going on and uh, on, on looking at these issues. If I might, Speaker, the attention clearly is paid to the rezonings and the ability that to make investments in neighborhoods that historically haven't received the um, an equitable share of investment. But the percentage of the capital budget that is associated with the rezonings is a small part. I would toss it over to Tara to help to mention the fact that while we're proud of the investments in the capital investments in the rezone neighborhoods, that's not where the majority of our capital budget goes. Well, before we go over to Tara, I mean, Tara can answer this question. Uh, you know, let me ask you first and then I'll get into something for Tara. How does the one NYC plan inform or relate to DCP's strategic objectives? Does DCP work in coordination with the mayor's office of long-term planning and sustainability to write those objectives? And, and how do those objectives relate to the city's budget? Well, I'm glad to turn it over to Dan, and thank you for that question, Speaker. Um, city planning is actively involved in working with every update of the 1NYC. Um, again, we view that as a powerful citywide strategic planning tool. So, Dan, if, actually, Tara, I believe, is now unmuted, and so if we could go to her and then to Dan. Uh, sure. Um, thank you, Speaker. As you know, as you said in, in your question, it is a complex city, but as we're evaluating new needs, uh, we're looking at them through multiple lenses. Some of the things that we're looking at are issues such as equ equity, resiliency, affordability, and ultimately it goes through the budget process um, and, and comes to you for adoption. The Neighborhood Development Fund uh, was a total of a billion dollars between EDC and DEP, and that is but a sliver of the entire capital, uh, the 10-year capital plan. The other thing that I might note before um, Dan speaks is that community board budget requests are uh, not just a public record, they're available on the OMB website and also on DCP's website through the community district portal. Yeah. And so this is part of our efforts to chair, chair. not only- I, I, I know, and I, before I was elected to the council, I was chair of Manhattan Community Board 4. 
And I can tell you that many community boards, as you know, out of the 59 boards spend a lot of time putting that statement of district every year. And they feel like it's basically ignored by the agencies. And the only ones that can come forward and fund the asks are the local council members. So I don't believe that, you know, that people feel like that when they work on this charter mandated document, that there is a real attention and gravity given to it. And that instead, feels pro forma for many people. And that's why I'm talking about seemingly a lack of coordination or maybe a lack of uh, putting weight on a, a serious document that's put forward for 59 community districts across the city. Ken, would you want to um, follow up? Yeah, maybe I'll just answer a question about minutes ago, but the, you know, the value that we can since the release of time that there are numerous other things that, of course, are getting into more detail. Dan, Dan, you're a little muffled. It's hard to hear you. Sorry. And, uh, hopefully, it's a little better. But um, you know, as since the one NYC process was um, completed in 2019 and that plan was released, um, what we've been doing is working with agencies on a new number of different areas to ensure strategic alignment. Um, and we come in in different ways and different parts of processes to make sure that, you know, it's clear that the things that, we're, that we need to do and we laid out in 1NYC to confront our climate crisis, to address the city's health and wealth and equity, strengthen our democracy, like the, really the core visions are finding ways to carry through. And the food policy study is an example of that. The environmental justice work, of course, is, is an example of that. The waterfront plan, there's, there's lots of different ways that we work to ensure the strategic alignment um, with the goals of 1NYC and the priorities of, that the mayor and the advisory board for 1NYC have, uh, have helped us lay out. But my question was, does the 1NYC plan inform or relate to the Department of City Planning strategic objectives? Absolutely, council okay. member. Um, and, and, and then does, the, does DCP work in coordination with the mayor's office of long-term planning and sustainability to write those objectives? Yes, not only do our strategic objectives in harmony with one NYC, we work closely with the mayor's office on creating the plan and informing its strategic priorities. And how do those objectives relate to the city's budget? We, John, do you want to turn and describe what we do with the city's capital budget agencies through our capital planning forum? Let, let me just, let me, let me give an example. The, the compilation of the 10 year capital strategy has two sections, a front section, which details policies and goals, and a second section, which lists funding by agency. How do these two sections connect to one another? Who drafts each section? And, and how do the funding levels cited carry out the goals? I mean, we at the council can't really figure this out. Uh, it seems like there's a, it's a bit disjointed and there's no rhyme or reason and that these things don't align with each other. I mean, I think that's one of the problems here. You have all of these, in many instances, good public documents, and it doesn't feel like there's a real level of coordination. I'll gladly toss this over both to John and to Tara. Yeah, let me start a little bit, and then uh, I'll pass to Tara and, and, and Paul, who then comment a bit more. Um, firstly, the, the one NYC plot process does feed directly into the tenor capital strategy, as we've talked about. The, the thoughts of the priorities that come through there are also manifested in the narrative that you'll see up front and how we think about the strategy for the 10-year budget. So these are, you know, again, parties that we talk often about, how these things should interconnect. The second part of it, how does the front end of the strategy connect to some of the detailed budget pages in the back, is harder to see a linear line between just because there's so many budgetary decisions that are involved in producing those allocations for the next 10 years. We do try to lay out clearly with all the capital agencies, what are the principles and objectives of the administration that should be carried through their budgetary choices. And then along the way, they continue to discuss those with OMB as you have to whittle down to what can actually be afforded in a given year. Um, let, me, let me pass it over to Tara or Paul to talk a bit about how they get that list narrowed down. And again, it, it's cascading from this discussion about objectives at the very high level with the agencies on a regular discussion we have with them. Uh, thank you. I'm actually turning it over to Paul. Tika, thank you for your question. Um, as you can tell over the last several releases of the strategy, uh, we've actually introduced, uh, you know, more and more data 
uh, thank you to city planning for, you know, uh, putting together a lot of the uh, guidelines that we use. Uh, and, you know, we show examples uh, in that the relationship to the, uh, to the back of the book is that, you know, our priorities that are mentioned in the front and our guiding principles relate to the decisions that were made. And, you know, the, the, uh, the agency section of the book is more budgetary in nature. Um, you know, we are, uh, you know, for the uh, strategy that's going to be released in April, we are going to begin to make more of a connection between the front of the book and the back of the book. So I think you'll be uh, happy to see that. Uh, you know, obviously it's a big undertaking. And, you know, as we can do it more and more, we will, we will advance it. But we're going to, you know, cite more examples in the, uh, in the agency narratives you know, to connect to, you know, more to the guiding principles in the front of the document. Okay, thank you. I'm going to finish up here. Um, I know there's a lot of folks that are waiting to testify. Uh, Chair Lago, do you see any value in integrating the scattered disparate planning and reporting mandates that we have now? Thank you for highlighting that speaker. I do believe that we have a number of different reporting requirements that have been accretive over the years and that there is a very healthy exercise, I think, and discussion to be had with the members of the council and stakeholders about which of the reporting requirements um, make sense, which are reports that are done because they're required to be, but don't add value. I also, the other reason that I think that that is such a useful suggestion is that over during this administration, we have so markedly enhanced our, the information that we make available publicly, uh, whether through the population fa fact finder, the community district portal, and that a stepping back, taking stock of the reports that are produced and figuring out which ones are adding value to the council members and to the communities, and then coming up with a robust reporting regime, but one that will be useful to the council, one where council members will be waiting to get it each year. And of course, that will be useful to members of the public as well. And do you think we have any work to do when it comes to improving how we coordinate planning policy with the capital budget? I think that there can always be improvements. I'm, a, I'm an optimist. Um, I'm in government because I'm a believer in always looking at what's been done and saying, what can we do better? better? So I would welcome working with you and the council on that. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it back to Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I just got a couple of quick questions, uh, Chair. Uh, wanted to know how does the city ensure its budget planning decisions advance racial, social, and economic equity in New York City? Thank you. I think that that is the challenge that we face. We um, are a nation that has not confronted the issue of racial equity. And I think we always need to be looking for more tools to address what has been done in the past and not to perpetuate it going forward. I am so pleased that we have now partners in Washington um, that share this. And I do think that we have a tool for doing it, uh, a powerful tool, which is where we live. Um, the Where We Live New York City document grew out of um, a requirement from HUD during the Obama administration that all municipalities look at how they were affirmatively furthering fair housing. Um, that requirement was stripped away by the Trump administration. Nonetheless, the city determined that it would proceed. And this was an initiative driven principally by HPD, but with city planning as a partner and active participant and contributor, absolutely every step of the way. And we are now at the point of implementation and the implementing where we live, which has, has assignments for not just for HPD, but for city planning as well. That is one of the major things that we want to accomplish during the time remaining in this administration. So thank you for highlighting that. 
So, so alongside with that question, have you done an analysis? You, you were all talking about uh, the capital investments that you have made that outside of the rezoning, you made more capital investments outside of rezoning the rezoning if I understood right. Um, and in light of that, have you done an analysis of where this funding is, this capital funding is going to? And it, it, for example, what percentage has come to the Bronx? Uh, what percentage has come to black and brown communities? Have you done an in-house self-analysis of that? Tara, if I could ask you, since you're the keeper of the capital budget. Thank you for the question. We, we can probably get back to you on uh, different ways of cutting the data, including uh, by neighborhood. Um, if, if that's what you're requesting. And if you if you want to slice it in a different way, if you share that information, we can see if that's something that we can turn around. Yes, but, and thank you for that. I'd like to see it. I, I you know, sometimes we, uh, we hear, oh, we're gonna get you information and we never get it. I really, this is one bit of information that I would love to get into our hands. Do you, do you have a sense overall, uh, at least by borrow, uh, of where this capital is ending up at, because that is something that you actually do have control. Regardless of what Washington DC does, we do. You have control. You have the power to decide where is this money going to end up at. Do you have anything in front of you, at least by borrow? Paul, Paul, do you have the, that data in front of you, or do we have to come back? No, sorry, Councilman, but we don't have that uh, that data available to you know in front of me right now. But we can get that to you. We can follow up and get that to you. Yeah, if you could get it before the hearing is over, you can, someone could come in, let us know you're in. We're gonna be here for at least a couple of hours. I see at least three hours. We have a lot of people waiting, so that that would imagine it'd be plenty of time. Because honestly, that will tell me uh, at least it's one of the indicators that there is an intentional plan here to address inequities uh, by boroughs. And when I think about the Bronx where I live, uh, where I represent, and there's been so many inequities all through, for so many years, I'd be very curious mm -hmm. as to what those numbers will look like. And if you could break it down uh, by years, uh, and uh, at least for as long as this administration has been in, I appreciate it. My last question is, building resiliencies uh, for climate change uh, demands a variety of strategies. As you know, policy change, incentives, regulation, physical investments, and the sort. Do you agree that addressing uh, these needs will require the coordination of these strategies and individual efforts, individual agency effort, and how does the city intend to achieve that coordination under the current planning uh, framework, and how would that be superior uh, to what is being proposed here today, if, if it is superior at all, or if it's in part or inferior? Thank you so much, council member. The council is, I anticipate, very soon going to be receiving zoning for coastal resiliency. This is um, an attempt to take the lessons that we've learned under the emergency zoning that was put in place after Superstorm Sandy. We've lived with it for a while and we've learned a lot. As I mentioned, we sent this out to every community board in the city. Um, we went to every community board in the city and have gotten such useful feedback about what the needs are, which vary because our coastline varies so widely across the city, uh, from a working waterfront to a recreational waterfront to a hard edge among um, around many sections of the city, including the financial district. And I believe that this is going to be a very important first step and we're looking forward to the input from the council once this again citywide uh, resiliency measure 
is comes before you in the coming months. Thank you. And let me just close before I give it, uh, pass it on to Council uh, Chair uh, Salamanca, uh, is that one of the indicators to me that we are very serious about the community boards is to not slash these 8,000 plus dollars. Let me just say, the speaker, and I want to give credit to the speaker, when I came and approached them about funding, $42,500, we did that for two years in a row. Last year, we could have. But then on top of that, there was 3000 something dollars that was cut. Now you cut another 8000 we, We're looking at a huge percentage of funding that is being cut out of the community boards when they're doing more. Uh, and one of the indicators to me, uh, one of the signals that would show me that we're serious about the community board is that, that we will restore this minute amount of money uh, in the overall budget spectrum, but it means so much to those community boards. And so with that, I want to uh, uh, pass it on uh, to one of our co-chairs, Chair uh, Rafael Salamanca Jr. Thank you, uh, uh, Council Member. I'm having a, a trouble with my video. So very quickly, just my, my last question, and, and I want to reiterate this issue with community boards. The question is to OMB. OMB, why have why are you um, have asked um, community boards to do a mod and uh, you have proposed a cut to their budget for this fiscal year? I, I have to, we have to come back to you with the particulars with community boards. Uh, what I can tell you is in the last few budget cycles, all agencies have had to take budget cuts, um, you know, against the expense budget, largely because of uh, a function of where we were in the financial plan and uh, we were facing significant budget constraints largely due to the pandemic. Um, but I can speak to the team that oversees community boards and get the particulars of that situation. I'm sorry, I cannot accept that answer. That's something that you, you need to find out right now. That's unacceptable. Um, you're here at this hearing. This hearing is about comprehensive plan. Community boards play a big role here. And you know, we're talking about budget cuts that affect the planning of the city of New York as to what relates to comprehensive planning. So again, I'm gonna ask that you please get that information and get back to us before this hearing is done. I, we can attempt to get that information. I can tell you that the budget director is going to be testifying in front of you next week, and we'll be prepared to speak to cuts to the any cuts to the community boards as well as any other agencies as well. You do understand that community boards have the smallest budget out of all city agencies in the city of New York, and the cuts that you make to a small budget like that has a significant um, effect on their overall operation. Um, with that, thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to ask my question. Thank you, and thank you for caring for community boards, uh, joining the chorus of concern that we have here. That we, We're just sharing with you the level of nervousness these community boards are feeling right now. So um, I, as you can tell, this will come up in the hearings. Uh, and uh, because really, I mean, <laughs> I just don't see how we expect them to operate. And if, especially when they go to rezonings and, and so forth with such a little budget. And, and in light of the fact that they haven't received any salaries uh, increases in years in years. Uh, and we're gonna lose good staff now because it's either that or you know salaries, just to maintain the salaries or the rent and so forth. And so I appreciate that uh, chair. Um, uh, and with that, uh, Chair, Chair Rosenthal, I don't know if she has any questions. And if not, we'll, we'll go for the second round with council members. Okay, we could come back. Uh, committee council. Thank you, Chair. Next, we will hear from council member Rivera, followed by council member Reynoso. Council Member Rivera, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin. Hi there, thank you so much. Uh, I wanna thank uh, the committee. I wanna thank the speaker for introducing this bill for clarifying the realities of community board input in this proposal. Since there is misrepresentation of this by DCP and apparent confusion on this point from many in our communities. I'd also like to thank the diverse affordable 
uh, housing and community groups that are in the thriving communities coalition for pushing this body to finally move on this important legislation. It's really sad based on the hearing today that the administration is more interested in maintaining a tooth and nail lot by lot zoning approach that seems to benefit developers and furthers inequity. And that deeply concerns me. I'm a former community board member as well. I spent many years on community board three. I worked on our board's attempts to implement the closest thing we have to comprehensive planning today, a 197A plan. Between those experiences, which was a conversation that started almost 10 years ago, and from my time on the council, it's clear that our current land use process of one-off rezonings with no long-term vision remains irredeemably broken. We don't give our community boards the funding they need, as you've heard, to effectively execute their land use responsibilities. And our neighborhoods continue to price out far too many hardworking New Yorkers and small businesses. I believe this legislation combined with the right investments in our city could be a vehicle to make the change we need, but we obviously have a lot of work to do on this bill. And I will be listening to the feedback from today and pushing to improve the legislation as it moves through the process. My question. My question is how does DCP work today to gather input from communities to inform its decision-making when it comes to changes to the zoning code? And is any of the collaborative work done outside of the individual ULERPs for each rezoning? And do you as an agency respect community boards 197A plans? So it's three questions and I'm happy to repeat them as you answer them. Thank you so much. Thank you, council member. Um, first, I would want to address what I believe is a disagreement with respect to what the bill provides. The legislation as we read it proposes that a draft plan containing three scenarios for each community board be presented and that the community board identify the preferred plan among them. This preferred plan goes to the council, which then adopts a land use scenario for each community district. And the council has the ability to make modifications to the community board's preferred plan. Um, the community boards have the ability to amend the scenarios that are presented in the draft plan. But what we have found is that frequently, it is those community boards in neighborhoods that are opportunity neighborhoods that have the resources to be able to engage actively. And generally, um, the, the, the direction that it takes is, does not tend in the direction of equity of saying, we want more affordable housing. We recognize the need of every community district to accept facilities that might not be locally desired, but are necessary from a citywide perspective. To your next question, and I'll, I'll see if I can remember all three, of how it is that we work with communities. We work with communities extensively. It is the community boards and community organizations that are a lifeblood of information for the department and ultimately the planning commission. But, but specifically, I, I'm so sorry, Commissioner, I, I just want to say specifically to inform your decision making when it comes to changes to the zoning code. Yeah, sorry, uh, it, that's exactly where I'm headed. Um, in particular, I think there's such a good example um, in your neck of the woods or a portion of your neck of the woods um, with the Soho NoHo initiative. This grew out of extensive conversations with the community, um, a process that was sponsored by the council member, the borough president, and myself, um, and called, um, entitled Envision Soho NoHo. There, was, there were so many community meetings, and what became evident is what we see in neighborhoods throughout the city, that frequently there are different constituencies. There are longtime residents. There are residents who have moved there more frequently. There are there is the business Time community, and we now are at the point of continuing, even after after the conclusion and the issuance of the Envision Soho NoHo report, 
to continue public outreach meetings. Um, we've had one in the past few weeks because of the number of issues, these outreach meetings focus on topic matters, housing, um, small business, the arts community. And so this is how we are informed. With respect to the role of the community board um, in particular matters that come before the commission, um, anyone who listens in on our hearings, which is so much easier on the planning commission hearings, which is so much easier now that we're able to do them virtually, will see that the commissioners in their questionings, in their questioning, um, look for answers from the applicants about the issues that have been raised by the community board and by the borough president. So again, this is, it's hard to overstate the importance that we place on this other branch of government um, that provides us information on our land use applications. And, and I hear your example. I would just say a couple of things. One is your comments almost, I, I feel like they're almost saying that the bill provides too much community input. That's how I'm kind of taking your comments. But to the Soho NoHo Envision plan, or I guess the task force, which is the one example that you're bringing up of, of where you go to for input outside of the official EULA process, many would say that the Soho NoHo proposal actually doesn't include the visioning input and that it strays far from what was discussed or what was actually come to an agreement within that committee and within the, that, that all of those meetings. So I don't think it's the best example. And the last thing I'll say is, because I ran out of time and I wanna thank the chairs for being so gracious, is that with the 197A, I asked whether you respect those plans coming out of community boards. I brought up a almost 10 year old conversation that, that where the community board sponsored town halls and various discussions and brought, us, brought in numerous stakeholders. And so I'm just curious as to why DCP hasn't been more collegial or collaborative on that plan. Um, just generally, I would say that uh, if you could just answer at least to why maybe you haven't quite met Community Board 3 Manhattan at least halfway on, on that plan when it seems to be very popular within the community itself. And I'll just, I'll just leave the comment on Envision, uh, Soho Noho, literally started to precipitate a rezoning process. And I think community should have a regular occurring opportunity to comment. Um, the Euler process doesn't seem to be enough right now based on, on all the feedback and recommendations we get. So we'll leave that there. And if you could just, you know, come back to um, whether you would consider a 197A plan from a community board, I would really appreciate it. And thanks again for your time. Thank you, council member. And I do, I think that your comments on Soho Noho point out the fact that understandably communities rarely speak with one voice. And um, frequently communities and community boards reflect that particular community and don't get at broader issues of equity and the need to address citywide concerns. We know that in Soho Noho, some of the wealthiest districts in the city are not producing housing and affordable housing, even though it is a neighborhood that is so transit rich. And so part of driving towards more equitable planning is looking for these opportunities. The approach that we are taking in Soho Noho is entirely consistent with where we live and this focus on addressing historical and existing inequities. Um, turning to a 197A plan, you council member clearly understand the time and energy that a 197A planning process requires. And I have to note that it stands in such stark contrast to the bill that is before us where the city's resources would be consumed by devising 177 top-down planning scenarios. Thank you so much. Committee Council. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Reynoso, followed by Council Member Adams. Council Member Reynoso, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. The time will begin. Chair, I wanted to like talk about a specific scenario here, the Bushwick rezoning, a rezoning in which the City Planning Commission sits with the community for almost 
five years to go through a comprehensive plan of exactly what a neighborhood rezoning could look like. The community supports this project. The community board, local organizations, and all the elected officials buy into pushing this plan for five years with the city planning commission on board. You join almost every single meeting that is put, well, the city planning commission um, put, joins every single me meeting in, in, that we have in Bushwick. Uh, the members are removed from any voting decisions. So that means the council members have no voting rights in this uh, community-based planning effort that we're trying to put together. After six years, the community identifies five corridors in which they see an opportunity for upzoning up to a R7A on Broadway, Myrtle, uh, Knickerbocker, and Wyckoff. Uh, we end up identifying 8,000 units and an opportunity to increase um, housing units in Bushwick by 8,000 units. The city has almost no land in this area, right? So there's no um, thousand unit affordable housing. Uh, there's no 500 units of affordable housing that we could build on any of these sites. So the opportunities on city owned sites are almost non-existent, right? Um, the community also believes that in manufacturing sites, if we were to build affordable, uh, build housing or convert it to residential, that MIH doesn't do enough in these areas to maximize the opportunities given that a manufacturing to residential or industrial to residential rezoning is a, is a huge windfall for any developer. So in, in, a, in an effort to extract more from a potential developer, they ask that those sites that are manufacturing be left to the council member to move forward with in an effort to, to allow for the council member to negotiate deeper levels or more affordability in these projects. So we do all this work we get to the 8,000 units. We actually have an upzoning in five in four corridors that are, are all transit rich, and you shut it down. You shut it down over the manufacturing conversation. And I just want to ask more deeply: where is the current scenario and the zoning that we currently have in Bushwick? And uh, uh, and a testament to equity by city planning doing nothing is doing more harm to Bushwick than moving forward with a plan that they support that does have an increase in housing and density. And there are more, in, and so now what we're gonna end up getting is as of right developments that have no affordable housing, zero affordable housing, and no opportunities when it comes to like capital dollars that need to go into this community that are greatly needed. Can you just explain to me how that scenario and your inability to maybe get two or 3,000 more units um, speaks to your equity argument that you continue to make. Gladly, Council Member. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned the length of time that was spent in looking at the Bushwick neighborhood, um, which encompassed almost the entirety of the community district, one of the larger neighborhoods that we had looked at. Um, and the fact that it was five years, um, I would contrast that amount of time, which is um, useful, in getting to understand the neighborhood, I would contrast it with the process under this proposed bill. Um, you mentioned the 8,000 units of housing. As you know, we believe that the methodology that was used to estimate that was flawed, and that is an overestimate. We ultimately disagreed as to what the appropriate upzoning was. We looked at the proposed rezoning, and as you mentioned, it is a neighborhood crisscrossed with subway lines and believed that it was inappropriate to undertake a rezoning that would yield so little housing when the land use patterns in the neighborhood with these five major corridors would warrant a more robust upzoning that would produce so much more housing. I think it unfortunate because I do think we all entered this with a desire to see an effective upzoning, but that the proposal that came back was not one that was in keeping with the needs citywide to produce affordable housing at scale. I'm afraid that you're muted, council member. Yes, I was asking them to unmute me. Um, Chair. I asked a very simple question, how the, the, the you in your um, study, 
have Bushwick as the fourth leading uh, Time has community. Expired. Thank you. The fourth leading community of housing development, right? Now, the fourth most housing development happening as of right is happening in Bushwick. Number four, we're already beating out all these communities when it comes to housing development, right? And it's happening almost at, an, at strictly market rate housing. It's all market rate housing, almost no affordability. How is that scenario an equitable, uh, like a, 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 I guess, a speaking to your equitable like mindset, right? Like that we allow this community to completely be run over by market rate housing and not move forward to rezoning that they supported, that they wanted to work with you on. It's so one-sided and it's, and it's not justice and it is not equitable. If city planning doesn't get what they want and maximize every single drop of housing, then it's just leave the, the community, relegate the community to, to destruction by gentrification. I would have to disagree, council member. The number one request that we get for rezonings are for down zonings or for very modest up zonings, um, coupled as in the Bushwick um, community proposal with down zonings of other portions of the neighborhood. In addition to looking at neighborhood by neighborhood needs, we need to look at citywide needs as well. That's a large part of where we live. The fact that we are a city that prides ourselves on transit-oriented development and where there are corridors, where we believe there is the ability to provide significant amounts of additional housing with MIH, um, we do not entertain modest upzonings that basically are are not providing the housing that is so sorely needed. Thank you so much, council member. Thank you, Thank you. next we'll hear from council member Adams. Council member, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm just going to ask a couple uh, more, if I can just get some yes or no responses, just to kind of drill down on this a little bit more. As far as your interpretation of this legislation is, um, uh, uh, Madam Chair, did, do you, did you find in your interpretation of this legislation that there would be an installation of some sort of planning czar who would take over the decision-making process for communities? I don't recall having seen in the legislation that there is a planning czar. Neither did I, that would be a no, thank you. Did you consider or, or find in this legislation any way, shape or form once again that, uh, that decision-making would be taken away from communities and community boards? Oh, I very much see that within the legislation. If we look at the process, it is very heavily top-down and as I mentioned before, the community board is presented with three options. And beyond that, when the recommended option goes to the council, the council member can fundamentally change, the council can, and with uh, the council can fundamentally change what was put forward in the recommendation from the community board. That, that's just factually not true. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Please not true. That. That is, that is just literally not accurate, Chair, of what the legislation says. We would be glad to follow up. Obviously, we have different readings of First the of all, legislation. First of all, it's not, it's not top down. We're empowering local communities to actually engage in planning instead of being reactive to city planning's certifying of private applications and public applications. So I don't know what... I mean, if we're gonna have an honest conversation here today, we should be honest about what the legislation actually says. And what you just said, Madam Chair, is a complete and total misrepresentation of what the legislative text says and of what we have said consistently. So I am, I am a little flabbergasted that, that you would think this doesn't change the Euler process. It doesn't change the Euler clock. It doesn't change the ability for community boards to weigh in. It does more planning. It creates more opportunities for public input. The current process is top down. The current process is 
city planning certifies an application and it goes to the community board with no or very little input pre-certification, except maybe scoping sessions that could happen for large scale plans. This plan would create an ongoing dialogue with communities, community-based organizations, local stakeholders to constantly be talking about what do they want for their community? Do they want more school seats? Do they want more healthcare facilities? Do they want more types of affordable housing? That's what this plan calls for. We do not change the ULERP clock. We do not change community board's ability to weigh in. We don't, we don't call for any particular type of zoning. All it does is say more community input from the bottom up, from grassroots neighborhood groups who can start to weigh in at the local level and proactively plan with their community boards, with their council members and coordinate all of these plans. So I don't know if that was a willful misrepresentation, but it is literally completely and totally inaccurate to what the legislative text says inside of this bill. With respect, Speaker, we disagree as to what is called for by the plan. We can disagree on opinions, and, but we can't disagree on facts. The, the, and again, we have the, a disagreement the of the, of the interpretation. The, the bill does not call for the Euler process to be changed. The bill does not call for community boards to be cut out. The bill does not call for any particular type of zoning. The bill calls for further community engagement and input which as you heard earlier from multiple council members, people feel like is completely broken right now. And it calls for us to be able to plan in a comprehensive way to hopefully garner support from residents in communities who can have some type of say on what that proactive planning looks like. So to say that this takes away control from community boards, inaccurate, not factual, not what the bill says. Again, Speaker, we disagree. We agree on the fact that it does not change Euler. It adds an additional process on top of Euler. We don't see the streamlining because we believe that any proposal, any specific project of any size will be going through the entire Euler process. And with, again, the requirement under state law for a separate environmental analysis. Um, so we believe that the impact, the upshot, is going to be yet another impediment to the production of affordable housing at a time when we need to prioritize it, at a time when we need to prioritize the economic recovery from the pandemic. That, 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 is, that is a fine opinion to have. I'm not, you know, you can have that opinion and, and that may actually be a, a worthy opinion. What I'm saying is your question to to Council Member Adams' uh, uh, your, your answer to Council Member Adams' question was not what you just said right there. What you said right there could be a disagreement. We see a different path to actually potentially generating more affordable housing by getting buy-in from local communities on an ongoing process instead of a piecemeal reactive approach that we see right now. But I just wanna be 1000% clear about what the legal language in the bill says. This does not diminish community boards. It does not call for any particular type of zoning. It does not change the ULERT process. It doesn't do any of those things. You all don't like the fact, it seems, that we are creating more public opportunities for engagement outside of the Department of City Planning. And that's a fine opinion to have. That's OK. I don't disagree with that. I mean, I may disagree with it, but you can have that opinion. I'm just trying to be factual on what this calls for. It doesn't call for a top-down approach. Right now, we have a top-down approach. Right now, city planning, in many instances, without any consultation with community boards and council members, certify private applications that end up being almost fully baked by the time they get to the community board. The community board has 60 days to weigh in on that proposal. The community board issues an advisory opinion. The borough president issues an advisory opinion. In many instances, the city planning commission ignores those two advisory opinions and goes back to what the developer initially wanted in the certification application. And then the council member has to go back and do an amalgamation 
of what the developer's proposal was, what the community board called for, what the borough president called for. And, and I think that most council members and most community boards and most borough presidents typically see, not across the board, but in most instances, the city planning commission as a rubber stamp for the application that the city planning commission certified to go to the community board. So in many Speaker, ways- first and from, that foremost, we, I have to take exception think with the notion of a rubber approach. stamp. We think of that as a top-down approach, that that is the current process. What we're trying to say is we want to empower local communities to begin this process of asking what they want for long before uh, a piecemeal reactive uh, pinball game of, of land use applications happens community district by community district. So I apologize for interrupting uh, Councilmember Adams. I just wanted to be fully clear about what the legislation says. We can have a different opinion on if this is the best way to generate affordable housing, that's fine. There may be different opinions there, but it's factual about what the bill actually calls for process-wise. Speaker, one, I have to take exception with the statement about the City Planning Commission being a rubber stamp. Anyone who watches our hearings sees the seriousness, the deliberation that is put in. With respect to the fact that this bill does not require any rezoning and keeps the status quo of ULIP there, the fact that it does not drive equitable change is a cause for concern because we know that we do need more equitable allocation of affordable housing and city facilities. But speaker, again, with respect, we cannot ignore the fact that the legislation allows the council at the time of adoption of the plan to make changes to the targets that have come forward. And that as with the current Euler process, which I agree remains absolutely unchanged under the bill, the final resolution of any application under Euler is determined by the council, not yes, by the exactly. community board. We don't, we don't disagree on that. But I want to be, I want to ask you a question. When's the last time the city planning commission voted down an application that came to it? Um, we voted down an application in Brooklyn. Um, I don't know if it was 2019. And the other thing that, as you know, um, the, the same process occurs before the council, that applications are withdrawn when it becomes evident that it is not going to get a positive vote. But we did, in one instance, um, actually vote down an application. Yeah, I think that's a very rare occurrence, which is why I said it feels like more often than not, whatever the certified application is going into Euler, the City Planning Commission, uh, you know, you may make some changes, you may make, uh, you know, uh, from, the, from the review session and from the public hearings, but it's very, very rare and infrequent that the City Planning Commission actually votes down an application. Um, we work to improve applications. And Speaker, you may be aware of the fact that um, as chair, if an application is complete and the department disagrees with it, I, at the time of certification, express the department's opposition to the application. I understand. Okay, I, just, I apologize, Councilmember Adams. I just wanted to be very clear on this. I know you were asking yes and no questions and I wanna be clear on your question. Uh, this does not diminish the role of community boards. It does not uh, disempower community boards. It doesn't uh, override community boards. The community boards would still have the same role in the ULIP process and they would have more of a role uh, to be able to participate in long-term comprehensive planning on an ongoing basis instead of in a reactive piecemeal way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that. Um, and I certainly uh, appreciate uh, your uh, response uh, in depth to that question. And uh, Madam Chair, I'm sure that you have noticed today that there are a lot of us with um, community board experience and we are very, very concerned about the way that community boards have been handled in the past, um, the, the, you know, the lack of power for community boards. We will continue to fight for budgets for community boards as well as I, I think that you heard that. 
uh, virtually from every council member that spoke today. Uh, I'm gonna ask one more question of you again. Um, it's a, a yes or no, I hope. Um, and I, 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 again, I'm trying to drill down to what is real in this legislation and what is being misrepresented by interpretation of this legislation so we can just get all this out here. In your understanding of this legislation, will this legislation, will this bill, or does it have the potential, will it eliminate one family zoning, single family homes, affect uh, low density zones, with the ultimate goal of destroying single home communities? I think that the um, intent of the bill and the reality is that it would require considerations of changes to single family neighborhoods in areas where there is rich transit access. Now, but do I don't think it's legislation as devastating. Do you see this legislation as devastating? That's some of the language I've heard also uh, elsewhere and, and bantied about. Do you see this legislation as devastating to single family communities? I don't think that the legislation cannot at the same time say this is our blow for equity for having high opportunity neighborhoods absorb an equitable approach um, to meeting the city's growth needs and at the same time say, but it will not make any changes anywhere. We know that ultimately any zoning change will go through ULERP and it will go to the council, which will make the ultimate determination. But to engage in a citywide planning effort at a time when we know the housing and affordable housing needs that we have, when we know the need for economic growth to recover from the pandemic and say, but we start with a statement that we will not look at any single family residents, I, I just don't see having it both ways. This is, this is that, That's still not answering my question. Um, Mr. Speaker, I defer to you. This is shocking to me. In one instance, you're saying this plan does nothing. In the other instance, you're saying that we may be eliminating single family zoning. You can't, you can't say both things because both things are untrue. I mean, I am, I am, I am flabbergasted. This is a total red herring and a complete misdirection by the Department of City Planning to come here today and say these things. I am, I am, I am shocked that that this is what your on the record testimony is uh, to be truthful and for in front of the council. I, I, this, this, you know. Councilmember Adams' question was, "Does this is this going to eliminate it?" The answer is no. And then ultimately, you said it would still be up to the council member uh, to go through the Euler process. So, is Councilmember Adams? Are you going to eliminate single-family zoning in your district? I don't think you are. Speaker, never. Speaker, never. if I could make sure that that the would never happen. Under, as, speaker, as long as I'm in this seat, that would never happen, Mr. Speaker. What I am pointing out is that ultimately any rezoning is the purview of the council. But in speaking about creating a citywide plan that needs to address the needs of a growing city and a city that needs housing and in particular affordable housing, it would strike me as an unusual conversation that says every single family zoning district is off limits. Um, we could see it, it, that doesn't get to the fundamental issue of needing an equitable approach to address the, the areas of the city that are rich in transit. There are areas of the city, and again, we'll never get away from the fact that under our current system, it will be the council and under the practice of council member deference, the council member that makes the determination. The nuance in my comment is that if we are to address issues of equitable distribution of city facilities and of affordable housing, one needs to have the discussion about 
where are high opportunity areas where it would be appropriate to look at this? Well, I'll just conclude with this with all due respect, because I, I agree with the speaker. I think that the exchange has been very duplicitous. Um, we are ultimately coming back down to um, a council member deference and what is real and what is not real in this legislation. I think that we've had a lot of misrepresentation with this legislation. I think that a lot of people are confused. And quite frankly, Madam Chair, I don't think that you have uh, helped the confusion uh, at all, but I'm really glad that we are having this discussion today because there is just, uh, there's just a lot of uh, misguidance when it comes uh, to this legislation. Um, Time expired. Make sure that that uh, our community in particular, uh, uh, those of us who do reside in single home communities do realize that we are there to preserve where we live, not to tear it down. And that is not what this legislation does. This legislation tends to empower as a former community board chair, in my interpretation, this legislation tends to empower the community boards as so many of us will continue to fight for, to continue to empower our residents and empower our community boards when it comes to land use, land use discussions and uh, land use decisions. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, uh, council member. Uh, do we have any other council members, committee council? Uh, no chairs. So with that, uh, Mr. Speaker, one last word uh, before the administration uh, moves forward or, or? Nope, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, let's be accurate about what this bill actually does. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, administration. Uh, thank you for joining us. The dialogue will continue. This is a very important issue regarding process, regarding our communities regarding equity, uh, it goes to the very heart, many of the issues that many of our communities are facing at this moment. Uh, and so with that, uh, uh, turn it back to uh, the committee uh, council. Thank you, Chair. We'll now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Due to the large number of witnesses who have signed up to testify today, we will be limiting each panelist's speaking time to two minutes. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function. I will call on you after the panelists has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I'd now like to welcome Barika Williams to testify, followed by Borough President Gail Brewer, and then Maureen Mehta. Barika Williams, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Can, uh, am I unmuted? Yes, you are, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you, hi. Um, thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chair Salamanca, Chair Rosenthal, and Chair Cabrera, and the entire council. My name is Barika Williams. I'm the Executive Director at ANHD. Um, ANHD and our members have fought for years um, to promote equitable access to thriving neighborhoods for all New Yorkers. This is not just a question of where folks have access to move into, but just as crucially is where they have a right to stay. Comprehensive planning is a crucial step towards achieving this goal through more equitable approach to planning centered around reducing disparities and disinvestment in communities of color and immigrant communities and ensuring a more equitable distribution of development and in the investment cycle. If done properly, comprehensive planning can further the principles we are proud to support with the Thriving Communities Coalition, which ANHG is a part of and has led. Um, and we are leading this charge for equity in planning and, and land use. Um, it's important that we move away from the current paradigm where low-income communities of color are suffering the effects of decades of disinvestment, not just recent, not just the 80s, um, are pushed to accept destructive rezonings in order to have their existing needs addressed, while wider wealthy communities are largely exempted from doing their part to address the citywide needs. All six of the neighborhood rezonings completed under this administration have been in low and moderate income majority POC neighborhoods. Um, the budgeting process lacks transparency and accountability, which many of you all know and experience and, and brought up, and it fails to address and identify neighborhoods needs and historical disparities. 
I really I understand and very much uh, um, realize that this can feel like a very complicated, wonky, abstract, and sometimes misleading um, uh, bill for what is already a complicated and abstract process. Um, but I want to stress how much ANHD cares about this bill because of the impact we think it can have on tan and create tangible impacts on getting us towards equity and planning and land use. Time expired. Oh. Um, uh, so. What one thing I want to be clear is that we do not think that this bill is perfect. ANHD, TCC, and our partners have a series of recommendations we want to see made. Um, but what is important is that we want to name um, and and work with you all as our council members, as partners, as allies to strengthen this bill, as opposed to being held hostage by an administration that has not put forward any proposal to comprehensively address the inequities in planning in their eight year term. Um, and so we urge everyone that we don't allow another decade of in planning injustice to plague and starve and ravage our BIPOC, immigrant, and marginalized communities. We want to work together with any partners who are willing to come to the table and say, let's figure out something better, um, which is different than saying we are happy with the status quo um, and let and let that continue. And that and the, and in this moment, it, reckoning with Black Lives Matter continued uh, with a system that we know is unjust and inequitable. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Borough President Gail Brewer, followed by Mullen Mehta, and then Spencer Williams. Borough President Brewer, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. You thank may you begin. All right, thank you very much. I am Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President. I want to thank Chair Cabrera and all the chairs. And I've been listening the whole time. Before I give just a few remarks, I want to say I am intimately familiar with the food 10-year plan and with the resiliency. And I want to just be clear, they are important. They have to be part of the discussion. They need to be uh, thought of in a cohesive term, but they are not half as controversial or as complicated as what we're talking about today. So I just don't want to throw them in as we did well on those. So therefore, this is not a good proposal. I, I disagree with that completely. Um, so anyway, I believe that the approach of this comprehensive long-term plan uh, suggested by the speaker could achieve some planning goals in a holistic way. We know we have population growth and we have infrastructure and service improvements that we need. I want to mention that when the 2019 charter revision came up, it was uh, the speaker and the then public advocate and my bill that brought that charter commission to the fore and it was very frustrating. We could have had already a year and a half of discussing planning and that was actually shot down by the mayor's staff members on that commission. Um, and it's a shame. So now we are uh, 2021 and we have a plan that one, will help agencies to better coordinate amongst themselves and two, look at the racial and economic disparities that have long persisted in our communities. That's the goal of this plan. And as elected officials, those are our goals. However, you mentioned Soho NoHo a lot. Let me be clear. That community would be glad to have affordable housing, but, 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 the amount of affordable housing that is being suggested under MIH is too little. That's the challenge. When uh, we are told in Manhattan, you cannot have a subsidy, you have to go with an MIH program, you're gonna get pushed back. And I want to say, city of New York, you at least have to meet us halfway on things like that, but we don't. We're gonna have affordable, make it really affordable and make it something that is more than 25%. So as you heard earlier on this plan, there are some really important key issues that it address. Um, I just, I'm a little concerned because it doesn't put communities at the center of the land use process. And that's what we have done. We have done 171 ULURPs since I took office in 2014 in the Borough President, which is more than any other borough. And we see how important it is for community to have input, to analyze and provide constructive comments because they do, they are experts. They can't be sidelined. Um, and I have to worry a little bit that a comprehensive plan um, could do that without uh, the required city council vote and the formal growth targets that would be set out by the steering committee. We know that the Mueller process is long um, and the power that all the stakeholders use to achieve a better deal for communities, they could be diminished. However, um, we know that there is much possibility for improving the plan. It, it, it raises many questions about how 
communities would be able to participate, uh, how their applications would go through the public review process. We would need more greater detail on the outreach plan. What would the role of the stakeholders be, those that haven't been involved in the past, and ensuring participation in the public process that could follow the plan's adoption. But just as have you heard from ANHD and others with more information that could be used to determine whether an application is compliant with the comprehensive plan, there are ways of tweaking it to make it better. Um, so I'm here to say we need some targets uh, that we'll talk about the growth that's certainly going to be taking place in the city of New York. And in theory, this proposal can provide New Yorkers a better planning structure, but it should not limit public input. And so any changes that go uh, that improve the public input and can achieve both of these goals are very, very uh, appreciated. Thank you very much for your consideration. And Soho NoHo needs real affordable housing, not 25%. Thank you. Thank you, Bob Preston. Next, we will hear from Maureen Mehta, followed by Spencer Williams, and then Adam Friedman. Maureen Mehta, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Thank you, and apologies. I'm having some internet problems, so keeping my video off. RPA is a nonprofit research, planning, and advocacy organization that has served the New York metropolitan region for nearly a century. We've been supporting comprehensive planning along with other members of the Thriving Communities Coalition and are happy to be here to support Intro 2186. After 9-11, we helped organize the Listening to the City effort, which brought thousands of New Yorkers together to think about the future of the World Trade Center site. It was an opportunity to look past the tragedy and to think about what that area should represent for all of us. Coming out of a pandemic that has claimed too many lives and exacerbated decades old challenges, we think this effort would come at the right time to center racial equity in our planning process and work with all New Yorkers to envision a better future for the entire city. This bill provides a solid framework to better coordinate planning and create more accountability. We'll include more commentary in our written submission, but wanna highlight a few points. Uh, one, the conditions of the city report should be a critical planning tool to inform the public and expand our understanding of what investments are needed. However, robust analysis and the development of new indices should follow best practices, be transparent, and be truly informative. As, we, as we've seen through the secret process, complicated information provided in an ad hoc way does not build trust or understanding. RPA and MAS have been working on a citywide index that could start a dialogue, and we're happy to discuss that work further. Two, this proposal could help communities proactively share their needs and vision, but community boards don't have the resources they need to meaningfully engage in such a complex and long-term process. We did support the creation of the Civic Engagement Commission, and at the very least, that entity should be well-resourced to serve as a hub for training, technical assistance, and the sharing of best practices for community boards. Three, the plan does create a foundation to better align planning and the capital budgeting process. However, real collaboration among city agencies is needed to reduce costs and inefficiencies and incentives to encourage better agency coordination around capital and operating needs would serve Time the underlying expired. purpose of the legislation. Working to create a citywide vision won't be easy, but this proposal improves upon the status quo, will cut down duplicative efforts, improve government accountability and create a framework to rebuild civic trust. Thank you again for your leadership on this and we hope it moves forward and look forward to working together to make it successful. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Spencer Williams, followed by Adam Friedman, and then Paul Epstein. Spencer Williams, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Just a, sorry, oh. committee council. Is that the next panel? Or is that the current panel? Speaker, the current panel includes Spencer Williams and Adam Friedman. Oh, got it. Okay, thank you. Because I have questions for this panel. Thank you. Your time will begin. Thank you, council members. Uh, the Municipal Arts Society has long supported equitable and comprehensive community-based planning as a tenet of sound land use policy. Given the vast scope of crises that we face today, the time is ripe for a fundamental shift in how New York City plans for its future. As a member of the Thriving Communities Coalition, we share the view that comprehensive planning can help our city more effectively allocate resources coordinate city policies and investments and empower communities with the knowledge and opportunities to help shape local land use decisions. This bill brings forward key reforms to budgeting, access to information, streamlining and aligning key reporting requirements and enhancing equity. To the extent that this bill can bring real change without more substantial 
substantive revisions to the city charter, MAS believes it must be structured to further advance meaningful ongoing public engagement to better balance uh, power across land use process. With key amendments, intro 2186 can disrupt the current structural imbalance in the city's planning process. We have submitted more extensive comments in writing, but want to briefly summarize our key recommendations here. One, provide adequate resources to increase capacity building and representation for communities. We need to really equip planning staff within community boards and agency offices to sustain resources um, through ongoing funding so that land use planners and staff can facilitate uh, community engagement and the development of potential land use scenarios. We need to create balanced growth priorities citywide that incorporate a robust, robust community engagement process that can better identify district level growth targets and areas of opportunities. We need to ensure that this process gives agencies and communities, council, borough presidents, and co-authoring these go goals through identifying specific steps, implementing agencies, and responsible actions that are needed to increase access to opportunity while minimizing displacement in each community. Uh, MAS is encouraged by the concept of a comprehensive planning framework. We do not think that New York is so unwieldy and vast that comprehensive planning efforts are- Time has expired. However, the bill must give communities more authority in the city's land use process. Amendments can help us get the balance right. Uh, MAS will continue to outline these specific recommendations as the bill unfolds um, and look forward to working with the council and the Thriving Communities Coalition to bring forth amendments uh, to that nature. Thank you. Thank you. The next panelist will be Adam Friedman. Uh, council members, if you have any questions for the members of this panel, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Adam Friedman, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin. Mr. Friedman, I believe you're on mute. Adam, you've been muted the whole time. We can't hear you. Sorry about that. I thought you guys had that. Okay. So I'm Adam Friedman, director of the Pratt Center for Community Development, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the proposed legislation. The city desperately needs a fair and inclusive process for ensuring that it can meet the extraordinary challenges of climate change, of racial and economic inequality, and the sheer complexity of running a city of 9 million people. Pratt Center has advocated for equitable, comprehensive planning that encourages uh, and resources, community-based plans and participation for decades. So we really appreciate what a significant milestone the proposed legislation and this council's hearings are today. A city facing the accelerating effects of climate change needs a process that aims squarely at equity and resilience, if it is serious about achieving those goals. It's, a pro the, it's process must make sure the city remains functional and that all people, especially the historically and currently underserved, have the basic essentials of life, that our housing plans align with our transportation and infrastructure, with school construction and open space, and that all public policy objectives advance racial justice. I offer just two small examples of where to illustrate that the failure to think more comprehensively. Um, this past year, the mayor hailed the local production of personal protective equipment, particularly the masks and isolation gowns produced in the garment center as having been essential to the city's response to COVID-19. This production capacity will be lost once the market resumes and production space is converted as now allowed by a recent zoning change. Recent rezoning along Jerome Avenue, which displays clusters of small, largely immigrant owned auto businesses. That was the fourth cluster of auto businesses that was rezoned. And whether you like cars or not, cities need functions like auto repair. So the question is, who is thinking about the big long term pictures of the city and how they all fit together? Time has expired. Can I just make one one last point yeah, that strengthening the capacity of communities to engage in this process is essential. And we think that this legislation and the accompanying um, 
services that will be provided around that, including resources for community planning, will go a tremendous way to really building an inclusive, legitimate process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a question for uh, Barika Williams from ANHD. Um, Barika, there has been, as you've heard today, and thank you for being patient, waiting to testify, there's been a lot of misinformation and lies spread about this bill. Uh, you've heard some of it, that it requires the city to be upzoned every 10 years, which it doesn't, that it will eliminate single family zoning, which it doesn't. Can you speak to what the impact of this bill would be on lower density neighborhoods in New York City? And what about the neighborhoods facing severe displacement risks or low access to opportunity? Yeah, so thank you, Speaker. And, and I would say for you, for Councilmember Adams and some others, uh, I, I very much feel your frustration, um, though I would say uh, from our experience, our decades of experience, we are not surprised. Um, this is our continual experience with DCP that includes DCP explicitly, um, not one time, but multiple times having said to us, um, very frankly, we don't do race. So a conversation around equity does not seem like something that they are in a place are equipped to do. And I, I think we have to acknowledge and commend that the council has stepped into that space and said, we are going to move forward something. We're not just gonna stand still. Um, I wanna make clear that we do not um, see that this, this bill in any way, shape or form um, is not, it does not, the, what we're talking about is conflating density with planning equity. Um, this bill is as much about low density um, BIPOC developments and communities that have also been steamrolled and also been pushed um, uh, when it comes to development. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a red herring to tie this to density and talk explicitly about single family zoning. To answer Council Member Adams' question, no, it does not mandate or, or uh, eliminate single family zoning, right? This is what we're really trying to do is, is talk about equity and equity in a broad planning pro process that weaves together schools, education, um, transportation, housing, industrial jobs, commercial corridors, these various different pieces and, and recognize that our current framework is inequitable, has power imbalances, that no neighborhood should have the unilateral veto power to say, I don't like something. And then we as a city say we need it and therefore force other communities to have it. What we really need to do is have a broader conversation as a city and say, these are things that we need and here's how we think we can grow and do this. To council member Reynoso's um, um, point, where is development happening? And was that the plan? Because if that's not the plan, then what does that mean? How are things rolling out and, and how are we moving forward? Thank you, Brika. And I have one more question for you. I know that ANHD has worked all across the city to advance and support community-based development. How in your view can a citywide comprehensive planning framework complement good local community-based planning to better achieve our citywide goals? of more affordable housing, more school seats, better capital planning, uh, fair share, all of the things that communities struggle with. Right, because because I, I think also it's a, it's a um, misrepresentation to say many of these communities don't want any development, right? What they want is development that is responsive and responsible to who that community is and who those residents and, and families are. We have communities that don't have enough school seats, but they're seeing luxury housing pop up and they can't get school seats or they can't get a, a, a new dance facility in their neighborhood. That's what we're trying to create a context to address. So let the community, and, and these are one of, this is one of the places as, as um, Spencer Williams from MAS um, uh, mentioned, where we do see that there are, rec there are changes and we do have recommendations that we need to put um, uh, uh, the community in a more, um, tangible and clear seat to, to influence and, and direct the direction of, of the comprehensive planning process um, a, as this bill is laid out. So that's part of the way that we want to, to pursue and engage with you all. Um, but that is different than development gets handed to communities and communities are forced to say yes or no, which is where we are right now. It's just a decision of take it or leave it. And then we as communities are dismissed, especially as black and brown and immigrant communities are dismissed, are, are, um, are, are um, 
talked down to um, for saying no to development and labeled as anti-development, when in reality, what we really want to do is have a say and have a voice um, and have a decision-making um, authority in what is happening in our own community and in our own neighborhoods. Thank you, Barika. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, committee Council? Yes, our next panel will include in order Paul Epstein, Fitzroy Christian, Bruno Daniel Garcia, Kevin Worthington, and Meredith McNair. Paul Epstein, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin. Thank you. I am Paul Epstein, co-chair of Inwood Legal Action and a member of the Thriving Communities Coalition. Recovery from COVID-19 has kept me disconnected lately, so I'm representing myself, not particular groups. As a manager in two past mayor's offices, I really like that this bill would create order out of the current planning and reporting chaos. But as an activist, researcher, and author in community engagement, I find the bill's top-down planning puts communities last. So this bill is a technocrat's dream, but a community's nightmare. Thus, I oppose the bill as written, but I do think it can be fixed to be community empowering, not with tweaks, but with fundamental changes. I'll provide more details in written testimony, but here's a sample that follows four principles. First, no community can opt out of its share of equity-based policy goals, though requested target revision should be considered. Second, each community should propose its own land use scenario to meet its targets from the bottom up, not by choosing among other things told to it, which if found reasonable must be accepted. Only unrealistic plans should be modified by OLTPS, the steering committee or the city council. Third, community engagement must go beyond public hearings and deeper than community boards. Engagement at key times, especially when developing scenarios must be deliberative with people with different interests engaging each other and discussing trade-offs before community boards decide. Engagement must also be representative of the district population. And fourth, communities must be provided independent professional assistance in planning and engagement to help them develop realistic scenarios to meet targets and to help with outreach and facilitation to achieve representative deliberative engagement. Following these principles puts communities first while still enabling equity-based goals to be achieved. Thank you. Thank you. Fitzroy Christian, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. The time will begin now. Thank you. My name is Fitzroy Christian. I'm a member of the leadership team at the Southwest Bronx-based tenant and community organizing group known as CASA, Community Action for Safe Apartments. I am also a member of the city and statewide coalitions, including Thriving Communities Coalition and the Racial Impact Studies Coalition. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Intro 2186. So what in our vision, what is our vision of comprehensive planning and why do we need it? Comprehensive planning will ensure a more equitable approach to formulating the redevelopment of and reinvestment in distressed neighborhoods across the city, driven by the needs of the communities and including meaningful involvement of the residents of those communities. And we need this complete broad-based citywide method methodology as opposed to the piecemeal system currently in place, which is driven by developers and leads to the destruction of communities and, displace and the displacement of those communities' residents. Comprehensive planning means discarding the city's current inequitable process for a system that would center development around the community's needs and not developers' greed. Comprehensive planning would enshrine explicit principles of equity in the citywide planning process that would reverse the historic system, which used destructive developer-driven rezonings that did nothing to correct or improve the conditions of the people of color, whose communities are primarily the ones chosen for rezoning and developer enrichment, not for the community requirements. The impact of comprehensive planning would include a systemic scheme to create and provide truly affordable housing developments and a strategy to house the unhoused and to prevent homelessness. 
break the cycle that forced disadvantaged and underserved community residents to accept destructive rezoning in exchange for long overdue investments in their communities. Your time has expired. They, I'm just about finished, thank you. From which they will in, inexorably be driven. It creates a process that includes meeting the needs of community job and economic development and strengthening of the cultural and social institutions the community is being redeveloped. It ensures environmental equity, which provides baked in focus on green spaces, connecting schools to cities and state parks, among other enhanced benefits, including climate resiliency. It means a process that explicitly works to prevent displacement of residents and small businesses. It's a system that would not continue to exclude NYCHA residents and works to ensure that public housing remains permanently public and affordable privatization of public assets would be eliminated from that process. It incorporates robust public and community engagement in the planning and implementation processes in all phases of the redevelopment. And it ensures that the development has maximum impact on the surrounding neighborhoods and will add to the growth process of the city as a whole. And finally, it ensures that the Redevelopment is designed and built for the purpose of improving the lives of the current residents and not for wealthy people the city and developers hope to entice to the redeveloped communities after the current residents have been driven out. As has happened in Greenpoint and Williamsburg, in Central Harlem and Park Slope, and every community that has been rezoned over the past 10 or so decades. I would like to thank Speaker Johnson for moving this bill forward and look forward to collaborating with the City Council and bringing about a brighter and more equitable New York City when displacement and gentrification become historic artifacts and not a way of life for people of color in New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Bruno Daniel Garcia. You may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Good time, we'll begin now. Hello everyone, my name is Bruno Daniel Garcia and I'm an organizer with Communities Resist, a community-based legal service program in North Brooklyn and Queens, founded on the understanding that housing justice is racial justice and that housing legal services must be in support of community-based tenant organizing. We're here as a member of the Thriving Communities Coalition to offer testimony on intro 2186. The recent history of what passes for planning in the neighborhoods we serve are the piecemeal zoning text amendments that have offered preservation for wealthy homeowners, but displacement and gentrification in low-income communities of color. City-enabled and developer-led, the results of these rezonings were exorbitant concentrations of capital for private developers and the city, while historically neglected neglected communities of color were disproportionately displaced by the thousands as they saw manufacturing jobs and rent-stabilized housing robbed from them. Far from an accident or unforeseeable, these harms are instead the direct consequence of explicit choices by governmental and industry actors informed by racism and discrimination rather than any cogent, reasonable, or just planning rationale. Our communities can no longer plan for their future solely under the context of private development or paternalistic, obfuscated city initiatives. This creative practice where the conversation around access to affordable housing, public space, and environmental justice take place only in response to the looming threat of a private developer or in the mismanagement of public engagement processes by unaligned, uncoordinated city agencies. Conference of planning represents what the neighborhoods of New York City require to undo those injustices, but it must center racial justice and commit to affirmatively furthering fair housing. Any conference of planning legislation must come with clear teeth and enforceability to ensure further integration without displacement. The plan must include the stated goal of eliminating segregation and racially disproportionate displacement. These mandates must be coupled with a requirement to ensure equitable access to robust community planning and public engagement, including resources for communities of color to plan and assert their self-determination along committed, sustained, sustained outreach so that participation is accessible, equitable, and representational. Truly affordable fair housing is possible without displacement, segregation, and gentrification, and it is possible only with the citywide participation of communities of color. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin Worthington, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. The time will begin now. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kevin Worthington. I'm a staff attorney at Communities Resist, a community-based legal services organization operating in North Brooklyn and Queens. 
At Communities Resist, we provide legal services in support of community-based tenant organizing against res residential displacement, segregation, and discrimination. Our work often takes place in the context of post-rezoning appreciated real estate market conditions, where landlords resort to harassment to satisfy their appetite for increased rental income. Today, we submit this testimony as a member of the Thriving Communities Coalition. This bill stands to commence the long overdue process of planning for the city as a whole, comprehensively. Over the past 20 years, North Brooklyn has been subjected to the opposite, a series of piecemeal rezonings permanently transforming the makeup of historically black and brown communities. After the Williamsburg waterfront rezoning, vast amounts of manufacturing land were turned into luxury apartments and gave way to commercial stores becoming an amusement park for transient crowds. While the city and private developers felt the windfall of massive amounts of cash flow, whether in rent rolls or property tax revenues, communities who lived through blackouts and planned shrinkage were being displaced by, displaced by the thousands. Sorry. The displacement of families of color is not simply the collateral effect of neoliberal policies. It results from the convenient bland eye the city turns onto its obligation to take affirmative steps to remedy racial disparities in housing. Because of the deep wounds left by institutionally engineered gentrification, the city must adopt a comprehensive and restorative approach to planning. This means among other things that New Yorkers need increased transparency and accountability around how budgeting decisions respond to a comprehensive plan and equity goals and how the city's housing policies further fair housing as required by the Fair Housing Act. Finally, our communities cannot afford to engage in lengthy convoluted processes only to be disavowed and overridden by, by politically assigned experts who draw maps and direct development in neighborhoods they never had set, set a foot in. Comprehensive planning must be a process for the people and by the people where accountability is not feigned but enforced. We look forward to continuing this dialogue and we'll be providing additional feedback as our client surface. The time has expired. Concerns. Thank you very much again for this opportunity. Thank you. The last panelist on this panel will be Meredith McNair. You may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin now. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Meredith McNair, and I'm a community planner at Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation, and I'm a member of the Thriving Communities Coalition. I'm here to express our support for the speaker's planning proposal because it presents a thoughtful, equitable, and proactive land use strategy that will equip us to face the challenges of climate change and racial and economic inequality. When East New York was re rezoned five years ago, residents got organized and put a tremendous amount of effort into negotiating with the city for infrastructure investments and anti-displacement policies to help the neighborhood withstand the added de density but it shouldn't take a rezoning for neighborhoods to get the investments they've needed for decades. These resources should be distributed to communities based on their current needs, regardless of future growth and accounting for past neglect. East New York has witnessed firsthand how the city's current ad hoc rezoning process leads to rampant speculation, rapid increases in housing costs and displacement. What we need is a coordinated system that distributes growth across all types of neighborhoods, not just low income communities of color, and that uses both data analysis and deep community engagement to shape priorities, and also that promotes equity and access to opportunity for all New Yorkers. In order to work, the plan must be enforceable, measurable, and tied to the capital budget. This would result in better outcomes for community and greater clarity for developers as well. The speaker's proposal gives us a great blueprint for a comprehensive planning process that would finally give New York City a clear vision for its future, one that is shaped by residents and responsive to both citywide and community needs. Let's make the most of this opportunity and make sure it incorporates robust public engagement all along the way and that it highlights deeply affordable housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we'll now new, move on to the next panel, which will include in order, Lena Dalke, Paulette Sultani, Tierra Labrada, Carlos Castel Croak, and Courtney Worrell. Lena Dalke, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin. Hi, my name is Lena Dalk, and I'm with the Integrated Schools Project at New York Appleseed. 
Appleseed is a member of the Thriving Communities Coalition and fully supports the coalition's testimony submitted separately. Here I'll address the role of comprehensive planning in addressing racial and economic segregation in New York City and request amendments required for the bill to accomplish this purpose. Appleseed's mission is to advocate for integrated schools and communities. Over the last decade, Appleseed has studied the problem of racial and economic segregation in New York City and state and has successfully advocated for policy reforms to address the issue. Neighborhood segregation is a structural problem that affects the entire city and was created by centuries of racist governmental policies. It cannot be solved with piecemeal place-based strategies. Attached to our written testimony is 2019 op-ed New York segregation was carefully planned. Its integration must also be written by our executive director, David Tipson, which explains the role of comprehensive planning in addressing the legacy of officially created segregation in New York City. Similarly, in 2018, Council Member Brad Lander correctly noted in Desegregating NYC 12 Steps Towards a More Inclusive City that if fair housing planning process is real, it must lead to comprehensive citywide planning, which desegregation as, um, with desegregation as one of its goals that sets the city's agenda for growth and development going forward. While we are glad to see that the bill would require its conditions of the city report to conduct an assessment of segregation, we do not believe that the bill goes far enough to identify integration as one of the paramount policy objectives in comprehensive planning. Integration should be specifically listed as one of the citywide policy goals to be included in the preliminary citywide goal statement, along with goals to reduce and eliminate disparities across race, geography, socioeconomic status, in access to opportunity and the distribution of resources and development. Without this and similar amendments, this legislation, if enacted, will continue to allow policies to avoid intentional policies. Sorry, it will continue to allow policymakers to avoid intentional policies to integrate New York City as they have for the last century. The city need look no further than its own abysmal 2020 Where We Live plan, which we are so shocked to see just held up as a model by Chair Logo, Lago, to see how easily this could happen when the goal of integration is obscured, even in a report supposedly prepared as in furtherance of a HUD rule to promote integration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Paulette Sultani, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin now. Thank you. My name is Paulette Sultani. I'm the political director at Vocal New York. On behalf of our organization, I wanna thank Speaker Johnson for introducing this critical legis legislation and members of the city council who are here today. We are very pleased to see the city council take up intro 2186 and consider comprehensive planning for New York City. This is the direction that our city needs to take. We're not surprised the administration is against this bill. At every single turn, they have been against housing for homeless New Yorkers, investments in overdose prevention, the price tag of justice for marginalized communities has always been the justification. This administration's divestment, broken policies, lack of planning has resulted in, exam in examples like the horrific violence we saw on the trains nearly two weeks ago where two homeless New Yorkers lost their lives. We support this direction. We have long called for comprehensive planning through the campaigns to close Rikers Island and defund the NYPD. We've called for what we call a caring and compassionate new deal for New York City which is a comprehensive plan to tackle the issues that underpin our criminal justice system. Homelessness, extreme poverty, mental health issues, drug use. We believe our city must confront these intersecting issues through a massive investment of resources and restructuring of our government agencies. On any given night before COVID-19, over 79,000 people slept in New York City shelters or on the streets. Our city's overdose crisis claimed 1,464 lives in 2019. And today, 5,500 people are caged at Rikers Island. Vocal New York runs a syringe exchange program in Brooklyn and provides services to 1,000 people who use drugs actively. The majority of these individuals are homeless, most living on the streets and in need of supportive housing. Our participants of the syringe exchange program are the ones we're centering in this conversation and who need the city to, to center them in decision-making. They are people who are street homeless. They face a myriad of, ex of experiences that no person ever should from abusive policing, developing abscesses, from being forced to use in unsterile and unsafe environments, or having their limbs amputated due to sleeping outdoors in freezing conditions. For over 20 years, we've long said housing is healthcare. Despite Your our time has expired. To contact city agencies for support when our participants are faced with the most desperate situations, we've had little success getting many of them into safe and permanent housing. 
There's a dire need for our city to plan and for comprehensive planning. We look forward to working with the city council to strengthen this bill and to ensure that it centers care and compassion for all New Yorkers. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next up is Tierra Labrada. You may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin now. Uh, good afternoon, members of the council and all of my colleagues here. My name is Tierra Labrada. I'm a senior policy analyst at the Supportive Housing Network of New York. We're a membership organization representing the developers and operators of supportive housing. As representatives of this sector, the network understands well the disjointed process of building affordable housing in the city, and we fully support creating a comprehensive plan, which will allow coordinated housing development. We do believe that this is a crucial step towards a more equitable approach to planning, one that is centered on reducing disparities and disinvestment in communities of color and ensuring a more equitable distribution of development and investment citywide. Through its various New York, New York agreements and NYC 1515, the city has already expressed its commitment to addressing the needs of people experiencing homelessness. And we believe that the inclusion of supportive housing in the comprehensive plan would ensure that those exiting the homeless service system and other institutions would have access to housing in higher opportunity neighborhoods, wealthier and wider neighborhoods that have historically blocked affordable and supportive housing development. Thousands of our neighbors sleep in shelters are on the street throughout the city every night, but are never centered in conversations about their housing needs. Instead, communities with more power and social capital are able to make zoning and land use decisions, not based on need, but on preference. We look forward to working with the city to incorporate a robust analysis of homeless data and supportive housing needs throughout the city and include this data in the conditions of the city report. Additionally, we want to ensure that within siting and land use conversations, Supportive housing is treated as exactly what it is, residential development. We do believe that the city can and must rectify its history of gentrification and disinvestment in low-income communities and communities of color, and not by rezoning trade-offs, which all but ensure the concentration of poverty, but by enforcing the notion that neighborhoods across the city are required to participate in the development and preservation of affordable and supportive housing. As the city aims to move toward a more transparent needs-based approach, we wanna ensure that the voice of houseless New Yorkers are not lost or glossed over. As such, we also believe the proposed legislation should be amended to seek out meaningful participation from people with lived experience of homelessness on the proposed long-term planning steering committee. We commend the speaker and the council for advancing this bill and look better to make it as effective as possible. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Next up is Carlos Castell Croak. You may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin now. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castell Croak, and I'm the associate for New York City programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. I want to thank uh, Speaker Johnson, along with Chair Salamanca Cabrera and Rosenthal, for the opportunity to testify today. We all know that the next few decades are going to be critical in the fight against climate change. Drastically reducing emissions, pollutions, and waste as soon as possible will reduce the severity of climate induced disasters that are growing in frequency. There is no doubt that we must still prepare for more severe weather and flooding now. We must ensure that our infrastructure is not only built with climate resiliency in mind, but also in ways that place a high value on sustainability. This kind of foresight requires comprehensive and consistent planning to achieve. New York City has been effectively setting goals to fight climate change in Plan NYC under Mayor Bloomberg and 1NYC under Mayor de Blasio. Documents like this are valuable tools for policymakers, advocates, and public for be to better understand how New York City is doing on its climate goals and what policies the administration is considering moving forward. However, 1NYC is not a formal city plan and does not necessarily look hol holistically at what new challenges will arise in the years to come and how city policies interact with each other. Therefore, NYLCV supports the passes of intro 2186, which require the Office of Long-Term Planning to regularly produce a comprehensive long-term plan. This legislation will ensure that the city is continuously setting goals to become more sustainable and protect ourselves against climate disasters and regularly evaluating these goals and the programs we will implement to achieve them. While intro 2186 focuses on many aspects of the city's infrastructure, we are especially glad to see that it will establish citywide targets for open space, resiliency infrastructure, and public transportation. All three of these areas are crucial for reducing emissions and protecting New Yorkers from climate change. Furthermore, we know that New Yorkers already have the lowest per capita carbon emissions in the country because of an abundance of walkable streets and public transportation networks and relative energy efficient multifamily housing. Meeting our state climate goals requires making those benefits of density available to everyone who wants them. While much of this will mean more transit oriented mixed use development in the suburbs, it also means making New York a city Time that is open and affordable to anyone who wants to live here. Proactively figuring out how to sustainably accommodate 
uh, New Yorkers is an important component of this bill. We look forward to the passage of it and to working with the city in the future to fight climate change together. Thank you. Thank you. The last panelist from this panel will be Courtney Worrell. You may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin now. Thank you, Speaker and Councilmember Cabrera for the opportunity to speak today. I am Courtney Worrell, President and CEO of the Waterfront Alliance, an alliance of 1,100 organizations and convener of the Rise to Resilience Coalition. Climate change is a challenge for New York City unlike any threat it has faced before. For example, more than 1 million people are at risk from flooding today, most of whom live in our most disinvested neighborhoods. In principle and intent, Intro 2186 is consistent with the Waterfront Alliances and the Rise to Resilience Coalition's platform for climate. This platform is included in our written testimony. While we support this legislation, we urge amendments. Substantial changes are needed to meet its climate resilience goals. Without changes, we believe waterfront and resiliency planning will not stand on equal footing next to the major needs this legislation seeks to address. We recommend three changes. Put climate resilience and equity at the center of decision making. We seek the inclusion of a climate resilience roadmap based on data from the New York City Panel on Climate Change to guide decision making during and outside planning processes. Our written testimony provides detailed description of the climate resilience roadmap. Next, ensure sufficient community engagement and empowerment. The city will need to greatly increase capacity at the community level for partnering nonprofits and institutions for collaborative planning. This is especially critical in waterfront districts that are dense and experience flooding, where extremely difficult decisions must be made. And these are often the most socially vulnerable communities and communities where generations of families have called home. And lastly, ensure interagency coordination. Among other recommendations, we call for a process that explicitly spells out how OLTPS will ensure interagency coordination for resiliency in capital planning processes. And finally, we urge you to support and pass intro 2092. While this legislation that we're talking about today is about how we plan the city, intro 2092 requires climate resiliency and how the built environment is built. We strongly feel there are things we must do outside of planning processes that cannot Your time work. has expired. Thank you for working with us and we really appreciate this opportunity today. Thank you. We'll now move on to the next panel, which will include in order, Carolyn Sosloff, Laura Wolf Powers, Eve Barron, Ava Hanhart, and Benjamin Prosky. Carolyn Sosloff, Sosloff, you may begin upon the surgeon's announcement. Your time will begin now. Good morning, my name is Caroline Susloff and I'm a legal fellow in the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Our EJ program has advocated and litigated on the subject of the inequities of the distribution of environmental burdens in our city for almost three decades. Thank you to Speaker Johnson, the committee members here today and the council for providing opportunity to testify on an issue with the potential to truly transform our city's land use processes in the future. I'm pleased to be here representing Milpi and our EJ program to support the City Council's efforts in creating a comprehensive long-term plan. Milpi testified in support of similar efforts during the City Charter Commission in 2018, and we are incredibly encouraged that even though that effort did not bear fruit, the Speaker has taken it upon himself to ensure that many of the same goals of equity are accomplished by introducing this legislation. We in particular applaud the commitment to reducing and eliminating disparities across race, geography, and socioeconomic status and access to opportunity and the distribution of resources and development reflected in this plan. We are also grateful that the plan includes target setting for the development of resiliency infrastructure. The procedures outlined in this bill present an opportunity to protect our city and most vulnerable populations against climate change and mitigate the adverse impacts it causes. The comprehensive planning process combined with capital plan alignment would go a long way toward creating pathways for these critical projects to be planned for and executed. We join with the proponents of this bill in wanting to enhance democratic participation in city planning. We know that so much of the inequities existent in our city today are due to decisions having been made without opportunity for input from the very communities who end up bearing the brunt of negative consequences. 
In addition, to further address the needs and concerns of the city's environmental justice communities, we urge the council to amend the bill by incorporating the following actions in the plan. And I'll be very concise because I'm cognizant of this, the time. The first is to explicitly conduct fair share analyses. The second is to appoint EJ community representatives as decision makers as part of the time has expired. Thank you. Long term planning steering committee. And the third is to support community compost. Um, we work with, closely with EJ communities and will help spread the word about this bill. And I thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Next up is Laura Wolf Powers. You may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. The time will begin now. Hello, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm Laura Wolf Powers. I'm a professor at Hunter College uh, in the Urban Policy and Planning Department. Um, I'm here on my own behalf and not my employers, um, but carrying on Hunter's tradition of advocacy planning. I do wanna speak to my friends who are activist planners and organizers who've been fighting displacement, fighting for essential infrastructure and fighting for against a system that offloads the cost of development onto marginalized communities. I see the comprehensive planning proposal here that we're talking about today as being a great start. And so I appreciate the speaker's leadership in stepping forward with this legislation. The substitution of zoning for planning and the lack of a values informed strategy for stewardship of land and infrastructure exacerbate long term structural equality and environmental injustice every day. That is the current existing condition. I'm concerned that some of my fellow activists have become convinced that this proposal is not going to help improve that condition, and so I want to address that. Some people believe that the proposal would create a system that is more top-down and less participatory than we have now, and this is not the case. Under the new system, the Office of Long-Term Planning and Sustainability would work from a conditions of the city report to develop a goal statement and ultimately a citywide plan. Along the way, they would be listening to members of the public on a regular basis. They would there be uh, ample and robust participation from borough presidents, from community boards, from members of the public who've not historically been plugged into the opportunities for participation. Um, and the ultimate plan has a baked in accountability structure because it would be required by the city charter to reduce and eliminate disparities in access to opportunity and the distribution of resources and development across race, geography, and socioeconomic status. As advocates for social justice and reparative planning, we often use the terms community-based and equity-based interchangeably. The underlying assumption is that at the micro level, advocates of inclusion and equity will be able to prevail. But we've all seen cases in which this does not happen. So I think the com comprehensive framework in this proposal is an opportunity to flip the script on that. I 100% agree with my friend Tom and Gotti. <clears throat> who urges the city to establish a planning leadership that reflects the diversity of the population at both citywide and neighborhood levels. But I think that the first place we need to establish that leadership is at the city level. And that's why I'm going to fight in 2021 to help elect a mayor who will appoint a badass director of long-term planning and sustainability. And that director with a comprehensive planning system in place will be able to start dismantling the conditions that everyone is very dismayed at currently. Thank you so much. Thank you. Eve Barron, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. The time will begin now. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Eve Barron, and I'm the chairperson of city planning in, at Pratt Institute. I'm also the Brooklyn Borough President's um, appointment to the Civic Engagement Commission. Thank you for the shout out, or RPA. Um, but I'm actually testifying as a private individual. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, I realize it's a privilege that not everyone has. Um, I support comprehensive planning. I worked on the campaign for community-based planning led by the Community-Based Planning Task Force. And this is a coalition whose work between 2001 and 2009 was coordinated by the Municipal Art Society Planning Center. This was a group of CBOs, community boards, planners, EJ advocates, elected officials and academics, groups and individuals act actively involved in neighborhood planning and decision-making often not on the same sides of specific issues, but aligned to establish community-based planning as official New York City policy. I'm submitting the campaign report along with my written testimony. Intro 2186 is consistent with the campaign in several important ways. Uh, real leader leadership on issues of racial and social justice, displacement, COVID-19 recovery, and climate action. Comprehensive planning can reduce racial segregation, incorporate assessments of fair housing into zoning, and can begin to upend the connection between someone's life chances and the zip code of the place they grew up in. 
It provides a missing link between plans and budget. It allows plans to guide land use actions as opposed to having zoning actions dictate plans. It provides predictability about welcome and appropriate development and, it, and some assurance that local control does not simply translate into more power for communities that already have wealth and power. However, New York City needs both community-based planning and comprehensive planning. Community-based plans are historically the most comprehensive, most responsive to local need, most creative and most asset-based in their approach. Giving communities three planning scenarios from which to choose may not be the most participatory approach. I urge council to reconsider the role of communities in the legislation, provide them with resources to plan for targets and benchmarks laid out in the legislation, provide the time them has expired. Um, and ensure their work is inclusive and based on justice and ensure their plans are funded and implemented. Thank you for this opportunity and I'm happy to submit written time. Thank you. Ava Hanhart, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Okay. Uh, my name is Eva Hanhart. I'm Time will begin. Now, I, my name is Eva Hanhart. I am testifying on behalf of the Collective for Community, Culture, and Environment, an all woman owned consulting business and interdisciplinary network. Many collective members have been involved in advocacy for a citywide comprehensive planning net framework for more than 20 years, dating back to the campaign for community based planning that Eve described. Uh, which brought together over 100 community-based organizations, elected officials, academics, advocates around a platform to reform community boards, create an office of community planning, give teeth to community-based plans, create a citywide comprehensive planning framework. We are pleased that after years of advocacy, the idea of a comprehensive planning framework has gained traction and we hope involvement of the mayor's office will facilitate interagency coordination. Yet we have concerns about the legislation as currently proposed and the haste with which this bill is being reviewed. That said, we believe that to be truly effective and further equity, the framework must, one, be prescriptive about centering the goal of addressing the city's racial and economic disparities, require review and incorporation of existing community-based plans, including 197As in the framework, include clearer specifics about the goals and format of the public input process, reconsider the steering committee, how its members are selected and the amount of power they have. Working off a list of three options created by the city is not meaningfully engaged. Provide more time and support to communities, providing less than six months for communities realistic. Have teeth. The legislation should specify that before certifying any proposals, the city planning commission must meet specific findings that define what constitutes alignment with the framework. Uh, additionally, two critical things are missing. Community the time has expired. Technical assistance. We are concerned that these might not fo move forward with the framework. In conclusion, the collective wants to thank Speaker Johnson and council members Reynoso and Lander for moving the need for a comprehensive planning framework forward and looks forward to working with you to make sure that we can make this opportunity to do it the right way. We will be submitting longer written testimony and as you said, the campaign's uh, 2010 report for your reference. Thank you very much. Thank you. The last member of this panel will be Benjamin Prosky. You may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Can you do that? Your time will begin now. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Thank you, Chairs Cabrera, Salamanca, Rosenthal for holding this meeting. I'm Ben Prosky, Executive Director of the Center for Architecture and the American Institute of Architects New York chapter known as AIA New York. We represent New York City's public and private sector architects. Uh, I would like to read a statement on behalf of our board of directors. Comprehensive planning is necessary addition to New York's land use policies. For too long, public and private sector design and construction have been uncoordinated in addressing the city's need around housing, open space, and transportation. The only way to achieve this level of citywide coordination is through the implementation of a long-term comprehensive plan like the one envisioned in intro 2186 
As the professionals charged with implementing many of the plan's provisions, architects are strongly supportive of this effort. However, there are some important changes that AIA New York believes should be instituted to improve the bill. First, the amended bill should accelerate the timeline for the final adoption of the comprehensive plan. It is unclear whether elected officials and city agencies will continue to pursue necessary projects while the plan is in development, as they may opt to wait years until the plan is in effect to ensure that these projects are in accordance with it. An adoption date of June 2025 may therefore significantly delay both design and construction. The bill should also consider more precise geographic boundaries than community districts, which are based on demographic realities from decades ago and, and can be far too large to be effective for planning purposes. As such, district level targets may not be able to fully address the needs of of a district, particularly the needs of more marginalized communities. Lastly, the power instilled in the director of the Office of Long-Term Planning is concerning. The bill will allow for the director, uh, an unelected official to hold Time has expired. Over, over much of the comprehensive planning process uh, and at times make unilateral decisions on design and construction. Furthermore, we believe this person should be a design professional. Um, I would like to wrap up by saying that it is important first step uh, in, in instituting a much needed comprehensive plan for our city. We hope our recommendations are strongly considered in an amended version of the bill. Thank you, Speaker Johnson and the rest of the bill's sponsors for proposing this important legislation. Thank you. We'll now call our next panel, which will include in order, George M. Jaynes, Jessica Katz, Andrea Goldwyn, Simeon Bankoff, and Andrew Berman. George M. Jaynes, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin now. My name is George Jaynes. I'm an urban planner. Um, let me start by saying that I'm supportive of comprehensive planning. There's a lot in the proposal that's great, but there is one part that, in my opinion, utterly failed. And that is the role of the mayor's office of long-term planning and sustainability. They are responsible for the community engagement and developing the three land use scenarios. Putting a mayor's office in this central role is a terrible idea. You can either believe in community planning or you can believe in the proposal laid out in this legislation. You can't believe in both. Community planning needs to be community led. The mayor's office cannot come into 59 different communities to do meaningful engagement. For example, in 2018, mayoral agencies led a engagement process in East Harlem regarding resiliency. At the, the end result of the engagement process was the East Harlem Resiliency Study, which was never published. When it was foiled, 90% of it was redacted and much of what remained documented that wasted community engagement process. What happens when the mayor's office has different goals from the community? If you pass this, you will be effectively codifying a conflict of interest. The model we should be using is the 2016 East Harlem neighborhood planning process. It was a fantastic effort that showed what could happen when a community board teamed up with the city council, the borough president, and community-based organizations, or we could look at the 2018 Inclusive City Report that called for creating an Office of Community Planning driven by community priorities, have technical expertise, and be independent, quote unquote. Or we could be considering assigning responsibility for developing local land use plans to community boards, properly staffing them, and let them develop their own engagement process. Let me conclude by saying again, that we have to comprehensively plan. The time has expired. And much of the existing proposal is a great improvement, but if you believe in community planning, you can't vote for this as is. Let's fix it. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica Katz, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin now.
Jessica, I believe you're on mute. Oh, hello. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jessica Katz, Executive Director of the Citizens Housing and Planning Council. CHPC fully supports the goal of strengthening planning and land use processes to increase equity across New York City neighborhoods. We need solutions for a more equitable future now more than ever. Our land use process strives to achieve a balance between citywide needs and local perspectives. Yet these goals are often conflict in ways we must reckon with. In my former role, I spent many hours before community boards trying to gain support for controversial supportive housing projects. And I worry about how this comprehensive planning process would help defend the needs of New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. If housing is a human right, then the hard truth is we must examine the right of communities who wish to maintain control of their neighborhoods at the expense of New Yorkers who are least likely to be heard through such a process. Should we spend more time analyzing inequity in the city when there are glaring issues that we know right now require action-oriented solutions? Would a comprehensive land use plan from 10 years ago or even one year ago have helped us navigate the COVID-19 pandemic? CHPC hopes that the council will seriously consider these questions before diagnosing comprehensive planning in this form as the best solution to New York's equity issues. We're looking for new ways for New Yorkers to say yes to the things we need, not create more analysis of the problems we already know exist. The committee's own presentation today went to great lengths to argue that this legislation will not take away any discretion from council members or community boards. I even heard someone say that many neighborhood plans will not contemplate any new growth at all. So then after millions of dollars in analysis and planning, we'll be back to square one, back to the ground game of begging local council members to approve the housing we say is a human right, while thousands of New Yorkers live in shelters or on the street. We look forward to working with you to create a decision-making framework that addresses these needs. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Goldwyn, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Thank you. A good afternoon, Chair Cabrera and council members. I'm Andrea Goldwyn speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The Conservancy is a 47-year-old organization dedicating to preserving, revitalizing, and reusing New York's historic buildings and neighborhoods. We have long advocated for comprehensive planning as a remedy to the unfair piecemeal way that New York zones without planning. We called for it in front of both of the recent charter revision commissions. But this legislation is not the answer. We recognize the good intention, but based on the process, the substance, and questions raised today, we ask you to rethink it. The bill is moving ahead with limited outreach. We thank the speaker staff for making a presentation to us and our colleagues. They've been to many meetings, but only to groups that requested them. We have heard from so many council members today who demonstrate the benefit of community board experience. All community boards should hear this plan before you make a decision. If the bill will transform the way New York plans, we need more details about how it will actually work. Why are growth goals the priority? How does the plan guard against new development, especially more luxury condos that meet growth goals but damage neighborhoods? If the vast majority of development is still as of right, what are the impacts? How will the generic EIS and council call-up provisions reduce already limited community input? No one might like this question, but how will this extensive planning process be funded? Right now, community boards need help to retain consultants and navigate complicated land use proposals. If money is available, can they access it now? Infrastructure investments and sustainable neighborhoods should come before growth. Every part of the city has major needs right now. So start surveying and planning for them now instead of waiting four years. We envision comprehensive planning that helps everyone. It should be guided by experts and powered by people. It should bring opportunity and housing security to every neighborhood. But this plan is too top down. It limits community Time participation. Expired. I'm almost done. And it prioritizes the administration solution of building its way out of systemic problems. We urge the council to reject this proposal. New York needs comprehensive planning, but not this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Simeon Bankoff, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Okay. I'm Simeon Bankoff, Executive Director of the Historic Districts Council, HDC, is the citywide advocate for New York's historic neighborhoods, and we represent a constituency of over 500 neighborhood based community groups throughout the five boroughs. We are preservationists by training and inclination. We plan for the long term. 
That is what preservation is. We, we believe that long-term comprehensive planning by a municipal body by New York City is a laudable goal. However, we feel that the structural flaws in this bill and its implementation make it an inadequate roadmap for New Yorkers' best future. We are submitting a broader statement which addresses our concerns in more detail, but the proposal fails in three major ways. This bill sidelines community guidance. Many communities around New York City have spent years or decades attempting to shape the future of their neighborhoods to reflect their hopes and desires in almost all these cases, the results when they have been implemented are the products of compromise and negotiation. No community is actually thrilled with the plans they currently have. However, though the current imperfect system um, is, uh, however, through the current imperfect system, part of the protections and amenities which neighborhood res residents desire have been adopted and hopefully will come to pass. This proposal has written sidelines neighborhood community participation by creating even more meetings, which will result in advisory opinions at best. The system of community participation does not mandate any decision-making roles for the New Yorkers it will affect, instead buries them in essentially meaningless time-wasting exercises. If the city wishes to do this, we already have 197A plans. We don't need another way to sideline community planning. There's a lack of balance in this plan. It proposes to streamline development pr proposals which align with its priorities. Meanwhile, existing zoning already exists and will continue to allow as of right development to happen throughout the city with a bare minimum of guidance. This plan does not correct the basic imbalance of power which developers wield over the shape of our city. Instead, it gives them another power tool to drill through the fabric of existing neighborhoods. This plan, if adopted, would actually add to developments op developers' options Time when expired. contemplating speculative plans. Thank you very much. Finally, uh, by institutionalizing the long-term land use powers of the mayor and the city council, how does this interact with the restricted term limits of those officials? This is conceptualized in 10-year periods but grants its ultimate authority to officials with eight year lifespans. How will the function actually, uh, how will this actually function? Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now move on to our next panel, which will include in order, Lynn Ellsworth, Sean Corsandi, Russell Squire, Carter Booth, and Richard Hellenrecht. Lynn Ellsworth, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Am I unmuted? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, great. Um, Einstein said that uh, if we had an hour to solve a problem, better to spend the first 55 minutes framing and understanding it before searching for solutions. In that spirit, I think this well-intentioned law, despite its strong critique of current planning, which I agree with, rests on too many flawed background assumptions. Here are a few. One, if concern for displacement is an issue, why not use legislation to solve it in the form of universal rent stabilization and the Good Cause Eviction Act? Similarly, why not abandon MIH, which is a primary driver of policy-driven displacement? Two, <clears throat> the law presumes that housing nimbyism is some huge problem that the city needs to do an end run around via housing quotas. Yet the data tells a different story. Over 85% of all ULERP actions under de Blasio passed the city council without modifications, 15% passed with minor modifications, and 80% of new constructions as of right. We are a big real estate town, not a NIMBY town. Third, the law presumes infinite density is possible and desirable, and that there's something inherently good about upzoning so-called wealthy neighborhoods. Fourth, the law presumes to know where increased density should go. Isn't that backwards? It fails to ask when is density too low? When is density too high? Should we pile it up in one place or spread it around like peanut butter on a slice of bread? What role should the market and transit expansion play in the allocation of density? Should we give these decisions over to a non-elected director? Fifth, the law presumes that an area currently thought of as white must be racially integrated through the construction of MIH towers, but there is no evidence that MIH is an effective tool of racial integration. There is also a contradiction that needs analysis. In the city's Where We Live Now report, low-income people reported not wanting to move. Time expired. Thank you, and asked that their areas get the same high-quality schools and parks that the rich areas have. 
So given the way that big real estate turns most policies into a profitable deal for them, it may be better to separate housing from planning from, for traditional capital investments. For now, a better path might be to focus on a capital budgeting process for infrastructure like transit, schools, parks, and hospitals. Thank you. Thank you. Sean Corsandi, you may begin upon this ordinance announcement. Starting time. Good afternoon, chairs and council members. Sean Corsandi with abbreviated comments for Landmark West. Landmark West is a preservation group serving the Upper West Side, already America's second densest neighborhood, and we rank as number three among the 12 Manhattan neighborhoods for creation of housing in the past decade. And by nature, as preservationists, we are hardwired to take the long view, much like planners are. We believe uh, that New York City is the greatest city in the world and thus are very protective of it. So we read planning together with excitement, but also caution. And here are some of our concerns. Planning together would compromise the city planning department and swing the balance of power from the existing model wherein the city planning commission is comprised of a chair appointed by the mayor and six members, one per borough president and one by the public advocate. Rather than share representation, final decisions would all be funneled through the mayor's office, although many diverse parties from the community are involved along the process. Those roles are purely advisory and ultimately can be subject to political favors. Planning together does not cite the metrics nor rubrics for weighing those statistics for making decisions. Although affordable housing and equity are indeed important goals, there are no considerations of existing densities identified in the decision-making process. Several areas earmarked as opportunity zones are also some of the densest in the country. By design, density already follows transit lines and many of which have not been changed in decades. If these areas are deemed opportunity zones, it only further favors highly developed areas and leaves less served areas increasingly less served, not more. The city should, the city should seek to build out infrastructure for a more even distribution of opportunities. Most importantly, planning together does not once mention landmarks, historic districts, nor the value of placemaking, key planning considerations, but rather favors building placing above all else, even at the peril of our own historic assets. Planning together seeks to engender trust from a population that's been deemed disillusioned with the process. In part, Time it's expired. So by undoing decades of community-driven land use actions, such as contextual zoning, special zoning districts, et cetera. We believe in a truly collaborative, comprehensive plan, but let's actually do it together. Thank you. Thank you. Russell Squire, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Thank you. My name is Russell Squire. I'm the chair of Community Board 8 Manhattan. I want to thank the many council members who have spoken forcefully in defense of community boards and our role. CB8 will be giving the planning together proposal a thorough and comprehensive review in the coming weeks, and I expect that we will have a number of detailed comments and recommendations in connection with that process. For now, I have three points I would like to make. First, for planning together to be successful, it must incorporate the input and ideas of the New Yorkers whom it will affect. It is encouraging that you are holding this hearing to hear from the public, but this hearing will not be enough. It is critically important that the council provide additional opportunities and time for New Yorkers to weigh in and that it be open to making changes to the proposal in response to their views. Second, CB8 has called for a comprehensive city plan on multiple occasions, most recently in connection with the 2019 charter revision process. So it is encouraging that the council is taking steps to develop such a plan. In the absence of a citywide plan, local communities and community boards lack predictability and visibility into the city's decision-making when it comes to certification and other zoning decisions. But we emphasize that developing a comprehensive city plan must use a bottom-up approach. Incorporating the knowledge and views of communities will lead to better outcomes. Finally, we are pleased that the Planning Together proposal enhances the role of community boards in some ways, and it has been encouraging to hear Speaker Johnson's remarks about the role of community boards. Um, but CB8 is nevertheless concerned about the proposal to create a borough steering committee uh, or borough steering committees. The legislation says that the borough steering committees shall provide recommendations on the citywide steering committee's preferred land use planning scenario for each community district. However, providing communication, uh, recommendations on the preferred land use planning scenario for community districts is precisely the job of community boards, which are locally focused, locally sourced in their membership, and locally knowledgeable about their respective neighborhoods. And to the extent that a committee is needed to make borough-wide recommendations, Manhattan already has a borough board for that. I strongly urge the city council to abandon plans for Tom borough committees. 
in conclusion, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to testify today. And CB, it looks forward to working with the council to provide our feedback on this proposal. Thank you. Carter Booth, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Hi, my name is Carter Booth. I'm chairman of the community board to cover Spanish Village, the West Village, Packard District, Little Italy, Soho, Noho, a portion of Chinatown, Hudson Square. Our community board's council members are Speaker Johnson, Council Member Rivera, and Council Member Chin. I want to echo much of what Chair Squire from CB8 just uh, mentioned. Um, since this bill was introduced in December, there's been little outreach that we're aware of to community stakeholders for a plan that reports to include significant community engagement as part of its process. We asked the Speaker's Office to present on intro 2186 after we became aware of this hearing with the goal of being able to provide constructive feedback before this legislation is fully baked, but we were unable to, uh, to have somebody come and present at our land use meeting. Our land use committee and members have many questions. We look forward to having those answered. In hearing the dialogue today, I want to point out that no one reached out to CB2 to discuss this bill or offered to present the particulars in order to begin to engage in the hard and real conversation that we need to have regarding land use and comprehensive planning. CB2, as some may know, is extensively engaged in land use matters monthly, and it's hard to believe a conversation that we are very much interested in participating in is not occurring. In fact, it appears to us that this plan is being fast-tracked to be brought to a vote with insufficient input at the community board level, especially in light of the need to continue with Zoom-only Zoom meetings. This is in stark contrast to the lengthy educational process undertaken by the 2019 Charter Revision Commission. Adoption of the legislation and long-term comprehensive plan, as it is now written, would result in major changes to the public review process that are not fully understood or appreciated at this time. This legislation would add a completely new layer of bureaucracy to a city that you are aware of is already facing severe and unprecedented budget constraints. Implementation would require resources, both economic and staff, the community boards do not currently have in order for us to be able to participate in this complex and lengthy process. CB2's current unanimous position, uh, the board's position on this matter is that the city council's plan to vote on intro 2186 as early as next month be delayed until there's been I'm time- expired extensive outreach to and dialogue with community boards and related stakeholders, those whose voices were mentioned repeatedly as being an important part of the process in the discussion earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Hellenbrecht, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Committee Council. Richard, um, you appear unmuted on our end. I don't think we can hear you though. You may need to accept the mute request. Okay, in the meantime, we'll uh, move on to the next panel. Uh, so the next panel will include in order, Eugene Kelty, Joseph Marzigliano, Alicia Boyd, Anthony Rivers, and Henry Euler. Eugene Kel Kelty, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Uh, thank, you, time. thank you, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate it. Uh, I do understand what you're doing with this virtual meeting. It's very difficult as a chair, and I thank you and the council for allowing us to talk. As the chair of Community Board 7, we sent a letter to the speaker, and we were opposed to this uh, procedure uh, or plan. Uh, we've gone through a lot of renovations and a lot of rezonings and stuff, at least 11, and we find that the process worked. It's not perfect to the point that there still needs tweaking and fixing. 
but you have to understand this board understands and we've been around for a long time that we work through the council persons. We work through our elected officials, definitely work through the borough president's office and we do get positive feedback from the city planning. I wanna thank the commissioner for city planning. I agree with a lot of her statements that she made and we do draw on them for a lot of research and, and support. I cannot tell you how many people have been sent back by the city, city planning, not to mention BSNA when they find out that the application that came before them is not what the community wanted. So we do have a problem with the way this process is being done. As my chairs from CB8 and 2 in Manhattan, we think this is being fast tracked very badly. Uh, I think that when we have something as important as this, it should take a lot of time. That's why we put a negative declaration out on this that we're not happy with this plan. I have to tell you, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I blame the city council people. We look for them. They're voted in by the people of our district. They're their communities. They know their communities. Uh, I've been a long time member of community board seven. I've been to many council members, many borough presidents. We work with the community to fix the thing. I dislike the word equity. I like the word equal because it means the same for everybody. Uh, I have to agree with Amanda Goldwyn. My concern is a lot of the stuff in the plan has problems with it because it doesn't deal with funding, who's in charge. And, and I don't want to debate any more on it. We will be listening and we will be responding to whatever you like. And we will always I'm give excited. feedback to the council and our elected officials. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Marzigliano, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, um, members of the city council and my colleagues. Um, my name is Joseph Marzigliano. I'm the district manager of community board 11 in Queens. Um, I would like to ask if I can respectfully defer the remainder of my time to my chairman who's on the call and head of agency, Michael Budabin, if that's possible. Yes, that's possible. Okay, thank you so much. Mr. Budabin, you may begin. Starting time. Thank you. My name is Mike Budabin, and I am the chair of Queens Community Board 11. And thank you, Joe. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak here. I'm here because our board considered this legislation and voted to oppose it because of the effect we felt it would likely have on communities such as Northeast Queens. We were also disappointed in the fact that this legislation was proposed without communication to or input from community boards, the governmental agency closest to the general public. In terms of single family housing, I acknowledge the bill does not state single family housing should be eliminated, but it's a growth initiative and the use of the Minneapolis case study combined with the negative connotations regarding Mayor Bloomberg's downzoning outer borough residential communities reasonably caused alarm in the minds of many community board 11 constituents. I also believe the perceived need of the speaker's fact sheet is a fundamental process failure. The easiest way to ensure that constituents don't misunderstand proposed legislation is to explain it to them. But we received no notice from the speaker's office and no offer to meet with us for input in advance of this bill's proposal. My office sent two separate emails to Speaker Johnson's office in advance of our vote on this matter, inviting his office to come speak. These emails went unanswered, and this lack of advanced communication shows a disrespect to community boards and constituents. I'd like to now briefly step out of my role as a community board chair and speak in my personal capacity as a resident. Personally, I support comprehensive planning initiatives as a general matter, and I believe that the lack of affordable housing in this city is an absolute crisis. I also recognize the historic racist policies and environment in the United States in general, and the city in particular, that have led to the terrible de facto housing segregation that we all live under. City residents of color deserve a strong voice in zoning and land use matters. But while I'm sure that the authors of this Planning Together report had no ill intent, the tone of certain aspects of it, particularly in regards to the Bloomberg downzoning in certain lower density New York City neighborhoods, almost guaranteed to put people in those communities, communities like mine, on the defensive. I can tell you that the people that I know in my area care deeply about land use because they love the combination of single family living, yard space, participation in the New York City community, and access to all the wonders the city has to offer, not to insulate them from other New Yorkers. These residents have stuck with New York City because they love it. They want to be able to walk to a slice of pizza or a haircut. I know that there's, that's one of the reasons that I live in Bayside. We need much, much better communication from the government to its constituents to allow bills like this to work and form a partnership. It would have helped if, they, if those community, uh, those city council members had listened to stay and hear what the community had to say about this. Many of them have left. It's an example, but we need more communication. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia Boyd is up next. You may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Hi, my name is Alicia. Starting time. 
Hi, my name is Alicia Boyd and I represent the Movement to Protect the People. We are a grassroots organization that's located in Crown Heights, Flatbush, a low to moderate income community of color that has been targeted for the last six years for major up rezonings. And while this bill talks about the need to protect communities like mine, wanting to ensure that people of color can get into white neighborhoods and making sure that there is more diversity as far as development outside of just community of color, I've looked at the law of this bill. I didn't look at the 26 beautiful pages. I looked at the law because we also file lawsuits here in this community in order to protect ourselves against DCP and against the city council and against our local elected officials who never are responsible to communities of color. And the law says that there is a city planning commission. There is the office of the mayor who creates the three plans. They give the three plans to the community board. The community board chooses one plan. The mayor, the the uh, borough president chooses a plan, the committee chooses a plan, and then that plan gets submitted to the city council. And if the city council does not approve the plan, the mayor's office approves the plan. Now, to me, that sounds like top down. It gets created by the mayor's office and it gets decided by the mayor's office. And in between is all the bullshit, okay? The bullshit that comes into black communities all the time about how they're going to do something for us, like create affordable housing that's not affordable to us. The MIH has done absolutely nothing. And the city council, as they talk about the MIH, on the Department of City Planning, they have not changed the MIH. They're the ones who voted for the MIH. And you have known that the MIH does nothing but create displacement and justification in every black community that, that's on in New York City. So if the city council really wanted to do something, they might start changing some of the laws and stop blaming the Department of City Planning for the fact that they are not doing their job in protecting communities of color while they get real estate money behind closed doors to do so. So we definitely do not support this plan that was never created with any black community in New York City, but created by Corey Johnson, who just wants to sit there and get another political position underneath his belt. Thank you. Thank you. Henry Euler, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. My name is Henry Euler, and I am the first vice president of the Auburndale Improvement Association. Um, we have an organization of close to 500 members. We are opposed to this plan. Um, we do believe in uh, a comprehensive plan. We, we support truly affordable housing. We uh, are concerned about resiliency and, and climate change and equality. But this plan is a top-down proposal. This plan had no input from the public or the community boards at the beginning of it. And that's when it should have started at the beginning, not in the middle, not at the end. We also are very concerned about the uh, possible upzoning situation. We're concerned about the unelected director. We're concerned as well about our single family districts that they are preserved. We work very hard to uh, preserve those particular uh, areas. Um, when the City Charter Revision Commission uh, met recently, they had meetings all over the city and they listened to the people and uh, we gave suggestions of what we wanted to see changed in the charter. And they listened to us by and large. That was planning together. When we did our rezonings here in Auburndale and Western Bayside, there were three of them that we were participating in in our boundary lines, and we were listened to. We worked with our elected officials, we worked with the community board, we worked with city planning, and we came up with a plan that was agreeable to people in the area. That was planning together. 
This bill is not planning together and we oppose it. And we've submitted our written statement about that as well. And I'm representing as well, Terry Pomari, president of my organization. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to the next panel, which will include in order, Paul Graziano, Julia Bryant, Kevin Forrestal, Kirsten Theodos, and Lynette Townsley. Paul Graziano, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Uh, I just wanna briefly say that I am an urban planner who has rezoned tens of thousands of properties in the city of New York over the last 15 years, doing contextual rezonings in communities throughout the city. Uh, I am totally in favor of comprehensive planning. I am opposed to this bill. I will be uh, submitting my written documentation and it will be published as of uh, tomorrow or Thursday in a major publication. Uh, the, if anybody would like to sign up to our petition, it is change.org slash stop NYC intro 2186. And just a few observations from today because I don't need to repeat a lot of what's been said. Um, I think the behavior of some of the council members today and most of whom have left, unfortunately, from this meeting has been pretty atrocious. Um, this is not a campaign uh, situation. There are people, many of the people who have been the most outraged or quote unquote outraged have, are people who are running for other positions. This bill should not be submitted right before everybody is leaving office. Uh, the, the unexplained or unintended consequences of this bill will be severe. Uh, again, my full position will be sent uh, as, as uh, uh, submitted testimony. But again, uh, Speaker Johnson and others, you really should be much more professional in the way that you're treating both the people that you're speaking to and the Department of City Planning, who was extremely polite to you. That's all I have to say today. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Julia Bryant. You may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Starting time. My name is Julia Bryant. I live in Prospect Heights, Brooklyn. New York, unlike other world-class cities, does not have internet infrastructure. That being said, it is unfair to assume that communities will be able to give their opinions on any public proposals, including comprehend comprehensive city planning or community land use proposals. My suggestion is Either we suspend public virtual hearings or make dramatic improvements on our broadband and internet infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Kevin Forrestal. You may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Um, I'm Kevin Forrestal. I'm president of the Queen Civic Congress, which is an, an umbrella organization of over 80 civic organizations in Queens. Thank uh, the uh, speaker and the chairs for this invitation. Uh, introduction of this legislation is far reaching, complicated piece of legislation. It could have profound effects on the city. It is not a task to be taken hastily and uh, without significant amount of deliberations and public review. It certainly is not legislation which should be enacted by a lame duck legislature and mayor. The voters overwhelmingly rejected a referendum calling for comprehensive uh, planning in 2019. The will of the people should not be rejected by the New York City Council. The task of developing this comprehensive plan as outlined in the intro will require a significant amount of new resources and no dollars have been identified. This intro has been submitted in a time of severe fiscal crisis and population fluctuations. It is a responsibility to, to make long-term plans when the fiscal stability of the city and the state have not been addressed. 
If enacted, funds may well be diverted from other essential services. I have submitted or will submit uh, a written testimony outlining 14 points of which I don't have time to discuss today. I call for the withdrawal of this legislation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Kirsten Theodos, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin now. Hi. Yes. Um, good afternoon. My I name is Kirsten. Well, for you, two, two minutes. You can begin, Kirsten. Sorry. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kirsten Theodos, and I'm testifying in opposition to intro 2186. The city's land use process is indeed broken, but creating a 21st century Robert Moses is not the solution. Intro 2186 would create a mayoral appointed director of long term planning <clears throat> to develop and implement a comprehensive long term uh, plan prioritizing population growth. What Robert Moses 2.0 would quote deem appropriate ends up in the final citywide goal statement for creating targets to increase housing and commercial space throughout the city. All this happens before a single public hearing takes place, purposely blocking the public from deliberation or review of how their neighborhoods will be upzoned. After the final goal, goal statement is released, only one hearing per borough is then required. A real comprehensive plan would increase community input, not diminish it. A real plan would also not create a non-elected Robert Moses figure with dictator-like powers. A real comprehensive plan creating housing targets would not exclude the people who know the neighborhoods the best, the residents. Even more alarming is the grandstanding on racial injustice, a concept that was blatantly ignored during the racist rezonings of East New York, East Harlem, Inwood, Flushing, and Jerome Avenue, and how deliberately quiet this plan was rolled out to the public. The community boards weren't even notified about this legislation, never mind being excluded from drafting the ironically named planning together plan that was unveiled in December. In February, it was announced that the council would hold a hearing in just two weeks, today, February 23rd. In the span of a couple months, the council has whipped up this bill proposing to amend the city charter. And even after neglecting to inform the public about the bill, it is still being shot down by community boards all across the city. There has been a mass exodus since COVID. It was recently reported that there, there are over 16,000 vacant apartments in Manhattan alone. So why is the city determined to fast track a bill with a specific goal of increasing population when we don't even know what the population- Your time is? has expired. Yeah. For all these reasons, I ask city council to vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Lynette Townsley. You may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Good afternoon. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Lynette Townsley um, and I'm from Queens and I'd just like to take this opportunity to say thank you for having us. This is very informative. I've been on here since 10 o'clock and I am a new board member of Community Board 12. Um, I am um, concerned and I agree with the Community Board's um, two, eight, seven, and I also have the frustration of Miss Alicia Boyd. Um, I grew up in Brownsville in Brooklyn, where there's a lot of people in the community, a lot of projects, and now I live in Addisley Park in Queens, where we are a historical district, and we fought hard to keep the character and the quality of life in our community. And um, we also, on a community board, we also made a, um, voted a resolution also to oppose this. And I would hope, we had meetings too, before, you know, when it came out. And I'm concerned that, you know, the elected officials didn't come on to talk to us because a lot of stuff that's going on now and everything, we could have probably resolved some things if it was truly with the community being together. Um, earlier, I know they pointed out that it didn't say things explicitly, but we feel that, I feel that, you know, the community, will, they want to upzone because they specifically say such preliminary statements um, shall include proposed strategies for meeting such goals in quantitative. And when accent, you know, we know that means numbers. 
And when asking, you know, are they going to take away our homes or, you know, down, um, take away single family homes? It's like, no, just don't sell your home. But what if 10 years from now, you know, some of my neighbors, most of them are elderly, time has expired. they leave and some a build developer builds, then I have a single family home, but they can build an apartment building. So that takes away the character. I would hope, I'm glad that we're having this conversation, but I would truly hope that we can come together um, as a community, be transparent and have these hard conversations so that we can work together. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to our next panel, which will include in order, Lo Vandervock, Michael Hollingsworth, Olympia Kazi, Phil Konigsberg, and Rachel Levy. Lo Vandervock, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. The time will begin now. All right, he's just, he's coming right now. Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I am. Okay. <clears throat> My name is Lowe Vanderbilt. I'm president of Carnegie Hill Neighbors. We are a local community organization seeking to improve our neighborhood located in the northwest of the Upper East Side. We applaud the objective of this planning proposal. It's, a, it's objective of comprehensive planning that is equitable, fair, and inclusive, and that seeks to minimize displacement. But we also see this proposed planning process as very complex, and we have some serious uh, reservations that we will be submitting in writing. Uh, Russell Squire of Community Board 8 in Manhattan has uh, well spoken earlier, and we are located in the Community Board 8 district, and I would just like to add that much of the development in, uh, in the Community Board 8 district in the last number of years, whether as of right, or through Euler has not been welcomed because of the excessive heights. And, and, uh, and this, is a major, uh, this is a major concern and also because of the devices used by developers such as mechanical voids, uh, which, which further increase height. Um, also, uh, the, uh, there's been a, a proposal for the Lenox Hill Hospital expansion and also the New York City uh, Blood Center. Um, both of which are ULIP processes and uh, also strongly, strongly opposed, at least in their initial presentations. Finally, I would like to mention that e even mayors can oppose uh, well-off neighborhoods. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg, uh, to, to, uh, in the view of many to his credit, uh, and in the, in the interest of social justice, insisted that the marine transfer station, which would transfer garbage from trucks to barges, uh, located at 91st and- uh, The, the East, time has expired. Yeah, that that project should go forward. So uh, mayors can sometimes oppose communities that are well off. Thank you so much. Thank you. Michael Hollingsworth, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin now. Everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael Hollingsworth. I'm a rent stabilized tenant and member of the Crown Heights Tenant Union, an autonomous tenant led all volunteer of tenant associations. I live in a city council district that has been under siege for the past seven years. We've seen a string of developer driven land deals from the Bedford Union Armor 2017, races rezone Franklin Avenue in 2018 in a forthcoming disaster that is 960 Franklin Avenue. About this proposal for a comprehensive citywide plan, this whole proposal is still a top-down plan, giving community boards three scenarios and a show vote in which we get to pick one, in, in which we get to pick which one we hate the least, isn't including us in determining what gets built in our neighborhoods. It's more the same, simply rebranded. Governments usually get one bite of the apple. You all got yours with MIH, which has been an abject failure and it completely dis disqualifies this mayor and city council that voted for it to get another bite. New Yorkers number one concern is housing affordability and stability. And the city is less affordable than eight years ago and more New Yorkers are homeless than eight years ago. Late is the hour in which the city council chooses to appear with a comprehensive citywide plan. 
is a lifelong member of a red line district who lives with the effects of your decisions every day, I strongly believe that a comprehensive city plan is needed. But with this current city government's track record as it relates to housing, rezoning, and land, land, land use decisions, you have shown that you are not up to the task. This city council should not saddle neighborhoods and future governments with their last ditch effort to save, so, to save a solidified history of failure. Now is not the time for legacy building. Now is the time for the city council to stand down. Thank you. Thank you. Olympia Kazi, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Olympia Kazi and I'm an urbanist. I also serve on land use at Community Board 3, but today I testify on my personal capacity. So in New York City, we need comprehensive planning and I can't stress enough how distressing it has been year after year to hear Department of City Planning commissioners opposing comprehensive planning and keep relying on zoning. Uh, when I saw the presentation that uh, the city council people gave to my committee and uh, today the questions that I heard were what does meaningful community participation looks like? How do we make sure that sufficient funding and other resources are ongoing for the communities? Will this help communities to really push through the community-led 197A plans? Uh, why will this be run from the mayor's office? Uh, why pass this bill now while you are all on your way out? And the reality is that this plan doesn't, under, doesn't uh, you know, address a lot of these frustrations that many of us have because unplan the planning process has been unfair. But with all this said, I believe that this proposal has a strategic value. And I don't like the idea of throwing away the opportunity to start building toward comprehensive planning. So I would recommend, instead of tying this right away to the actual planning process, pass an improved version of this bill as a stepping stone toward comprehensive planning, where we create these plans completely disjointed from the planning process and we evaluate them over the years. And if they do make sense, then we include them in the decision-making process. Because sooner or later, we should stop relying on zoning. We need comprehensive planning and it needs to be equitable. So let's work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Phil Konigsberg, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Hello, Council Member and Chair Cabrera. Good to see you again. Um, I'm a, my name is Phil Konigsberg. I'm a member of Queens Community Board 7 uh, for a long time, but I'm speaking here as an individual. Uh, I want to uh, support and endorse what my fellow community board members previously have spoken. And as I look at the squares on the screen, Gene Kelty, my chair, Kevin Forrestal, uh, Paul Graziano, and Henry Euler. Um, I am totally against this bill. The uh, naming of it, planning together, is a very poor description because it's just not together, it's separate. And at this point, I would like to uh, yield uh, my remaining time to Richard Hellenbrick, who for technical reasons couldn't speak uh, previously. So if that's approved, I'll yield the rest of my time to Mr. Hellenbrick. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, can I be heard now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I speak to you today for myself, Richard Hellenbrecht, a lifelong resident of New York City and a proud single family homeowner in uh, Belrose Town in Eastern Queens. Uh, I'm known to be an active member of the civic business and parks organizations in the borough. I've thor uh, thoughtfully considered the subject intro as well as planning together the study document. Uh, the, as land use chair of the Queens Community Board, I'm well aware of the crying need for additional support for our local district offices, particularly for more and better planning data, as well as increased coordination among city agencies. 
However, if I were a member of this city council, I would never consider voting for a massive complex and potentially disruptive legislation such as introduction 2186, knowing that the bill's primary sponsor will not be in office, office to lead the implementation or to take the heat for any likely problems. The city is facing numerous crises right now. In addition to your awesome responsibilities to govern the largest city in the world, the council's job right now is to fight the COVID pandemic, get 8 million plus people healthy, get businesses up and running, open schools and get kids in them, uh, prepare for climate change, find homes for the homeless and balance the worst budget crisis in decades. Uh, when all of that work is done, you are welcome to turn the city planning apparatus on its ear. Uh, meanwhile, let's stop wasting time fixing what ain't broke and solve these very real and pressing problems. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Levy, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Cabrera, Speaker Johnson, and Council members. I'm Rachel Levy, Executive Director of Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. We're a preservation group founded in 1982 and a leading voice for common sense planning in our neighborhood. A holistic citywide planning process that streamlines current redundancies, provides a clear and equitable vision for the future, and empowers communities to have a voice in the future of their neighborhoods is a worthy and necessary goal that we support. But this proposal falls short on the details. At its core, planning together represents a top-down planning process that would centralize land use powers among the mayor and city council and prioritize growth goals above all else. Communities would have opportunities to be heard in an engagement process, but this activity will be managed by the mayor's office and local feedback is not the primary input in the development of the land use scenarios. It's unclear how growth targets will be determined, if and how they will consider historic districts and landmarks, and what recourse communities will have if they disagree with the plans set out with their, for their neighborhoods. Rather than simplifying or streamlining the process, planning together graphs a complex new bureaucratic process, one that outlasts the term limits of any elected official onto an already complex process. With community engagement led by the same outside body that's instituting the growth targets and no mention of additional funding or professional support for community boards, we're all but guaranteed more engagement theater rather than a meaningful process with New Yorkers to come together on shared values and goals. More coordinated and equitable planning is a worthy goal and something that communities desperately need, but centralizing much of the planning process to the mayor's office and city council will further entrench top-down planning processes that limit true community engagement and further complicate planning in New York City. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to our final panel, which will include in order, William Thomas, Leticia, Leticia Romero, Phil Simpson, and Brian Block. William Thomas, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Will Thomas. Uh, I'm here to testify on the council's proposed bill as a representative of Open New York, uh, an independent pro-housing organization. Uh, we're judging this bill on how it will help us break with the status quo in solving our historic housing shortage, uh, whether it'll get us the housing we need, where we need it. Uh, in this light, the bill has many positives. Uh, first, we like the citywide goals established at the start of the process. Uh, creating a common framework before Euler begins should help reduce the likelihood that residents feel taken advantage of by developers or the city. Uh, we also approve of the proposal to set district-wide targets. Uh, we must have a common view of when a neighborhood has truly seen its fair share of construction without being filtered through the lens of what is politically realistic, which is inherently inequitable. Uh, we also support the inclusion of mandated periodic reviews of the zoning resolution uh, by requiring the city to present every neighborhood for proposals with uh, land use changes before developers submit applications. Communities, elected officials in the city can evaluate them without the specter of backroom deal making. Uh, finally, we also support the general environmental impact statement in the plan, as doing EIS as one project at the time is needlessly costly and ignores the interconnected nature of urban planning. All that said, there are significant drawbacks, uh, namely in how it allows the council to unilaterally undermine this planning. The bill permits the council to change district level targets before adoption with no oversight to ensure that they remain consistent with citywide goals or equity mandates. Furthermore, the call up procedure is vague and perpetuates ad hoc decision making. One can easily imagine a situation like today 
where the council calls up rezoning applications in higher income neighborhoods, but allows rezonings in lower income ones uh, to sail through. Uh, significantly, there are also no clear carrots or sticks to encourage adherence to the plan. There needs to be real incentives to stick to commitments. Uh, finally, this process is disconnected from the budget process, which opens the door for political wrangling, where low-income neighborhoods could be told they must adopt land use changes in order to access needed investment. Time has As expired. such, uh, we would recommend they pair the bill uh, with necessary minimums to ensure accountability uh, with objective methodologies uh, for homelessness, air pollution, educational disparities, and racial segregation, um, as well as other things which I'll include in written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Leticia Romero. You may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Well, good afternoon, Chairman. Speaker I'm Johnson. Begin now. Oh, sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Leticia Romero, and I'm a former vice president for the Battery Park City Authority and former chairman of Community Board One, Staten Island. Thanks for allowing me to speak on this uh, intro 2186. The five boroughs are like five children, none better than the other, but each different. Of the five boroughs, Staten Island is most different. We are more suburban in character. We have the smallest population, which is severely underserved by public transportation. And we are often left out uh, when it comes to the city service delivery. One size fits all planning never worked for us. While intro 2186 lays out a pathway towards comprehensive planning for New York City, it doesn't give real teeth to those who best know their community. If you truly want to benefit all neighborhoods, a comprehensive master plan reflecting goals that are unique to each borough should be developed and adopted. Borough presidents are empowered by the city charter to plan their borough. Therefore, they should lead a borough task force that includes members of the borough board and borough commissioners who will create a long-term comprehensive master plan reflecting the unique needs of their borough. Allowing each borough to plan in a way that celebrates its uniqueness will provide New Yorkers the opportunity to choose where and how they want to live. It will allow us to successfully plan future service delivery budgets and reduce the need for knee-jerk reactionary budgeting. Best of all, it will send a message to residents and businesses that New York City wants everyone to live and do business here. Imagine a New York where borough presidents and community boards have a real voice at the beginning of the planning process, where Euler variances and individual rezonings are the exception instead of the norm, where the battle of residents to protect the character of their neighborhood doesn't need to be fought on a regular basis, and where everyone gets the services they need from the largest budget of any city in the world. If you can imagine these things, they can become a reality. Time has My years at the Battery Park City Authority taught me the importance of comprehensive planning, especially when initiating new ideas such as sustainable development. My time as community board one chair taught me that comprehensive planning must begin with the people who know their neighborhoods best. If intro 2186 can be revised to allow the comprehensive planning to begin with borough-based plans created by task forces led by each borough, beneficial character revision of uh, uh, president for their respective boroughs, it has the potential to be one of the most beneficial character revisions of this century. And to those who say it's too costly, I ask how much money and how many people has New York City lost to poor past planning. The details of my idea are included in my written testimony. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Phil Simpson, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Your time will begin now. Thank you. My name is Philip Simpson. I'm a resident of Inwood. Uh, was involved with the Inwood rezoning for over the last four years, with other rezonings around the city. I've seen this, the administration flatly reject any consideration of race, refusing to see racial injustice in land use. I've also seen the uh, what a prior speaker referred to as engagement theater of um, what happens during Euler at the, at the community level. Process matters. And if we want good outcomes, you have to begin with a good process. I agree with many of the speakers we've heard this today that the current process fails the people who live and work in our city and that we need comprehensive planning, among other reasons, so that neighborhoods are not required to engage 
in destructive bargains in order to have basic amenities that everybody agrees they should have. You've heard from uh, people that have been active on the ground in land use decision making that this bill falls far too short. I want to echo what I heard uh, Borough President Brewer say this morning. Planning has to begin at the community board and neighborhood level. Um, Borough-wide hearings do not empower people. The work begins at the community board level. It, it, the work takes place at the committee level within the community boards. This process under this bill would begin with the conditions of the city report, which, which once issued will drive the process. That conditions of the city report needs to begin at the community board and neighborhood level where people who know the conditions of their neighborhoods can provide actual knowledge about what's going on. And the process needs to keep coming back to the community boards and to the neighborhoods before there's a draft goal statement, before there's a draft comprehensive long-term plan. You can't just have one level of hearing at the community boards late in the process and think that there's any sort of community input at all. Uh, my recommendation then is to redraft this legislation so that it begins in the neighborhoods, it begins with the community boards and to fund the community boards so that they can actually have a meaningful role. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan Block, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Thank you. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Ch uh, Chairman and council members. Uh, my name is Brian Block. I'm a resident of Cambridge Heights since 1967. I'm also the chairperson of Community Board 13 and the president of the Cambridge Heights Civic Association. And I'm also joined here with my chair of land use, Mr. Richard Hellenbrecht, and my fellow chairs of uh, the community boards in Queens. And I have a letter here that we want to just read into the record. Dear Speaker Johnson, Queens Community Board 13, located on the Southeast Queens border with Nassau County, is one of the largest landmass, most diverse districts in the city. Upon serious consideration of the pros and cons of the planning together study and related council introduction 2186-2020, this board voted unanimously, unanimously to object to this proposal for nu numerous critical reasons, many outlined in this letter. Our analysis makes clear this scheme must be delayed until it can be vetted thoroughly get more community buy-in and input from upcoming city leadership. Most importantly, we object any form of top-down planning that effectively imposes limits on grassroots community-based efforts. Five quick points, downplay planning together study. Queens Community Board 13 expresses concern that the planning together report makes irrelevant compar comparisons to other cities, vastly different from New York City. It uses rezoning data during a limited time frame that skew results not reflecting the diverse zoning actions that were implemented over a broader period. This unduly influenced the methodologies, processes, and frameworks called in intro 2186-2020. Number two, limited comprehensive planning. Comprehensive planning should be implemented only by gathering dispersed city agency data synthesized in a common, in a common portal with tools to support communities and, com and community boards rather than top-down control, planning should start totally in a strong bottom-up process with the new strategic planning offices as the last and least influential stop. Where there is cons consensus among communities, QLTPS tasks should be me not mesh these plans coordinate service. Do not prioritize growth. Our district is a minority majority district listing only 18% white in the last census. It is low density residential area and transit desert with overuse and aging infrastructure. The growth planning initiative would strain our infrastructure, but offer little benefit to this district. We need quality infrastructure investment, not more population. Thanks to recent zoning actions by city planning, with the help of outside technical assistance, our district now reflects the needs of our diverse communities. Rushed implement implementation must be delayed. Introduction 2186 is being rushed through while min minimally vetted on. The bill vests extraordinary authority in a single non-elected position while introducing vast technical complexity. 
The city faces numerous challenges, particularly in light of the pandemic. There are severe budget cut strengths, declining population, reduced tax revenues, extraordinary COVID expenses, and the aging infrastructure. A rush, flawed, and resource intensive planning exercise will distract attention from recovery. This is a lame duck year for the mayor, the speaker, and many council members. Passage of 2186 would leave a whole new city government with a complex and untested planning process to which they had no input but full accountability. Wait for the new mayor and council. And finally, community board issues, understaffed community board district offices, which have never received the promised independent planning support will be overtaxed. Volunteer board members would be overwhelmed with new, or, with new and difficult tasks. The initiative may allow development meeting the broad long-term objectives of the plan, but which offers no benefit to the community and without adequate community input. Finally, the proposal offers no real power to community groups or community boards to shape change. Community boards would remain advisory with their recommendations easily ignored, give boards a stronger local say on future plans. For these reasons and more, Community Board 13 voted no to 2886-2020. We urge our council delegation and others to defeat this le legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for listening to us from CB13. Thank you very much. Thank you. I believe we have a question by council member Rodanchik. Uh, it's not so much a question, Mr. Chairman, but I, I've been here pretty much all day and I wanna thank you for uh, your uh, utter professionalism as always. And I wanna thank the people, um, especially my constituents, but really all the people from across the city uh, that came out to talk today to us about this most important issue. And I see my uh, colleague, Danique Miller has raised his hand. So I'm gonna yield to him. Um, and uh, obviously if um, you haven't spoken to me locally, I have spoken to a number of you, but I'm just a phone call away to my local uh, folks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Council member Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, council member Grudenchik uh, for your partnership. And, and quite frankly, for, for listening to our collective constituents sees um, that I have been very much concerned about this new process and what it, what it would look like and whether or not communities that we know have been marginalized, not just because they're the, these uh, historic communities of color that have lacked been, uh, uh, access uh, to infrastructure and things that really provide a quality of life, um, but, but um, for, for those that are on the line, I see many, I see Jean, I, I see Brian, uh, I've seen a, a, a Richard and, and a few others from, from 12 and 13 and, and Lynette. Um, thank you guys for, for, for really showing up. But um, when 76% when, when, when of the city uh, are renters and, and uh, the communities that, that you and I represent are, are, are a lot different. And, and so we wanna make sure that our voices are in this space um, that is being discussed um, in, in this process. And so uh, for those that were around for the testimony this morning, know that we, you know, that I, that, that you have, have, have lots of concerns about this process and, and whether or not the, the needs and the values of the constituencies that we serve are there. So what's most important is that we look at, you know, when we talk about this process, opening up the ability for communities to be engaged, um, not so sure that that is the case, um, and 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 the way that it happens by you know is this type of public discourse, and and I'm, I'm so glad that our folks are uh, that um, from the community, our constituents are on the line, are willing to speak up and testify to those values that we have, and and what we think is necessary um, um, in this process. Uh, the the admin. Um, city planning had very little um, answers uh, for, for some of the questions that we've had, but um, I would uh, once again reiterate that um, this is something that came before the uh, Charter Commission and um, was not successful during the time of the Charter Commission and is being revisited uh, in another form. Uh, today, and so I'm so glad that that the same constituency 
the fact of the matter is that it never made it to the ballot in that case. And the last time it did, I believe it was 89, was defeated then as well. But that we are aware of something that potentially will have uh, impact on, on our communities and that we are willing to raise those voices and just know um, that th those who you have elected to be your voice at the council um, have, we speak often and there is a consistent voice that comes from this coalition of uh, Southeast Queens legislators. So thank you, Mr. Chair. You have been gracious, the ultimate professional. Um, somebody send that man some coffee, please. <laughs> all right, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Councilmember Miller. Uh, always appreciate you. Councilmember Adams, thank you. You've been here from the beginning as well. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you've been amazing today. And uh, for those of us that know what marathon hearings are, um, it's been quite a day as you all see my jackets off now. Um, so yeah, it, it's been a great, and I just have to say, you know, aside, you know, from this, this hearing, which we um, heard so much passion, I just wanna say, um, first of all, it, it, I'm just so proud of my Southeast Queens uh, constituents for being here today for speaking up. Um, I think that you all know us. Um, uh, some, somebody said that you didn't hear from your elected officials. We wanted the narrative to go around. So that was very intentional. It was not because we did not want to come to you. We did not want to bring this out. We wanted the narrative to, um, to play out because we, because we, we heard it. Um, and we wanted to get to a place in a public forum in this hearing where all voices could be heard together. Um, because the, there's one side of a narrative that's very heavy. We wanted to make sure that this legislation is scrutinized from A to Z. You all are, you're in the trenches. And like I said, you know, um, community board is everything to me. So if we don't have the voice of the people behind this legislation, as you all notice, um, who, who is actually sponsoring this legislation, and I believe that there's only one person from Queens, on this bill, there's a reason for that as well. Um, you know, like I said, we're talking about where I live in this in this bill. We're talking about where I live, single family, and that is why I ask the question over and over and over again. Um, I believe uh, I believe what I heard that it, that from from all sides. I will be, I believe it. This has to be something that uh, takes time to work through with our community. This is not, we do not want a top-down process. This is something that we have been speaking about as a council for way too long that we have been victims of, particularly, um, you know, in Queens, we have been victims of the top-down approach, which has not worked. Some, someone mentioned MIH. I was not on the council when MIH uh, was passed, but I can let you know that I was uh, chair of a community board where our voices were not heard. We opposed MIH and it happened anyway. So this is the type of thing that, um, that we are here to dialogue with our communities because a lot of us uh, are totally, totally wrapped up uh, and committed to maintaining the voice of our communities, maintaining the character of our communities, maintaining the structure of our communities and protecting our communities um, against becoming uh, concrete jungles. I'll just put it that way. So with that said, I look forward to continuing the dialogue. And I thank you again, Chair Cabrera. Um, another shout out to Southeast Queens. So proud of you today uh, for your testimony. We will continue this dialogue with you. Look forward to seeing you. Hey, Brian Black. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member. And thank you for staying during the entire hearing. It's not easy uh, to be here for almost seven hours. Uh, but uh, thank you for being a trooper. Uh, you, you always say for the center. Uh, I want to turn it over to the committee council uh, for any last words before I, I close it down. Thank you, Chair. At this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. And as a reminder, if you wish to submit written testimony, you do, may do so within the next 72 hours by emailing your testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Seeing no hands raised, I'll turn it back to Chair Cabrera for closing remarks. 
Thank you so much. I want to thank my colleagues, uh, especially those of you who were here from the very beginning. Uh, I want to thank uh, every single one of you uh, who, sh who testified today. I know we are passionate, uh, regardless of where you stand, because you care about New York. You care about the future of New York. We're concerned about the future of New York. We got to get it right. And this is why I'm so glad that we had this debt level dialogue, an honest, transparent level dialogue. I want to thank the community board members and chairs. If anyone knows me, anybody been around the council just for a little while, you know how passionate I am regarding community boards. Uh, you do a tremendous amount of work, you care for the community, uh, and you're making a difference. I think that community boards need to be further in power. Uh, we're going to continue, and I'm asking all the community board members here to call upon the administration to stop these cuts that are taking place uh, into your budget. Uh, it's, it's, it baffles me that there is cuts taking place uh, in, in this and in one of the places where, actually in the place where they get the least funding, uh, these crazy cuts that are taking place, $8,000 for next year, you, you already had a cut this year, and let alone the, the, the funding that we were able to get you through the council uh, uh, the last two previous year that I led that initiative, but unfortunately due to the pandemic, we were not able to, to provide that. But if you put all that together, you're talking about a 20% cut in your budget from just even a year ago. Uh, we, we, we gotta do better, we must do better, and we will do better. And so I wanna encourage all the community board members to come to the governmental operations uh, hearing uh, when uh, we do our preliminary budget hearing uh, to get these fundings restored back uh, to your operating budget. I want to thank the staff. You did a fantastic job. It's not easy what they do. Uh, there's a lot of uh, preparation it takes for this type of hearing. I salute you. I call them the dream team, uh, council staff. Uh, thank you uh, for all you have done. And also to my co-chairs uh, that uh, their input, uh, their wisdom, and to the speaker uh, as well uh, for uh, putting forth this level of discussion. And so with that today, we, uh, we conclude today's hearing. Thank you so much. God bless.